from the book jacket. During this savage civil war, all efforts to end Jason Solo's tyranny of the Galactic Alliance have failed. Now, with Jason approaching the height of his dark powers, no one, not even the Solos and the Skywalkers, knows if anything can stop the Sith Lord before his plan to save the galaxy ends up destroying it. Jason Solo's shadow of influence has threatened many, especially those closest to him. Jaina Solo is determined to bring her brother in, but in order to track him down, she must first learn unfamiliar skills from a man she finds ruthless, repellent, and dangerous. Meanwhile, Ben Skywalker, still haunted by suspicions that Jason killed his mother Mara, decides he must know the truth, even if it costs him his life. And as Luke Skywalker contemplates once unthinkable strategies to dethrone his nephew, the hour of reckoning for those on both sides draws near. The galaxy becomes a battlefield where all must face their true nature and darkest secrets, and live or die with the consequences. Prologue Jedi Outpost, Endor Twelve weeks after the death of Mara Jade Skywalker My brother died in the Yuzhan Vong War. Not Anakin. Jason. It's taken me years to work that out, but I should have seen it from the start. Jason, the brother I loved, my twin, never came home. It just looked as if he did. I think the core of Jason probably died in the embrace of pain at the hands of Verger and the Yuzhan Vong. Whatever came back was another person, a total stranger. It's the only explanation for what he's become. So that's why I've reached the point of doing something utterly unthinkable. Because the unthinkable is the last card we have left to play. The only way I can stop Jason and his war from swallowing the whole galaxy. It was the Mandalorian crush gaunts that made up my mind. As Jag has proven, they certainly work. They're nasty weapons. Mandalorian iron, Beskar, is pretty well nearly lightsaber proof. I almost expected the things to detonate when Dad opened the package. Since when did Boba Fett ever send my father gifts? Since his daughter was tortured to death by my brother, actually. We've been waiting for Fett's revenge ever since. But so far, nothing. Just the gift of crush gaunts and armor plate, all made from Mandalorian iron. So I'm packing for a journey I didn't think I'd ever make. I'll give Jag this much, he never said I told you so. He's the one who said I needed to learn from someone who had a track record in bringing down Jedi. If anyone can stop Jason, then, it's me. I'm his equal, and I'm the sword of the Jedi. But I just don't have his... training. I've no idea what he learned from Lumia, let alone what he picked up on his travels during those five years— but he'll make a mistake sooner or later. He's way too cocky not to overestimate himself. I just hope it's sooner. And if being a Sith made Jason invincible, he'd have taken over the galaxy by now. I have a chance, and Fett's going to help me make the most of it. It can't be that hard to find him. He's a bounty hunter. So I'll hire him like any other client. Except I'm not just any other client. I'm Han Solo's daughter, and I'm a Jedi, and Fett has spent a lifetime hunting us. And now I'm asking him to train me to hunt and capture my own brother. For all I know, he'll laugh in my face, if he ever laughs, that is, and tell me to get lost. But I have to ask him, swallow pride, eat humble pie, and beg if need be. Dad seems to have thawed a little toward him. I still despise him. But if he says yes, I swear I'll be the best pupil he's ever had. Come on, Fett. Show me how it's done.
Chapter 1 When the nation is in its darkest peril, the great warrior sailor Darakhar shall be summoned from his eternal sleep by a rhythm beaten on his ancient drum. For his final pledge was that he would come to our aid when the drum sounded, and that we should call him when we sailed to meet the foe. Your Menu Folk Legend Jedi Outpost, Endor, Twelve Weeks After the Death of Mara Jade Skywalker Ben Skywalker had thought it would be a simple matter of thumbing his lightsaber into life, screaming vengeance or choked into silent grief, he didn't care which, and slicing Jason Solo's head from his body. He sat flicking the blade on and off, staring down the shaft of blue energy and watching it vanish only to snap back into vivid life over and over again. He saw his mother, who couldn't be summoned back again at the flick of a switch, although he would have given the rest of his life for one more chance to tell her how much he loved her. But the image that he wanted to erase yet couldn't was Jason Solo's face. So many people said Jason was a stranger now, but a stranger was someone you never loved or looked up to and so their brutality or careless cruelty was just repellent detail, the distant stuff of hollow news bulletins. Family, though, family could hurt you like nobody else, and they didn't even have to torture you like Jason did to leave scars. The face of Jason that Ben would recall until the day he died was the one he saw on Cavan while he sat with his mother's body. The face that promised Ben they'd get whoever did that to her. And that was why it simply would not go away. There was something wrong about that face. Something missing. Or something there that shouldn't have been. Ben picked away at the memory, checking his chrono every few minutes, convinced that he'd been waiting for Aunt Leia for hours. I had the chance to kill him. Dad stopped me. Maybe, maybe I could have killed Jason without turning dark. Will I ever get another chance? Jedi had killed Sith before. They said Kenobi killed a Sith on Naboo. But nobody thought it was an instant passport to the dark side. Some dirty jobs had to be done. Ben had thought his absolute all-consuming need to destroy Jason had passed. But it hadn't, and neither had his grief. It had simply shifted position. It ebbed and flowed, some days worse than others. He would not get over it. He would learn to live with the loss, somehow. But the galaxy had changed and would never return to normal. It was an alternate universe nearly familiar enough for him to navigate, but where the most important landmarks were gone forever. Now he was ready to pour his heart out to Leia. There were some things he wasn't ready to tell his father. Luke Skywalker might have looked as if he was dealing with his grief, but Ben knew better, and if he told him what he really thought, Dad would kill Jason. He was sure of it. He'd snap. Ben had to be the responsible one now. But if I'm wrong, I'll only hurt Dad more. Nothing added up. I don't believe Alima killed Mom. Sith Sphere or not, I just don't. How did Jason know where to find me on Cavan? How did he know I was there with my mother's body? Ben had thought it was odd at the time even when the shock of finding her body had nearly paralyzed him. But even in shock, he'd had the presence of mind to record evidence at the scene, every bit of data he could grab, just as Captain Shevu had taught him. Jason had mind-rubbed him once. He wasn't going to let him rewrite history again. And that was my instinctive reaction. Even when I found Mom dead, Something inside me said that was important. I'll trust that. 
Jedi would have said it was the certainty of the Force. Cops like Captain Shevu would have said that Ben's investigative training had kicked in. Either way, Ben had more questions than he had answers. But he was more sure each passing day that Jason, his own cousin, his own flesh and blood, really had killed his mother. He waited. Eventually he heard two sets of footsteps coming down the passage, and had a sinking feeling that Luke might have met Leia in passing and decided to tag along. But when the doors opened, it was Leia and Jaina. Ben? Leia always had that calming tone that said everything was under control, even when it wasn't. What's wrong? I've got some difficult things to say, he said. You might not thank me, but I can't sit on it any longer. The accusation was meant solely for Leia, and for a moment he was reluctant to blurt it out in front of Jaina as well, but she needed to hear it. You know you can tell me anything, Leia said. Do you want Jaina to leave us alone? No, no. As long as you don't rush off and tell Dad, because he thinks I'm over the Jason thing now, and I don't want to start him worrying again. Jaina sat down next to him, leaning forward, as if she was ready to hug him if he burst into tears. It's okay. I won't say a word. And Mom's the diplomat. What's so bad that you can't tell Uncle Luke? Cut to the chase. The longer he built it up, the worse it would be. Ben concentrated on calm, rational language. I don't think Alima Rar killed my mother, he said. The words hung in the air as if he could see them. I still think Jason did. Leia just stood there arms folded. But she didn't react. Jaina shifted a fraction on the seat. If anything, they seemed embarrassed. He waited in the agonizing silence. What makes you think that? Leia asked at last. I'm not going to rely on what I feel, Ben said, even though I feel it. I'm going by things that don't add up. You know what police look for? Captain Shevu taught me. Motive. Means. Opportunity. And family doesn't seem to mean much to Jason. Look at the things he's done to you and Uncle Han. Ben recalled Jaina's sudden exit from the Galactic Alliance military. And you, Jaina. Look what he tried to do to you. I know Jason's doing some terrible things. But let's go through this a step at a time. Leia said, You've accused him before, but we're all pretty messed up lately. Why is this still eating at you? The way he found me on Cavan. He's good at finding people in the Force, Ben. I was hiding, doing my shutdown act. He's not the only Jedi who can do that. He taught me to do it, and I taught Mom. I've even shown Dad how to do it, and he'll tell you. Once you switch out, even Master Amazing Super Smart Jason shouldn't have been able to find me. And he still walked straight up to me in a tunnel on a deserted planet that's the back end of beyond. That's not luck, and it's not finding me in the Force. He knew. And then there was the Sith Meditation Sphere that Lumia had. He'd kept it to himself all this time. The longer you kept a secret, the harder it got. If only he'd disobeyed Jason and told Dad about the thing. If only... Maybe Mom would have still been alive. Ben would never know. What about the sphere? said Jaina. I found it on Zeost. I handed it over to Jason when I docked it in the Anakin Solo. Next time I see it... Lumia's driving. Leia sucked in a little breath. Lumia was always adept at taking what she wanted. The Anakin Solo might be slack when it comes to stopping infiltrators, Aunt Leia, but I can't see Lumia just wandering in and stealing the sphere 
without someone knowing about it. Okay. File all that under unexplained. How about motive? Jaina seemed to be holding her breath. Leia looked away for a moment, as if she was weighing the evidence. It didn't amount to much. Yet. How about the fact that Mara was in his way, like any good Jedi? said Jaina sourly. No. Let's hear Ben's view. Ben was theorizing now. I spent a lot of time telling Mom about all the things Jason was asking me to do in the guard. And I could see it made her mad. I'm sure she bawled him out. Okay, so that's motive, maybe. Now let's look at means. Only a really skilled Jedi could ever take down Mom. Look at all the stuff Jason can do. But poison? That's Alima's trademark. So it's obvious to use it to draw suspicion elsewhere, isn't it? Sweetheart, Alima had the sphere. She was in league with Lumia, we know that. And I'm sure Captain Shevu would confirm that people stick with one method of killing that they feel confident using. Alima spent the last year trying to kill as many of us as she could. Ben was off and running down the behavioral path now. Okay, Alima was crazy, but she didn't have a motive for killing Mom. It was always about you and Uncle Han. He shook his head. I don't buy it, because she'd have bragged about it to Jag if she'd done it. She'd have wanted us to know she got in one good shot to hurt us all. To hurt you. And then there's opportunity. She was in the area, yes, but we also know for sure that Jason was in the Hapen system around the time it happened. Leia really looked as if she was taking it seriously. She hadn't rolled her eyes or told him he was being stupid or even rushed to defend Jason. That wasn't a surprise, given what Jason had done to her, his own mother. Well, it doesn't clear him, she said at last. But it's not exactly enough to take to a judge, is it? He could have been in the Hapen system planning to kidnap Alana. It was a good alibi. Jason couldn't have committed a murder because he was too busy planning an abduction, Your Honor. Ben strove for a rational tone. Aunt Leia. Why do you think Mom hung on in corporeal form for so long? Why do you think her body disappeared just as Jason showed up at her funeral? Don't you think the Force might be saying something to us? I can't stop thinking about it. I've turned it over and over in my head for weeks. I daren't discuss it with Dad, but it's driving me crazy. Leia took a few steps forward and squatted in front of him, to put her hands on his knees. Ben, you said you recorded everything you could at the scene. Yeah, because nobody can mind rub that or tell me I imagined it. Have you found anything in the recordings? Ben stood his ground. He was sure, more sure every day now. Not yet. Okay. I'm going to find out exactly what happened, Aunt Leia. I have to. And I'm going to do it by the book, because I need to be certain or I won't be able to live with it. What if you find evidence that it's not Jason? asked Jaina. Are you going to accept what the provable facts tell you? Ben had committed himself to take the rational, legal path rather than that of intuition and force senses. I don't want to get the wrong person. Whatever I feel about Jason for the other things he did to me, I don't want to pin it on him if that means Mom's real killer is still walking around. And if it really was Alima? Well, fine. The result's the same. Jaina looked into his face for a few long moments and then smiled sadly. With Leia still squatting in front of him, Wearing that same sorrowful expression, Ben felt pinned down by their tolerant doubt. Maybe they were humoring him. 
Well, it didn't matter. He'd stated his case, and he was going to prove it. Because he couldn't carry on with his life until he got answers. And he would carry on with his life. When Jory Lakauf had been killed saving him, and he'd been drowning in guilt, Mara had told him that the best way to honor that sacrifice was to live well, to the maximum, and not waste a gift so dearly bought. He'd do that for his mother. He'd live for her. Bastion, Imperial Remnant, Admiral Pelion's Residence Gilad Pelion, still healthy in his nineties and with no intention of fading into senility, was playing feed quoits on the lawn when his aide entered the walled garden at a brisk walk. The admiral didn't take his eyes off the target. A short pole shaped like the flower spike of a sezith water lily, one of a dozen set in the shallow ornamental pond. But he could see all the signs of urgency in his peripheral vision. Yes, Vitor? Pelion held the quoit between thumb and forefinger, resting its weight on his palm. I hope you're rushing to tell me that the chief has acquired Jason Solo's entrails and is braising them for dinner. Not quite, Admiral. Life is full of disappointments. A military attaché from the Galactic Alliance is here to see you. Vitor Rige had saved Pelion's life in the Yuzhan Vong War, and now he defended him from all other equally irksome visitors. Anyone from the G.A. fitted the description these days. Shall I send him away? Remind him that he should make an appointment if he wants an audience, not drop by to solicit me like some door-to-door -door tradesperson. I think he might have been anticipating that. He handed me this note. Rige rustled. Pelion turned his head to look at a neatly sealed flimsy square, pale blue and bearing handwriting. It would be some sop from the strutting little demagogue Solo or one of his minions, some invitation or other public relations exercise to make his junta look more respectable. Pelion focused again on the lily and tossed the quoit with a practiced hand. It fell neatly over the spike and came to rest on its base. Open it for me, he said, taking another quoit in his hand. If you think it might raise my blood pressure, throw it in the bin. If not, it can wait until I finish my game. Feed quoits was a pursuit that taught patience and concentration, as well as providing gentle exercise. It was always played on water. Careless throws meant fishing around in a pond with your hand to recover the quoit. Some said that it had once been played with carnivorous fish in the water, and began life as a hunting technique on Naboo. But Pelion had quite enough predators in his life without adding that refinement. He settled for nothing more dangerous than a wet sleeve when he missed the target. Well? Pelion lined up a more difficult target, the right-hand spike at the back that required an up-and-over technique to clear the middle row. Is it going to give me an aneurysm, or just provoke spluttering rage? I really think you should read the message, sir, said Rige if only for amazement value. He held out the unfolded flimsy with a bemused smile, and Pelion took it. You'll be annoyed, I think. It was handwritten, or at least fashioned to look like it, and it was an invitation after all, but not quite the one that he was expecting. The Joint Chiefs of State of the Galactic Alliance respectfully request a meeting to discuss a mutual aid treaty with the Imperial Remnant, and the addition of its assets to the G.A. fleet in exchange for substantial benefits. A translucent green official seal was stamped across Jason's signature. 
No sign that Admiral Neothel had seen this then. A moan cow should have known better than to back a little despot like Solo. So perhaps she wasn't involved. But then Neothel had her own agenda, and it almost certainly didn't include Jason as a valued co-worker for life. The brat. Pelion had resigned, rather than be forced to work with him. It hadn't been personal when it started. Pelion simply objected to the creation of an unaccountable, slightly outside the chain of command, rather seedy secret police force, which was then put under the command of someone who had never worn a uniform in his life. The dislike, now fermented into a full-blown loathing, had come later nourished simply by watching the Hollow News and listening to military intelligence reports. Retired. No, I was forced out. And I haven't forgotten that. No, Jason, you cannot play with my ships, he snorted. Nor can you buy them. He crumpled the flimsy in his hand feeling the fragile seal crack, and tossed it back to Rige. I can see no merit in aligning the Empire with a regime that has no current bearing on our interests. I'll return this to the attaché as it is, then, shall I, sir? said Rige, tilting his head slightly to consider it. I think it's quite eloquent. A gesture is worth a thousand words, but two often suffice. Rige walked back down the hedge-lined path without a sound to deliver the rejection to the attaché. A good man, loyal as a son. Pelion had long suspected he was, it was all too possible, but was reluctant to seek confirmation and be disappointed, because he missed Minar terribly. It was a dreadful thing to be unable to acknowledge that Minar had been his son. Pelion felt he had denied him even in death. He wanted no more hopes dashed, and had made generous provision for Rige's future. But if somebody didn't put a dent in Master Solo's ambitions, the future for Rige and everyone else would be bleak. It wasn't actually true that the G.A. had no effect on the Empire. Some things couldn't be avoided or ignored, however far away. Perhaps I was a fool not to retire earlier. But I'm not dead yet. I still have some fight in me. And I'll be hanged before I give in to the whims of a civilian playing soldiers— it's a pity that his aunt was killed. She'd have lost patience with him eventually, and then he'd have had a good thrashing. Oh, yes. Pelion threw the rest of the quoits, enjoying a private fantasy about playing the game the Naboo way, with a shoal of angry blembies cruising in the water, and making Jason Solo retrieve the misses. He was definitely... Not dead yet. Chief of State's Suite, Senate Building, Coruscant, two days after the return of the Anakin Solo. Darth Kytus stared at the crumpled note in the tray and wondered what Pelion thought of him. It didn't matter, but he was curious. Perhaps I didn't explain myself clearly enough, he said. What do you think, Tahiri? She examined the note and shrugged. He wondered if she was trying to sense something from the flimsy, some clue about Pelion's state of mind. I think you're talking to the wrong person, Tahiri said. It's the moth's backing you need, not Pelion's. He's the last person who'd help you. Kytus thought it was more insurance than help because he had no real sense of being under threat. The Confederation might have looked numerically equal, but numbers often didn't equate to strength. But he planned to bring the war to a quick end, not to tiptoe along some line of status quo. 
and for that he needed an injection of numbers. The Imperial Remnant had not only the hulls and hardware, but more importantly, also the doctrine and high-caliber personnel to make their assets count. They were very much his grandfather's legacy. The Remnant's shock troops were said to be as excellent as Vader's 501st, and that kind of efficiency was what he needed in his order of battle. The only barrier was Pelion, now too old to bend with the winds of change. He had been a great admiral once, but even though he'd retired, voluntarily or otherwise, he was still blocking the sky lane. Admirals didn't retire, of course. They were always subject to recall. Pelion might still be biding his time. Tahiri, to get the moths to back me, I need to be endorsed by Pelion, Kaida said. It's more than his position as Bastion's head of state. I can bypass figureheads when I need to. But the old boy is still very much hands-on, and he has enormous sway over the moths. They would commit their forces to the G.A. for the right reward, but not as long as Pelion opposes it. And does he oppose it? I can see why he wouldn't exactly trust you. No, I'm not his favorite person and I suspect he regards Neothel as a traitor, in that stiff upper lip way of his. But this isn't a refusal, I think, just a gesture. I believe he wants to be wooed. Tahiri's mind was calculating visibly. So what's the right incentive for the moth who has everything? More of it, Tahiri. More. Everybody likes more. But more of what, exactly? Territory. Must be a tough job finding parking for all those star destroyers, mustn't it, Jason? Kytus had to admit she was sometimes more entertaining than Ben, even if he didn't like being called Jason. I was thinking of Bill Bringy or Borlias, actually. Maybe both, if I have to. Shipyards and banking. I think the moths will like that, if I can get Pelion to see sense. Tahiri never asked if the worlds in question had been consulted about becoming bargaining chips, and Kytus wasn't sure if she didn't think politically or she took it as read that he would make it happen with or without their consent. He's a pragmatist, she said, and he wants the best for his little empire. He likes his honor better. Kytus smiled and reached for the pile of data pads. There were a couple of items that troubled him still sitting in view. But I think he needs time to consider this, and perhaps a visit from someone persuasive, preferably in a smart suit and shoes, to Tahiri. She gave him a withering glance. You want me to see him? I hope you'll do better in this task than the last. I've done my best, Jason. Yet you can't find the Jedi base. And obviously, neither can you. Show me you can complete a mission. Talk to Pelion. He wouldn't see the military attaché. What makes you think he'll agree to see me? Pelion is a gentleman, Tahiri. He'll see you. Not only because you're pretty and charming, but because someone will let the moths know the nature of the deal he'll be offered, and so they'll ask him questions that he'll feel obliged to answer. Kytus already had his networks set up. Floating the idea through informal channels was quick and easy, 
but Pelion had to feel it was his idea. There was no hurting the man. That Corellian blood made him very contrary. Imperials need an empire, you see. It's what they do. How can he turn that down? Why didn't you calm him and put it to him straight? Even if he hates you, he'd respect directness. I was just testing the water with the letter. Now that I know how resistant he is, I'll go to Plan B and get the moths excited about two shiny new acquisitions, and, by a gentle process of osmosis, speeded up by your charm, he'll say yes, without being made to feel I co-opted him after ending his long and glorious career sooner than he wished. Tahiri sat back on the edge of the desk and looked out over sky lanes marked by the winking lights of speeders. You plan every possible move, don't you? I don't guess, said Kaidus. There are too many wild cards being dealt as it is, some of which are showing up now. He picked up the first data pad on the pile. Wild cards indeed. Intelligence reports confirmed that Corellia had placed an order for the Mandalorian's Besulik fighter. It was faster than an X-wing, armored in virtually impregnable Mandalorian iron, Beskar, and for sale to anyone who had the credits. It was one of those destabilizing things that changed the course of wars. A subtle man, Fett. Kaidus had been waiting to see what form his revenge would take for killing his daughter, thinking in terms of pure terminal violence, personal retribution. But the old mercenary was showing signs of playing a much, much longer and more destructive game. Off you go, Tahiri. Come back to me with your timetable and strategy for getting an audience with Admiral Pelion and signing him up to the cause. Kytus would have to do something about the Besulik. The simplest option was to buy a squadron for the G.A., even if that rankled. But if Fett could play the longer game, so could he. The fighter was a joint project with the Verpine of Roach, part of a cozy mutual aid treaty between Kaldabe and the Verpine Hives. Kytus put the Verpine down on his list of beings to educate later. He would also steer clear of Mandalore for the time being. He had more urgent issues in front of him. Fondor was still a major irritant, churning out warships for the Confederation at its orbital yards. It was a continuing threat, and it lay close to rich mineral resources in an asteroid belt. It built star destroyers. Assets like that couldn't be allowed to remain in enemy hands. So he would deal with Fondor as his next priority. He picked up his comlink and keyed in the code of his closest and most irritating colleague, Admiral Cha Niafel, Joint Chief of State of the G.A. He didn't see eye to eye with admirals lately. Admiral, he said cheerfully, we really have to do something about Fondor. Chapter 2 Thank you for your recent payment. The outstanding estate of the late Hidu Rezodar has now been released by the Registry of Testaments and Legacies, and you may collect the items any time in the next ten days. Now the claim process has been activated, any item not removed by that time will be auctioned by the State of Feda, and you will forfeit all ownership. Any taxes or duties payable on the items must be settled before leaving the planet. Message from the Faden State Treasury to Boba Fett, Mandalore, Alori Ramikade, Leader of the Mandalorian Clans, Commander of Supercommandos. Brawlson, near Keldabe, Mandalore. 
The weathered helmet of Fen Shisa still stood on a granite column in the clearing, firmly secured by a durasteel peg. Only animals or storms would have dislodged it. Nobody would have thought of stealing the relic of a much-loved Mandalore. It had even survived the Yuzhan Vong's attempt to devastate the planet. Shisa was revered. Been a long time, Shisa. Boba Fett didn't make a habit of talking to dead men, except his father. It was the first time he'd visited the site. You got your way. The helmet had once been vivid green with a red T-section, but the paint had dulled to browner tones, and the scrapes and dents of battle were more visible. The memorial was a substitute for a proper Mandalore's grave. Shisa's body was still in the quince sector where Fat had left it. The helmet was all he'd brought back. It was an apt memorial for a populist leader to be commemorated in the same way as any ordinary Mandalorian. Only the Mandalore, the head of state of a stateless people, was buried. Their nomadic warrior culture had no tradition of orderly cemeteries. Where will they bury me, if I have any say in it when the end really comes? I'll just set Slave One on autopilot for the Outer Rim, and keep going. Fett had been an absentee Mandalore, ignorant of his own people's traditions. His lessons, whether he wanted them or not, came from his newfound granddaughter Myrta, who insisted on calling him Babuir, grandfather, and encouraging him to embrace his heritage. Relations between the two of them were... tepid. That was a big improvement. They'd started out as homicidal. He stared at Shisa's helmet, remembering. The crazy barve. Was I worth it? You'd only say I told you so. So save your breath. I can't wait for you any longer. The sudden voice in his helmet's audio link made him jump, but it was just Myrta. She was itching to get underway for Feta. You'll wait, he said. You've waited three months. You can wait ten minutes more. Fett tapped two fingers to his helmet in a farewell salute to Shisa and swung back onto the speeder bike. If you only look after your own hide, then you're not a man. That was just about the last thing Shisa ever said to him before he died. Fett set off for Goron Bevin's farm, skimming above the silver ribbon of a tributary that flowed into the Kalita River. The landscape was changing. Since he'd first returned to a planet still struggling back to life after the Yuzhan Vong had done their best to kill it, Mandalorians scattered around the galaxy had started coming home, thousands of them, and then hundreds of thousands and more. The land was recovering. Farming was beginning again on tracts salted and poisoned by the Vongese. It gave him a good feeling. Mondoade showed their defiant streak by getting old farms thriving again rather than find new, easier land to cultivate. No, the crab boys, as Bevin still called the Yuzhan Vong, hadn't won. Myrta was a persistent girl. Babuir, you want me to start the drives? No. Are you okay? Is Goron there? She didn't need to know how he felt right then. He wasn't even sure himself, beyond a terrible, guilty dread. Has he got the room ready? Of course he has. Goran's never let you down. That was true. Is Bellwine's accommodation sorted out? Yes, but... Then someone better tell him. 
the Oyubat is as five-star as we get in Keldabe. You're psychic, Babuir. Fett wasn't, but he knew his personal physician well enough to predict that he wouldn't think a room in the rustic Oyubat tapcalf good enough for a fancy Coruscant doctor. Tough. I'm the customer. If the ruler of Mandalore could put up with a rickety farm outhouse with brutally basic plumbing, the Oyubat was fine for Bellwine. It was clean and warm. As long as he didn't try playing a round of Kubikad with the patrons, he'd be fine. Tell him he can always be replaced by a Medroid, he said. When Fett banked the speeder around the last stand of trees, he could see Myrta leaning against the aft hull plates of Slave One, arms folded across her chest, and Goran Bevin waiting beside her in his slate-gray farm overalls. No good acting like you don't care, Bevin said, as Fett opened the cargo hatch from the remote on his forearm plate and steered the speeder onto the ramp. You might have left her, but she's still your wife. Fett secured the speeder. Ex-wife. The rooms and medroids are ready anyway. Fett didn't mean to sound ungrateful. Bevin was a good man. Fett's chosen successor if anything went wrong, like death, like illness, like just plain old age. And he'd put up with a lot of demands since they'd located Sintas Vell's body. Fett's wife wasn't dead. Dead would have been hard after she'd been missing for more than thirty years. Dead would have been easier than finding her encased in carbonite, stored like junk among some dead gangster's forgotten possessions, and then working out what he'd say to her. How do I tell her that our daughter Aelin's dead? How do I tell her everything that's happened since she went missing? That she's got a granddaughter? At least Myrta could do her own telling. Fett released the hatch, and she climbed into the cockpit, a battered bag over one shoulder. She was in her mid-twenties, although she had a scrubbed look that made her look like a kid, and that meant she wouldn't be that much younger than her grandmother when she was revived. But I don't know that. Sintas could have been captive for years, and only carbonated recently. She could be nearer my age. She was a few years older than me. Either way, it was going to be a very hard reunion. The last time he saw her, he'd left her injured in an alley. It was an ignominious exit to add to abandoning her and their baby daughter. And now all the pain was going to come erupting to the surface again. All the memories he'd locked in his past as surely as carboniting them, so he never had to look at them. The Medroids got full psychiatric programming too, Bobica, Bevin said quietly. People usually came out of carbonite in a bad way, anything from blind and disoriented to totally and permanently insane. She'd really thank him for that, if he only knew what her chances were. Thanks, Goron, said Fett. Tell Medrit I'm grateful. Ah, we've always got room for guests. Kiparjai. It's nothing. Okay. Look after the shop while I'm gone. The war between the Galactic Alliance and the Confederation was forgotten for the time being. Fett settled into the pilot seat and waited until he saw Bevin walk clear of the downdraft before he flicked the controls and Slave One throbbed into life. The North Mandalorian countryside receded below into a patchwork, and the sky through the viewport darkened to violet and then black as they left the atmosphere. There was no going back now. What if she ends up insane? asked Myrta. Han Solo was carbonated, and he's strutting around just fine. I'll look after her, she said. I can take care of her. 
pay someone else to do it, you mean? So Myrta was in one of her combative moods today. That meant she was scared. He understood why, but he had his own problems to deal with when it came to facing Sintas again. How old was I when I walked out? Nineteen? And then Myrta will want to drag up the reasons why I left. It's going to be rough. Whatever, he said. She'll be taken care of. Fett wanted to blot the past out of his mind. He set course for Feta manually just to keep his hands busy, to stop thinking, and to avoid a conversation with Myrta. He even kept his helmet on in the cabin, his hint to her these days that he didn't want to talk. But it was never that easy to fend off her scrutiny. She seemed to hate gaps in a story, and for her, Fett had a lot more gaps than story in his life. Where did you go this morning? she asked. Not telling her would just stoke the fire. And maybe he wanted to give in to the interrogation now. Maybe it was time she knew, even though nobody else did. Maybe... Did he want her to think better of him? Fett paused. She says memorial. Why? Here we go. Hadn't been there since he died. Your brother said you deposed him. Brother? Brother. Jang. Jang Skirata. That stanging smart aleck clone who was still around all these years later. He's not my brother. We just share a genome, more or less. And I told him he didn't know what went on between me and Shisa. But you came back, and Shisa didn't. Long story. Got plenty of time. What happened? It gave Fett the occasional twinge of regret. It didn't haunt him, because he'd done what he had to do, and the alternative would have gnawed away even at his durastial conscience. He debated whether to tell her worried about his reasons for resurrecting another grim episode of his life at a time like this. I killed him, Fett said at last. I killed Fen Shisa. Fleet HQ, Galactic City Admiral Chani Athel could sense the mood of a ship or shore establishment the moment she stepped on board, and the mood of this one was shocked fear. It was impossible to keep some things quiet, and killing a junior officer on the bridge of the Anakin Solo was about as hard to hide as it got. It can't be true. But the Anakin's captain, Kral Neville, a Quarren with a solid reputation both as a pilot and a commander, had witnessed it. He wasn't the only one who'd seen the incident. It wasn't just Buzz, the fast-flowing river of gossip that circulated through both wardroom and lower deck throughout the fleet. Colonel Jason Solo, Joint Chief of State of the Galactic Alliance, had snapped Lieutenant Tebut's neck without even touching her on the bridge of his flagship in full view of the crew. The reason didn't matter. The enormity of the act made any reason irrelevant. The news had leaked. It would go around the fleet like a flash signal. Even the absolute loyalty of the Star Destroyer's rigorously vetted crew didn't stop talk about something that serious. Tebut had been loyal, too, they would say to one another, and look what had happened to her. It was just as well Neothel had reliable witnesses— because without them she would have dismissed it as wild rumor. Jason had done plenty of dirty things on his rise to power, but this wasn't just dirty, it was deranged. He's lost it. He's becoming a megalomaniac. What do I do now? She strode along the corridors of the HQ building toward the wardroom. 
On any other day, even in the middle of a war, the atmosphere in the building was busy and purposeful. The cumulative hum of voices had a certain pitch. If a ship had been lost in action, the hum dropped in volume and pitch, and the sorrow was tangible. But the pulse, the very heartbeat of the Navy, was still there. Today, the beating had stopped. The whole building seemed to be holding its breath, scared to exhale. When the awful passed personnel, they saluted automatically as normal, but they looked at her with expressions she could read all too well. What's happening? How is he getting away with this? Surely you're going to do something about him. Those looks, mute pleas, were agonizing. But they weren't as bad as the ones that said, Your Joint Chief of State. You're letting him do this. The Alpha walked into the low rumbling of subdued conversation in the warrant officer's mess and hit a wall of sudden silence. Then everyone scrambled to snap to attention. She could taste the dread. At ease, she said, and tried to act as if she was doing normal admiral's rounds to check on routine matters like tidiness and morale. Any complaints? No, ma'am. It was a chorus of voices. If anyone had raised the most obvious concern that the G.A. had a maniac at the helm, she would have had no answer. She couldn't take Jason on yet, and if she dismissed their worries, she would lose respect and trust. Nothing wrong with the food, ma'am. Neafel nodded and carried on to her office. Captain Neville was waiting for her. She closed the doors and swept the room for bugs with her hand scanner, but even when it came up clean, she still whispered. All I can hope, she said, not waiting for him to speak, is that when the news spreads, the crews believe it as much as I did, or think that poor woman deserved it for some reason— because if they do reach the conclusion that he's a monster, morale will collapse and we've lost. Neville didn't respond. The Quarren usually kept his counsel, but he seemed to be even more tight-lipped today. What is it, Captain? I've swept for surveillance devices. You can speak freely. His mouth tentacles rippled as if he was measuring his words carefully. What are you going to do about Solo? Neothel's instinct and training said to call in the military police immediately, invoke emergency powers, and have Jason arrested. But her common sense said that Jason's loyal Galactic Alliance guard trumped the MPs, that the rest of the fleet was loyal to him, and that she would end up as sole chief of state, which, whatever she might have thought she wanted a couple of years ago, was now a poison chalice. And she was effectively Luke Skywalker's spy. She needed to stay on the inside to arm him with intelligence. Jason was too strong for her to confront and depose alone. For the moment, there's very little I can do, she said. Ma'am, you can put me on a charge for saying this if you like, but he needs to be relieved of duty. Do you trust me, Captain? Neville's tentacles became still. He was wary now. I think I still do. Then if I say that I'm as appalled by this monstrous act as you are, but that I have to make sure I'm actually in a position to do something conclusive... Will you accept that without further explanation? Neothel hoped he understood. If she told him more, he'd be compromised, too. It was the oblique talk of coups and plots. Not that she was any stranger to that kind of coded conversation, having helped oust Cal Omis. Perhaps she was now getting her just desserts. I believe I get the general meaning, Admiral, said Neville. Neofel wasn't sure he had. When you fire on a target like Jason Solo, you daren't miss or just wound him. 
You have to make sure he can't return fire. Ever. Neville froze, then nodded. It was a human gesture, picked up from serving alongside humans, just as they adopted expressions from other species. I'd expected instant mutiny, he said. But our tendency, all of us, is to maintain discipline and try to carry on as if nothing untoward is happening, as if that'll make it go away. There's a war on Neville. Our people are too busy staying alive. Neafel went to the window and looked out across the city, somehow expecting to see the view radically changed just as her world had been. But life went on. Coruscant was a long way from the front, and Jason was still the heroic colonel, crusher of terrorists and son of two heroes of the old rebellion. Well fed and defended, with distracting shows on the holonet, the average Coruscant citizen wasn't about to rush to the barricades and storm the Senate, even if Tebut's fate was plastered all over H.N.E. bulletins. It wouldn't be, of course. And it hasn't impacted the lives of civilians here. Yet. Neville seemed a little more reassured that he was still talking to the officer and not the politician. I won't ask what you'll say to him when you meet. But he realizes you'll know, and you'll have to take some position on it. I shall openly question his methods, as I usually do, she said, wondering if she had already confided too much in Neville. And he'll think nothing has changed. So you don't share a philosophy? I'm disappointed that you might ever have thought I did. Neville waited a couple of beats, as if to make his point, that he wasn't so sure an ambitious admiral wouldn't do whatever it took to achieve high office, including selling her honor. My son didn't die, to put a sadistic despot in power, he said at last. I look to you to ensure his life wasn't wasted. It was a gut punch. Neafel wrote it. I'm sorry about Turl. I truly am. Neville just inclined his head politely and left. Neafel had just had some of her worst fears confirmed. While she knew that she couldn't always be liked, and that becoming chief of state always meant treading on a few toes, she was wounded by not being trusted or believed. Ironically, the man who was so convinced he could end chaos and conflict with his shock tactics was sowing more of his own. Jason was making everyone wary and suspicious, even old friends and allies. She needed to broker a discreet meeting with Luke Skywalker. But first, she had to be true to form and confront Jason Solo indignantly about his latest lapse of judgment. She summoned her chauffeur. On the journey through the unconcerned, orderly skylanes of Coruscant to the Senate, she concentrated on being angry and indignant rather than working out her next covert moves. Jedi could sense these things. She thought of Neville's dead son, and the outrage came naturally. Coruscant really was very peaceful. It was hard to square what she saw from the speeder window with what was happening off-world on the battlefield, almost as if there were a portal she had passed through and back again into another dimension. But it hadn't been that long since the Yuzhan Vong invasion. That had made the galactic capital much more nervous than planets that had suffered far worse and far more frequently over the centuries— and so it was willing to embrace Jason's extremes. Coruscant was scared and wanted to be protected. Neothel wondered how Jason would have fared trying to pull his hardline savior act on more battle-hardened, less innocent worlds. He was in his office, watching an intelligence holovid, a recording of a fleet engagement. 
There were so many brush fires breaking out across the galaxy now that she couldn't say where it was taking place without checking the images carefully to identify ships and terrain. Just another theater of war. The only positive thing I can see is that we've been saved from collapsing through overstretch by systems kind enough to stage their own local wars and excuse our attendance. What have I done this time? Jason said, not looking away from the screen. I could feel the little black cloud of reprimand coming. Stay angry. Don't let him sense anything beyond that. Neothel took a deep breath, disguised as an exasperated human sigh. Jason, I know you're very new to the military, but here's a tip to help you fit into the culture of the wardroom. We don't kill junior officers on the bridge in front of everyone. It's bad form. At least try to do it somewhere less public in the future. He looked up that time. She wondered if he was feeling the strain, because he looked more different by the day, a little older and less luminously youthful. It was especially noticeable in his eyes. Ah, oh, word gets around. She didn't sit down. She couldn't stay angry sitting down. Word gets around the fleet. And fast. You're a fool. Really? I thought I was doing quite well. Morale, Jason. It's an asset every bit as much as a Star Destroyer. We ask those we command to be ready to die for us, not because of us. And the moment we lose their confidence, we start to lose the war. We need them. Oh, and they need me. He let out a snort of contempt. The pact works both ways. Tebut was careless. It's not an exercise, Admiral. It's a real war, and mistakes get you killed. We could have lost the war thanks to Tebut. I think what happened to her brought home to everyone what that means. Did you mean to make an example of her? Or did you just lose control and it all got out of hand? That got a reaction, all right. She watched his eyes flicker, but not a muscle on his face moved for a second or two. I think we'll see an improvement in security procedures after this. Good, she said. Ah, he's either worried he'll burn out, or he's already snapped and he doesn't want me to know he's falling apart. I'll spend some of my very limited time repairing the damage you've done to morale then, because if a ship's company is terrified of getting something wrong, pretty soon they stop using their initiative and don't do anything at all. Do I need to explain? You care too much about being popular. Neothel had to bite back a retort. She knew her reputation on the mess decks as a humorless iceberg. Yes. I must keep my party girl image in check. Anyway, Fondor... Time to pick them off. I would prefer to hit their industrial capacity first, shut down their shipyards. We need those assets in one piece. If we want them as a going concern, then we'll probably have to occupy the planet to enforce that, because the government isn't about to capitulate, and we don't have the resources to do it. We might. Oh, do share. The Imperial Remnant. I'm opening negotiations. 
How good of you to involve me in this. I haven't committed us to anything. So it's us again. If you think Pelion is going to kiss and make up after I took his job, you're really not paying attention. Well, just to give the moths an incentive to persuade him to forgive and forget, I was thinking of offering them some extra turf in return for joining us, Borlias and Dilbringi. It was certainly an incentive and would have been excessively generous if either world had been the G.A.'s gift to give. Neither was a full member of the Alliance. So what does the gift amount to? Turning a blind eye to the moths invading? Helping them do it? Helping them costs resources. And we'd never have gone to their aid had those planets been attacked anyway. So how do we give? When we defeat the Confederation, we'll shape the galaxy as we see fit for the greatest benefit. They contribute to that, and they get two rich worlds for their trouble. Or they still get two worlds that don't want to be under their yoke and fight them for every meter of land. Either way, not our problem. But sooner or later, it would come back to bite him, she was sure. This reminds me of one of those Naboo timeshare scams, she said. It was time to let him get bitten, and Pelion would never allow it anyway. But I leave the high-level politics to you. Fondor, then? Shut down their shipyards first, because that disables their war effort. Then we neutralize their armed forces. Very well. And are you going to talk to Pelion direct? I was thinking of sending a more neutral figure. Tahiri. Jason, she's not exactly a diplomat, or even a negotiator. All she has to do is get him to accept the principle. I can do the rest. Neothel got the feeling that Tahiri was being groomed to take Ben's place. She was glad the boy had managed to get out of Jason's grip. He had the makings of a good officer and was becoming his own man. Let me know when you do, then. She turned to go to her own office, the one she'd had as supreme commander. It felt like a haven at times like this. Preferably before you take action. Send Shevu in, will you? Jason called after her. He should be outside by now. Neothel passed the young G.A.G. captain in the corridor, right on time, and gave him a nod toward Jason's door. He didn't look happy, but he didn't look scared. If Jason tolerated someone that visibly unintimidated in his entourage, then Shevu had to be one of his most trusted lackeys. She would keep her distance. He's all yours, said Neothel. The Millennium Falcon, Jedi Outpost, Endor. So, Dad, how do I contact Boba Fett? Jaina asked. All she could see of Han Solo in his position under the coolant lines of the Millennium Falcon were his pilot's boots. How did you get hold of him? Usual way, kid. I stood around like a jerk, and he ambushed me. I'm serious, Dad. Han hauled himself out from under the Falcon and got to his feet. This is Jag's idea, isn't it? I should never have let him have the crush gaunts. Hey, I can make my own crazy decisions. And the best person to teach me how to hunt Jedi is Fett. Am I right? Han wiped the Hydra spanner on a rag, and Jaina could see that a light had gone out of him. Beyond the clearing, the forest was a cacophony of wild noise that somehow managed to coalesce into something tranquil. 
Here she was, talking in this detached and oblique way about hunting Jedi, her twin brother, her father's only remaining son. There were days when Dad disowned Jason and never wanted to see him again. And the next day, the next, Jason was his boy again, and he wanted to look after him and put things right. But every day the volume of things that needed putting right got bigger and harder and more impossible. Dad hurt. Jaina knew Mom was hurting, too, but she seemed to be handling it better than him. So Ben thinks Jason killed Mara. Jaina reached out and took the rag and the tool from his hands. It's clean now, Dad. Yes, he does. What do you think? I don't know. I just don't know. You think he's capable of that? I don't even want to think about it yet. Jaina, do you think he's capable of it? Jason had tortured Ben. Who knew what kind of weird logic he was operating under? If he did something terrible to Mara, would he have had any concept of it being wrong? He hadn't planned to kill Fett's daughter, but she hadn't survived his interrogation. Jaina hated herself for even thinking it. Jason was Han Solo's son. But every killer, every criminal, was someone's kid. No. I don't think he'd murder Mara, Jaina said. But Ben seemed pretty rational. There's something that doesn't add up. I just hope he doesn't get too close to Jason while he's doing this investigation. So you do think Jason would harm his own family? Dad, he's already done plenty of harming. What are you going to do with him? I mean, you must have something planned or you wouldn't be going to sign up for the FET master class. I'll bring him in, she said. Bring him in. Then what, deprogram him? Lock him in the attic like you're supposed to do with crazy relatives? Rehabilitate him and take him back into the Jedi Order? What happens to ex-Sith lords? The alternative is leaving him to carry on, Dad. Han Solo had never scared his kids, but he was scaring Jaina now. She dropped her chin slightly. We can worry about all that after he's out of harm's way. Okay, said Han. If I was looking for Fett, I'd go to him starting at Mandalore. He'll give you a hard time, you know that. Whatever it takes. He might show you the door. Won't know until I ask. You think your temper will hold out? I can do anything when I really want to, Jaina said. And I want to bring Jason in before anyone else gets to him. Maybe before Ben gets too close, too. For everyone's sake. Fett doesn't have all the moves, or he'd have killed Jason by now and wearing some part of his anatomy as a trophy. Jason's not invincible, Dad. Nobody is. But when I go after him, it'll have to be with skills he doesn't have. Like Fett's. If you run into problems, your mom and I are going to be looking for alternative sites for a Jedi base not too far from that part of the galaxy. No, said Jaina. I won't need rescuing. I just wanted to know if you thought there was another way to do this. Han didn't have a better idea, or he would have argued. He gave her a long hug instead, silent and helpless. And she knew then that the focus she'd keep in her mind when things got ugly was that she had to do this to stop her father's suffering. The general good, the trillions of beings whose lives might be at stake— was impossible to use as a powerful motivator. She needed something that would galvanize her from the gut, from the soul, and that something was her father's face, drained of the spirit that made him such a hero to her. Look after Mom, she said, and walked away into the trees. 
I love you, Dad. Hey, don't take the stealth eggs to Mandalore, he called after her. It'll just tick them off. And I love you too, sweetheart. Jaina turned around a few times to check if Han was still watching or back in the refuge of the Falcon. But he waited, arms folded, then waved. It must have compounded his pain to know that when things had reached their lowest ebb, his own daughter thought that the only man who could help was Fett. Fett knew what it was like to lose a kid and see his family torn apart. She hoped, for no logical reason whatsoever, that the man would agree to train her not because he wanted to have his revenge on Jason, but because he understood her pain. In the end, though, it didn't matter at all. Chapter 3 Boba, how has your illness progressed? Has my data been of use to you? My offer still stands. Town We, former human clone development supervisor on Camino, now head of clone adjustment at Arcanian Micro. Galactic City Spaceport, Coruscant. It was a planet of a trillion people and Ben knew Coruscant well enough now to vanish within it. He shut himself down in the Force long before the flight from Bespin landed in Galactic City, more out of fear of implicating the people he intended to contact than worrying that Jason would sense him and come after him. Knowing Jason, he'd probably written Ben off as a weakling who couldn't take it. Ben was consigned to the also-rans minor disappointments Jason would deal with when he came across them. And Ben had his sources. They said Tahiri had pretty well taken his place at Jason's side. At Galactic City Spaceport, the transport disgorged its long-haul passengers, and Ben slipped through in the merging streams of bodies from all parts of the galaxy, a single fish in a multicolored shoal. With the easy obscurity of sun visor and a cap, he was just another young man out of millions in the Galactic City area. And maybe it was wishful thinking, but he thought he detected a faint growth of beard, more fluff than anything, but it was still different. He didn't look like Lieutenant Skywalker. Ben logged his identity chip at the transit security control gate, bogus, naturally, one of a dozen he carried, and was still expecting a sudden wail of alarms for a good ten paces as he headed for the open walkway. But nothing happened. All he had to do now was remember to disguise his walk to defeat the gate recognition system on security cams, and then he could wander around at will. A small pebble in each boot changed his stride enough to cheat the software without crippling him. In his bag, a reversible bag, there were various changes of clothing. He got as far as the first public refreshers by a branch of the Bank of Argyle and started adding to the deception. That's your problem, Jason. You taught me all this. Or at least the G.A.G. did. In a cubicle, he changed his tunic, cap, and pants, turned the bag inside out to show its light brown side, and repacked. He changed shoes to ones with stack heels. Then he emerged a totally different person, walking differently and dressed differently. He'd keep doing that, and the security cams would have no pattern to track. Lon Chevu's girlfriend, Shula Palasch, worked for a haulage company. He'd start with her. No comlink calls, just in case. The GAG might be monitoring the same way Ben had eavesdropped on senators and politicians when he was in the guard. He made his way to Shula's workplace, doubling back occasionally, just as Jory Lacau fed. It hit him hard sometimes. Even when he was mired in grief over Mom, Lacau would suddenly appear in his mind, and he'd feel it all over again. It wasn't any less of a sense of loss than the one he felt for his mother, just different and it could still make him stop breathing for a moment while he steadied himself. Lecalf had taught him about evading detection and tracking others. 
so this was another way of ensuring that his sacrifice to save Ben hadn't been in vain. Using that training to bring down Jason was right. Ben swung right into a walkway lined with clothing stores and tap caps. What do I really mean by bring him down? He was sure now that he didn't mean killing him. It wasn't Ben's job to be the judge. He was just getting a case together, and someone else would decide what to do with Jason in the end. What do you do with a deposed dictator? A Sith, too. And if Dad sorts him out and gets him back to the light side, how can I even be in the same room as him after what he's done? First things first. And first was proving a case against him. Although Ben knew there were ordinary folk who'd say that Jason was already guilty of enough, and that killing a Jedi didn't actually take him into a new category of monstrosity. It was just a personal act of betrayal, and Ben knew he had to put that aside. Most murders happen within families. Did I think we'd be any different? Yes, I did. We're Jedi. Ben alternated between speeder bus, paying by cash credits, not traceable chips, and walking between docking stations. He was finding he didn't need to affect a different walk now. The slightly higher heels had altered the angle of his spine, giving him twinges. An hour and a few changes of appearance later, he stood outside a branch depot of Galactus End. When he walked in, he couldn't see a face he recognized. It was a busy place. Beings of all kinds lined up waiting to dispatch parcels or held data pads in their hands, checking in consignments. He intercepted a droid in Galactus and livery, skimming through the reception area. Is Shula around? he asked. Shula Palasch? She no longer works here, said the droid. Well, that was sudden. It could only have happened recently because the last time he'd spoken to Shevu, she'd still been here. Thanks, he said, and wandered out to amble along the walkway and rethink his strategy. He'd have to go direct to Shevu's apartment now. He hadn't wanted to, just in case Shevu was under surveillance, but he still had the pass card, and if Shevu had changed the code, well, that wouldn't slow Ben down much he spent the next couple of hours taking a circuitous route to the apartment block. By the time he got to the last leg of the journey, he was tired and fed up with changing his clothing. As in most apartment buildings in the capital, an array of crime prevention cams kept watch on the entrance. Ben visualized the sensors getting a sudden burst of intense light, using the force to overload them for a moment to give him time to pass into the turbo lift. All the monitoring system would see was a short period of dark shapes as the cam tried to compensate for the light levels its sensor told it were there. At the 400th floor, Ben slipped out into the corridor and stood outside Chevu's door for a moment, trying to sense if anyone was inside. It felt empty. Ben tried the pass card, and it didn't work. It took him a couple of seconds to force wipe the lock to its default setting and slip inside. He'd stayed here before, when Chevu had given him a bolt hole, so he wouldn't have to go home and face Luke. There was a sense of familiarity about it that was at odds with the feeling that he was violating his friend's privacy. But Chevu would understand. The clutter of personal possessions had gone. Shula's collection of stuffed toy animals in unlikely colors— piles of holovids, the heptalian embroidered throw that used to adorn a chair. And Ben wondered if the pair had just sold up and left, and he was now in a stranger's home, waiting for the new owner to walk in to find a Jedi burglar sitting on the sofa. A quick check of the closets and kitchen cupboards showed that Chevu still lived there. Those were his uniforms, his bolo ball gear the boxes of pepper-flavored breadsticks he seemed to live on. But every trace of Shula was gone. 
even the holopics of the couple enjoying a vacation on Naboo. Maybe they'd broken up. That would have been a surprise, but a job like the GAG put a strain on relationships. And under Jason, the GAG was getting harder for former CSF cops like Shevu to handle. Ben settled down facing the door and resisted the temptation to calm his old captain to check which shift pattern he was on. That didn't seem to count for much with the GAG lately, though. It was a round-the-chrono job. Ben occupied his time by reading his data pad and speculating. Four hours later, force senses on edge, he felt a familiar presence and rehearsed all the different ways he could start telling Chevu that Jason was now out of control. Do I mention Mom first, or do I work up to that? He decided to play it by ear. Footsteps paused outside the doors. The silence went on longer than Ben would have expected for Chevu to find his pass card, and then the doors parted, and Ben realized what a bad idea it was to surprise a trained cop. The whir of a charging blaster made him leap up, just as Chevu burst through the gap and fired. Ben deflected the bolt, sending a stack of holozine pads smoking to the floor. Sir, sir, it's me! It's Ben! He held out both arms well away from his body. Hold fire! Chevu, panting and wide-eyed, was down on one knee by the cover of an armchair, with his service blaster still leveled at Ben. Stang, Ben! He snapped. His shoulders relaxed instantly, and he shut his eyes for a moment. Don't do that! Call ahead, for goodness sake! Sorry. Sorry about the damage, too. Chevu stepped back into the corridor and said something to a person Ben couldn't see. The neighbors had stuck their heads out of their doorways to see what the noise was about, and Ben heard a few words like, Thought I had a burglar, but it's a buddy, before Chevu shut the doors behind him and stood looking down at Ben. It's lucky you're a Jedi. Chevu seemed much more shaken than he would have been on a genuinely dangerous mission. Or you'd have been a dead buddy. I tried to find Shula first. I didn't want to compromise you by calming you direct. Chevu picked up the scattered and melted holozines. Some had fused into a single lump. You're in trouble. No. Jason is. Oh, that's okay then. Chevu flashed his eyebrows. We're all in the poodoo. We've been told you're not GAG personnel any longer. Jason didn't say why you'd left, but when he suggested that we tell him if we ever saw you, I reached my own conclusions. It's kind of hard to ignore the mayhem going on with the Jedi Council. Chevu checked himself as if he'd just made a terrible gaffe. What kind of buddy am I? I'm sorry about your mother, Ben. I really am. That was thoughtless of me. Ben took a breath and dived straight in. The cue was there. It was Jason who killed her. Yeah, you're right. It wasn't the casual way Chevu said it that shocked Ben, as much as the fact he said it at all. Chevu wasn't appalled. He wasn't even mildly surprised. You knew? Come on, Ben. You know rules of evidence as well as I do. I've got nothing solid. Chevu checked the window locks and rechecked the door, as if he was used to watching his back these days. Then he went into the kitchen, and the noise of clacking plates, running water, and snapping cupboard catches drifted into the living room with the sudden scent of fresh calf. It's got his fingerprints all over it, though. Not that Jedi leave any, of course. He'd be the first suspect whose collar I'd feel, believe me. My folks and the other Jedi think it was Ali Marar. Who's she? A crazy dark Jedi with a grudge against Aunt Leia. She liked using poison darts, and we know that was the cause of death. 
If Ben avoided personalizing the crime for just a few hours while he was working, he could hold it together. I'm not forgetting you, Mom. I just have to do this. Alima's dead now, so we can't corroborate anything. Shavu snorted in mock amusement. You have to learn not to mislay suspects, Ben. It's a bummer when it comes to squaring the custody records. She slugged it out with one of the Jedi sent after her. It was her or us, really. She kept trying to kill Aunt Leia. That explains why you look so much older these days. Shavu made that huh noise again. Ben knew he disapproved of boys of Ben's age being sent into live-fire situations. But he didn't understand that it was different for Jedi. Okay, Jason is the prime suspect. A couple of days ago, he killed a lieutenant on the Anakin Solo, just like that, in full view of the bridge crew. He snapped Lieutenant Tebot's neck without even touching her, and threw Captain Neville across the deck. Shevu emerged from the kitchen with two steaming cups. See what I mean about fingerprints? Ben should have been shocked. He tried hard, but all he had was a sinking feeling that the only beings who couldn't see Jason for what he was were Jedi, and his family at that. Jason was leaving a trail of bodies. He even tortured me, Ben said, realizing it sounded self-pitying as soon as it left his lips. At least he was still alive. Dad fought with him and stopped me killing him. Shevu's face was instant cold control, as if he was reining in an outburst. He should have let you. Jason Solo's a nutter, a psychopath. Jason's not mad. He's a Sith. You know what that is? Frankly, no. It's a Jedi who only uses the dark side of the Force. Not a Jedi at all, really. A bad guy. But not illegal. Wrong cult. Yes, I suppose. Okay, crazy, Sith, ethically alternative, whatever you want to call it, Jason demonstrates a tendency to extreme personal violence, and my cop's gut tends to take notice of that. What's your theory on your mother? Ben could deal in basics with Shevu. Jason was in the right place. He had the means to do it, and I think his motive was that she found out he was a Sith. I don't have evidence linking him to the scene, except he found me with her body, and he shouldn't have been able to. The only thing I can pin down is location. Crime scene's compromised now, I suppose. I recorded it. Good man. We'll make a CSF detective of you yet. I've been telling everyone Jason did it, but with Alima firmly in the frame, they all think it's my grief talking. I suppose it's easier to think the perpetrator wasn't a member of the family. So I need your help, sir. Drop the sir. It's Lon. Shavu slurped his calf. The vast majority of murders are carried out by people who are close to each other, family, lovers, close friends, Emotions run high, they have easy access, one thing leads to another, you get the idea. The random homicidal maniac is still pretty rare, even in the lower levels of Galactic City. And yeah, I'll help you. This is a murder investigation. Ben never expected otherwise. He'd judged Shevu right, but he was also putting the man in danger. Can I ask what happened to Shula? Looks like you scrubbed the place clean of her. I sent her back to her parents on Vaclin, for her own safety. We got married in secret, and then I got her off Coruscant, and got rid of everything here linking her to me. Why? Because people who oppose Jason Solo end up a bit dead, and I'm building a file on him. The situation's going to get a lot worse. Once I got Shula to somewhere safe... My only dilemma was whether I wanted to see him impeached and charged by the Alliance, 
or whether it would be more satisfying to see Fett or the Jedi Council get him. I think Fett's revenge might be more fun. Shevu's dislike of Jason's methods had been obvious since the time Jason had killed Fett's daughter under interrogation. Ben hadn't realized it had developed into full-blown hatred. Let's do it together, then. Whatever it takes. And I'll stay on the inside as long as I possibly can. Shevu looked resigned. And he likes to have me around. Even on the Anakin Solo. Ben wondered when his father would notice he hadn't checked in, and start asking where he was. He'd switched off the comlink, just in case Luke calmed him and the signal was spotted. He'd tell Dad soon. He felt better about that now. He had ways of expressing it. Just tying up loose ends, Dad. Just making sure we didn't miss anything. It's okay. Lon Shevu's stopping me doing anything crazy. But at that moment, it made him realize that Dad would want Shevu to help to be a spy in Jason's inner circle. And Shevu would agree to it because he couldn't get justice from the G.A. for the foreseeable future, and he was too decent and honest to turn to the Confederation. Everything Jason touched became corrupted. Ben took a deep breath, downed some calf, and concentrated on not letting his anger about that taint and all the people it was poisoning boil over. Let's pool our resources. Shevu slammed his cup down on the low table and propped a blank holochart against the chair opposite. He took a stylus and began drawing columns on one side and the beginnings of a chart on the other. It was how the CSF detectives worked on a crime, Ben knew. Let's write down everything we know. Discreetly, of course. Ben tried to imagine how utterly miserable it must have been for Shavu and Shula to marry and then have to part. He got the feeling that Shavu had been in a rush to marry her so that if anything happened to him she would be taken care of as a service widow. It was depressing, but folks had to think that way these days. Jason really knew how to tear families apart. Admiral's Private Launch, en route for Nazoth. Neothel was never convinced that Jason wouldn't change the locks when she turned her back on him, but she refused to be tainted with the culture of paranoia that she could see developing in the civil service and among senators. Even so, she broke her journey to Nazoth and switched vessels two, three, four times on the pretext of inspections across a number of ships from auxiliaries to troop carriers, then left in her private launch alone without a pilot. There was healthy unparanoia, and then there was just asking for trouble. She could still manage to pilot a vessel without ten officers to carry out her every command. It was the safest way. She rather hoped that the buzz around the fleet would suggest that old iceberg face was having secret assignations with a lover. It was always a handy story to float. And she had to see Luke Skywalker. It was the first time she'd been completely on her own, without crew on the other side of a thin bulkhead or security close to her quarters, for what seemed like years. It was probably a matter of months. She'd become wary of who she was seen talking to, who she calmed, and who she ate lunch with. Even Senator Gassell, a man she had been relatively close to in political terms, just acknowledged her in the corridors and went on his way. The Security Council had no real function now beyond worrying what Jason was going to do to it, and he certainly didn't consult it. He seemed to need reminding that he had a duty to consult her— well, she wasn't consulting him now. She took up position at the rendezvous point, 15,000 kilometers off Nazoth, checking her scanners for vessels and wondering if it was always going to be this way. The rebels had lived like this for twenty years, trying to overthrow the Empire. It seemed daunting. She was Joint Chief of State, and here she was fretting as if she were helpless— 
Stang, she said aloud, disgusted with herself. It'll only be twenty years if you let it. Luke Skywalker was late. She kept checking her scanner, increasing the range, and looking for a wider spectrum of signals, and feared the worst right up to the moment the launch's proximity alarm sounded and she nearly ejected. The short-range comlink buzzed. Admiral Neofel, permission to come aboard. Master Skywalker, you almost gave me a cardiac arrest. Stealth X, no point taking chances. I'll tell the manufacturer that they work just fine, shall I? The pragmatist in Neofel told her to make a note that stealth technology like that was great, as long as the people you gave it to were always on your side. The fleet had even found it hard to search for Mara Skywalker's downed stealth X. It was a two-edged sword. She waited until all the docking lights showed green, and then opened the aft hatch to the tiny cargo bay. The top canopy of the stealth X was wedged into a vacuum-tight docking skirt that made it look as if it had rammed the launch from the rear at a ninety-degree angle, canopy first. Luke dropped out of the fighter's open cockpit and landed on his feet. I braked too hard, she said, trying to lighten the mood. Remind me to ask Incom to fit a docking tube. Luke grasped her hand as if he was grateful to see her. Sorry, I just don't take chances these days. None of us do. Thank you for seeing me. This is mutual, Admiral. I'll have a favor to ask of you, too. I'll be brief, then. If you haven't already heard, Jason has taken to killing members of his wardroom in full view of others, using force methods. Luke shut his eyes for a moment. He looked older than the awful recalled, with noticeable folds in his cheeks and a dull gray tone to his skin. She dared think something unthinkable about Jason, that he might have been behind Mara's death. No, that was an outrage too far, even for him, and waited for Luke to say something. He didn't. I know he's fairly cavalier about killing, she said, but I suspect I was right in assuming this would mark some threshold for you, too. It does. Depending on how you look at it, then, it could lead to some advantage. And poor Lieutenant Tebbutt's life won't have been spent in vain. Jason may lose the loyalty of his troops, or it could simply consolidate a reign of fear. Luke rubbed one hand across his face, brow to chin. I think I recall how that morale-boosting technique played out in my father's generation. Well, I still have a duty to the Alliance and my personnel, and I'm still prepared to pass intelligence to you, provided you can use it to remove him. I don't care what you do with him. Restraint jacket therapy at some quiet monastic retreat, or shove him out the nearest airlock, but I want him gone. That sounded harsh, but Neofel wasn't sure how far humans would go to bring wayward relatives into line. And out of office. Another coup is impossible at the moment, so the best I can achieve is to help neutralize his impact on the G.A., and hope I don't lose the lives of too many good beings doing it. She wouldn't have been the first officer faced with a terrible choice when her leader pursued a course of mutual destruction. Her loyalty was to the common good of the G.A., not to Jason Solo. Hang on. I'm talking and thinking as if I'm his deputy, not his joint and equal colleague. What am I doing? Absolving myself of responsibility? I helped put him in power. I have Jedi working hard to seize him, Admiral, said Luke. Do you think he's insane? No. Neofel had no hesitation. 
I've seen too many perfectly sane beings become utterly corrupted by power. Jason's not insane. He's just had his own way once too often, and now he can't see the world any other way. Do you know what I mean by a Sith? I've heard the term, but I know nothing about them. They're Force users who prefer the dark side. Like Palpatine. Oh, I see. Fallen Jedi. Luke pressed his lips into a little humorless smile and looked away for a moment. Oddly, that's just what the Mandalorians call them. Their word means ex-Jedi, although that's not always the case. And does this make any difference to how we approach him? Does he have different powers from regular Jedi? Luke looked strangely embarrassed. She wasn't sure why. Not really. He's just very strong, and he has an ability to use a battle meditation technique that gives him a remarkable awareness of the battlefield. Ah, I noticed that. He has a young woman called Tahiri Vela running his errands now. Which brings me to Ben. Luke moved closer to Neofel and looked into her face, which required some head-tilting on Luke's part because of the set of Amon Cal's eyes. He clasped her hand again as if he were searching for a pulse. Apologies, Admiral. We're all scared of our shadows these days. I might be putting a man's life at risk, so I have to be certain. Ben has gone off again and I believe he's back on Coruscant. He thinks I don't know, but he's probably trying to build a case against Jason for killing Mara. Neofel almost sighed with relief. So she wasn't the only one who thought Jason could kill his own relatives. If I see him, I'll make sure he gets every assistance to stay out of harm's way especially if he goes after Jason to take revenge. He already tried that, after Jason tortured him. Just when I thought the man couldn't get any worse. Revenge isn't the Jedi way, and Ben's come to terms with that. But stubborn persistence is Ben's way, and he may come to your attention. He might be with Captain Shevu. They were close. You trust Shevu? Yes. There's such a thing as force certainty, and I have it in that young man. Neofel revised her view of the G.A.G. captain. His attitude was courageous dissent then. She'd have to persuade him out of that. A G.A.G. insider would be helpful to us all. We become exploitative for all the right reasons, don't we? We do. Until next time, then. Luke swung back into the Stealth X cockpit in a gymnastic move that would have taxed a much younger man and braced his body using his knees while the seat restraints closed around him. Then the canopy closed. He gave her a thumbs-up gesture, as if he were just an ordinary pilot taking a fighter for a test flight, and the safety bulkhead closed to release the vacuum in the docking skirt. He was gone. Poor Ben, the awful thought. She wished him luck, and decided she would make some for him if she got the chance. No, Jason. You won't get away with this. Not in my navy. Feda, Imperial Sector Treasury Repositories, Derafa. The slab of carbonite lay on a trestle draped in synthetic gray velvet weave, looking for all the world like a funeral beer. Fett inhaled the musty air and held out his chip from the Registry of Testaments and Legacies, his authorization to collect the belongings of a dead scumbag called Rezodar. The lawyer's minion took it, checked it, and stood back to let Fett and Myrta cross the threshold of the storeroom. Fett didn't know Rezodar, 
and didn't care. He could guess the gangster's lifestyle. This was Feta, after all. On a bad day, it made Nar Shada look classy. He hadn't been back here since the height of the Empire. Another element of his past come back to haunt him on this difficult day. I'll leave you to clear the store, sir, said the minion. Three hours maximum. Everything must go. A droid is available if you need help loading. There was only one thing Fett wanted. The rest, he'd jettison it, even give it to the deserving poor, or, given that this was Feta, the undeserving criminal classes. That'll be all, he said, and took a few steps forward. The distance to the trestle felt almost as impossibly long as the expanse of sand in the arena at Geonosis that he'd had to cross to retrieve his father's body. And then there had been Aelin's body, and reinterring his father's remains, Fett had played pallbearer far too often in the past year. He wasn't a squeamish man, but he was coming close to the limit of his tolerance. But Sintas is alive, and so are you although you might as well be dead some days. What order do you want to do this in? Myrta asked. She'd been quiet since he'd dropped his bombshell on her about Shisa. She stood on the opposite side of the shrouded carbonite slab and took off her helmet, the new one that Arade's father had made for her to match armor plates she had now painted a deep saffron. When she tidied her short curly hair with one hand, there was a brief moment when she looked a lot like her grandmother. It was the mouth. The eyes were definitely from his side of the family. Let's check the carbonite first, Fett said. It wasn't what he meant, but it was easier than saying that he only cared about Sintas and everything else was ballast. He took the top edge of the velvet weave. The drape of the fabric clung to the little mountains and valleys of a face, a once familiar land. Then he drew back the sheet, and it felt like the moment he saw Aelin's battered face when Myrta opened the body bag. The shock of the face of a stranger he ought to have known, but whose life he had missed almost completely. Oh! said Myrta. It took a lot to shut the girl up, but it was the second time Fett had heard that choked-off gasp today. Even in the monochrome contours of the carbonite shell, Sintas was recognizable. Worse, she was beautiful. He bent his knees slightly to check her profile against the light, but she looked much as he'd remembered. High cheekbones, long, straight hair, a small, pointed chin. Her arms were at her sides. Her eyes were closed as if she were sleeping. He'd seen a few carbonated beings in his time, and they had been frozen in some paroxysm of pain or terror, because it wasn't a pleasant way to be put into suspended animation. But Sintas looked peaceful. Maybe the barve froze her down dead. It gave Fett a brief sense of respite, and he hated himself instantly for it. Dead Sintas wouldn't drag up the unhappy past or hang around demented and in torment. Dead Sintas was what he thought he already had. Face up to it, Fett. You were never scared of anything. What would Dad think of you? too frightened to hear the truth again. You never could handle this stuff. It's how you ended up in this position. Maybe she'll be able to tell us how she ended up here, he said, swallowing everything he wanted to say. It was fifty years too late. Get the repulsor lifts. He clamped a unit on each edge of the slab, and glanced around the room. There were just crates of varying sizes, sealed and dusty. 
he had no choice but to take them and go through them in detail later, in case they shed any light on Sintas's fate. Myrta checked the boxes and began attaching repulsors to them. She never needed to be told to make herself useful. She learned fast and got on with the job, uncomplaining, and did it thoroughly. It was only the emotional things, the issues about family and heritage, that seemed to provoke her into surly scolding. She walked the boxes out across the landing area and steered them up Slave One's cargo ramp with a practiced hand, then jogged back and moved the next crate. Fett stayed with Sintas's slap, unable to leave her alone in this miserable place. You ready? Myrta asked, peeling off her liner gloves and whacking them hard against her thigh plate to get the dust out. She put them back on and slipped her gauntlets over the top. I'd ask you if you were okay, but I'd never get an answer. I'm okay, Fett said. Are you? No. I'm scared. I don't know how to tell her about Mama. I don't know how I'll handle it if she ends up crazy and would have been better off dead anyway. But I'll deal with it. I'll tell her. Give me some warning. How did you two part the last time you met? Fearfeck, there's no way around this, is there? I shot her, Fett said, and it was for her own good. Yeah, somehow I didn't think it would be a moonlit walk along a shore on Naboo and a tearful promise to stay friends. It was to stop her opening a booby trap. Fett flicked the controls on the repulsors and eased the carbonite slab off the trestle, aiming it at the exit doors. Myrta stepped to one side to avoid it. Just a small blaster burn. She would have been fine in a few hours. She always healed fast. You didn't wait to find out? She wasn't dead when I left her. Well, she did better than Shisa, then. He should never have mentioned Shisa. It was a mistake. He kept making them with Myrta. He made them with all women, in fact. Sintas didn't know how lucky she was that they split before he could really foul up her life. Shisa was a mercy killing. Myrta turned her back on him, displaying a saffron plate decorated with gold sigils and glyphs that he'd seen on the Vevut clan's armor. She was definitely serious about Gesorade then. That meant Fett would have a grandson-in-law soon, and with it a kinship to Novak Vevut and the rest of the clan. It was all getting too much for him, too involved, too rooted. Fett craved loneliness right then. Yes, loneliness. It was a much simpler emotion to handle. You sound as if you're straining out a confession a word at a time, Babuir, she said. So either spit it out, or let's concentrate on worrying about Babuir. Grandmother and grandfather were the same word in Mondoa. The language had no gender. Not that he spoke it beyond the odd word that Myrta had forced on him. It was the first time that something had grated on him. He was Babuir, nobody else. That reaction made him realize that he'd become a little too invested in the name. I didn't want to do it, he said. I didn't even want to be Mandalore. But if I hadn't shot Shisa, he'd have died a rotten death. I owed him better than that. You could have done the decent thing and still handed over the Kirbez to someone else. Fett had learned that word early in their relationship. The crown. The mythosaur skull reserved for the office of Mandalore. I gave Shisa my word that I'd honor his dying wish. Myrta paused and glanced back over her shoulder at him, 
but didn't say anything else. He wondered if she believed him. He found he was completely unable to go on talking, and passed off his silence in settling the carbonite slab down on a bench in the cargo hold and draping it with the velvet weave cloth. It was one way of dealing with a painful memory, sticking a different one in its place. A change could be as good as a rest. On the journey back to Mandalore, Myrta kept getting out of the co-pilot seat and disappearing into the hold. When he went aft to see what she was doing, he found her sitting next to Sintas, one hand on her shoulder, talking quietly to her. She can't hear you, he said. Some say carbonated people do. They said Han Solo did, but Fett saw no reason to upset Myrta more than she was already. She'll hear you soon enough. Myrta carried on anyway. Maybe I'm rehearsing a difficult speech. She was right, but she didn't know that it wouldn't be one-way traffic. Fett decided to face all that if and when it happened, and wished he'd been half the man his father had been. Django Fett would have known what to say. Slave One touched down at Bevin's farm in Kaldabe at dusk. A small, grim-faced welcoming committee met the ship, and Fett could only feel discomfort that he had an audience to observe yet again what a shabby job he'd made of being a husband and father. Dr. Bellwine was there as commanded, incongruous in his soft city clothes, his white blonde hair whipped by the breeze. Bevin and his partner Medrit Vasser looked at the carbonite slab with matching frowns. It was rare to see Bevin wearing anything but a cheerful grin. Medrit raised an eyebrow. I'm no expert, of course, but that was a handsome woman you had there, Fett. Fett noted the past tense and the implication of his ingratitude for the lucky hand he'd been dealt and followed the slab into Medrit's workshop. The couple's grandchildren, Schalk and Brila, tagged along to watch the spectacle, eyes wide. Jintar, their father, moved in from nowhere and scooped both of them up in his arms. So he was back from the war then. His right hand was heavily bandaged. The next time he went to fight, Schalk would be old enough to join him and learn the craft of warfare. He'd be eight next birthday, Bevin had said. It seemed far too young, and yet Fett had been at his father's side at that age, and had loved every moment. Dangerous missions had been a rare treat. Come on, Adika, Jintar said to them. Nothing to see here. It's rude to stare at the Mandalore. Is the lady dead? Brila asked. Can we have her stuff? Sleeping, said Jintar, and winked at Fett. Medrit had cleaned up one of the side rooms in the workshop for the carbonite removal process. It was where he recharged blaster power packs with Tibana gas. Bellwine looked horrified as the slab was lowered into the release vat. It's okay, Medrit said, looming over the doctor. He was tall enough to make a Wookiee think twice. I've thawed plenty of this stuff. It's how we used to ship nerf carcasses when I worked on Olenet. How very reassuring. Bellwine opened his bag to take out a tray of pneumatic dispensers and vials of medication. I must write a paper on that for the Galactic Journal of Endocrinology. Now the onlookers had thinned out to just Fett, Myrta, Bellwine, Medrit, and Bevin. Medrit stood with his hand on the controls. Say the word, Mandalore. It was said that carbonite freezing was how people had traveled interstellar distances before hyperdrive. Fett's most vivid experience of the technique had been Han Solo's incarceration and the consequence of Solo's flailing around blind after being released from the block 
was still something Fett saw each day in the mirror when he shaved. Don't worry, Bobica. Bevin grinned nervously, daring to joke when everyone else looked on the grim edge of mourning. We don't have any sarlaccs here. Only Bevin could get away with that. He was the closest Fett had to a friend. As soon as she's free of the carbonite, I need to get her heart rate and blood oxygen up right away to minimize tissue damage, said Bellwine. He held a hypo spray as if it were a miniature blaster, and in his other hand he had an oxygen delivery device, like an aquata breather. Stand clear. Ready, Doc? Medrit asked. Ready. Medrit pressed the switches, and the ferrocrete vat erupted with cold vapor and loud hisses as gas escaped. Fett thought it was noisier than he remembered, and then he realized it wasn't the escaping byproducts of the thaw, but the weak panting squeals of a woman in agony. Bellwine dived forward, blocking his path, and reached into the miniature storm that had formed above the vat. "'It's okay, Babuir. It's okay. It's okay,' Myrta leaned in, too, taking the spent hypo from Bellwine's hand while he applied the breather. Sintas wasn't screaming. She'd never been a weakling, not her. But the sounds she was making were incoherent. The panic of any terrified animal with something unfamiliar pressed to its mouth by a stranger. "'You're safe. It's okay. You're going to be all right.' When the vapor dissipated, Myrta held Sintas's hand while Bellwine slapped a monitor on her arm. Sintas was thrashing about, trying to sit up, and staring totally uncoordinated, eyes rolling. She pulled her arm away from Bellwine, grabbing blindly for anything. Myrta caught her arm. "'You're among friends,' she said quietly. "'Easy.' Udesi, just relax and let the doctor take a look at you. Sintas looked right through Fett, her face all white terror made more stark by the ink-black kifar tattoos, the kukuf. She was blind. He was ready for that, but he wasn't ready to look into her eyes again, dark blue. At once both everything he thought he'd ever wanted and the deserved judgment on what he hadn't given her. The last fifty years collapsed in on themselves, leaving Fett nineteen again, besotted for a brief while, and then an older, numbed man, wondering why the only thing he could manage was to walk away to leave her in some filthy alley, knowing he was abandoning his daughter again, too. I didn't even ask about Aelin. I just gave Sintas the hologram and told her not to lose it again. Well, she can move, Bellwine said. No paralysis. Excellent. Shab, he's a sharp one, Medrit muttered. I'd never have diagnosed that in a million years. Myrta and Bevin lifted Sintas and laid her on a repulsor trolley, wrapping her in blankets. She was calming down now, or at least exhausting herself into a quieter state. Fett dared to step closer. Bevin put a discreet hand on his back to steady him. Madam, Bellwine said, can you hear me? He checked the device on her arm. Can you tell me your name? She jerked her head in the direction of the doctor's voice. I... heard... That's good. Let's try again. Can you tell me your name? Sintas seemed totally distracted by the question. She settled on her back, eyes open and apparently staring at the workshop ceiling. I... I don't know... Don't know. Who are you? Where's... 
Oh, Stang, I don't know who... Sintas had been frozen in her mid-thirties. She was a shuddering wreck, coming out of the agony of carbonite suspension. But she was still a beautiful woman. I owe her. She's not my wife now. But I owe her something for all those years I was never a husband or a father. Fett had no way of articulating that aloud, because he'd never learned to go beyond that single, all-defining father-son relationship. But he wouldn't abandon her this time. At least he had some breathing space now to work out how to fill in her missing history. If she'd been in her fifties, sixties, seventies, he'd have done things differently. He swore it. But she wasn't. She wasn't even old enough to be Myrta's mother. Myrta looked stricken, but her eyes were dry. She was a fat, all right. Let's get her to her room, Fett said. Dr. Bellwine needs to carry out his examination. Amnesia's really common in carbonite cases, Bevine said kindly, following the repulsor into the main body of the house. But how much of the past would you want her to forget for good? It's not her who needs to forget, Fett said. It's me. Chapter 4 Sweetheart, are you okay? Don't take any stupid risks. You're not responsible for saving the Galactic Alliance single-handed. Shula Shevu, newly married, in an encrypted message to her husband. Bastion Imperial Remnant, Moff Assembly Hall at Ravelin. It was always sobering to be a spectator at your own funeral. Pelion stood at the window overlooking the parade ground and watched the ornate cannon carriage that would carry his remains. Like him, it was a survivor from a different age, archaic in design, but still able to fulfill its function in war. The paired blood fins drawing it came to a halt at precisely the center of the paved expanse, remained motionless for a count of ten, and then wheeled right to follow a perfectly straight line through the archway and out into the streets of the capital. The brilliant scarlet crests that earned them the name bobbing like flames in the morning sunlight. Pelion was sure they were a subspecies of gonoidal certeses, but they had that striking red crest like the marine predator, and bloodfin was much easier to pronounce. A token platoon of Imperial guards marched behind in their everyday number no. five uniforms, not parade best. However many times Pelion saw the rehearsal, it was impressive. Bloodfins were notoriously hard to train in the art of dressage or precise cavalry displays. He made a mental note to congratulate the ceremonial staff. The carnivorous quadrupeds were formidable mounts, quite capable of fighting on their own even when their rider was dead, and they were not known for their obedience off the battlefield. Bastion had to rehearse the state funeral regularly, because such magnificent displays of pomp and precision didn't happen overnight. A leader might die at any time, and Bastion liked to be prepared. Pelion sipped his calf, aware of the hum of conversation at his back, and watched the carriage and the guard platoon vanish into Ravelin's early morning quiet. "'Doesn't that depress you, sir?' asked Rige. Only if I'm taking part. Pelion held out the translucent cup for a refill. I'll worry when I see hundreds of guards in their parade best. He watched the reflection of the room behind him in the transparisteel sheet of the window, and noted each moth's arrival, and whom he huddled with to chat before the meeting started. Two minutes, Vitor, and then we begin. It was a regular weekly assembly of the Moth Council of the Empire, 
nothing extraordinary or unscheduled, but in the last twenty-four hours, Pelion had been made aware of activity on the informal diplomatic front. He could still rely on Moff Soretti to keep him up to speed on backroom politics, even though the man was retired. All those Moffs, and so very little empire to play in. It was bound to make them restless. Pelion glanced around the table during the meeting, playing the game of working out which of the Moffs wanted to assassinate him, and which saw some advantage in keeping him alive. Luckily, the only ones who were competent to take him on were also the most militarily able, and so were his allies. Nature had her checks and balances. They broke for calf. All you need is patience, gentlemen. I'm ninety-two. Just sit it out. Admiral, may I refill your cup? Lesserson was one of the old-school moths a man who believed in duty. He even kept himself combat fit and clipped his hair extra short to a suede-like bloom across his skull. I think this meeting is going to last a little longer than usual. Pelion sipped thoughtfully. Did I ever tell you I was psychic? I believe not. Oh, I am. I believe a great opportunity is going to come our way— one that will change our destiny. Lesserson stifled a smile. It's very general, sir. I'll go out on a limb. I predict that at least one of our colleagues here has heard of a wondrous potential connected to the ongoing nastiness between the Galactic Alliance and the Confederation. Lesserson allowed the full grin to take over his face and cast a cautious eye over the cluster of men who treated Grand Moff Keel as a center of gravity. I must remember to ask you to advise me when placing Udupiendo racing bets. Pelion didn't know Jason Solo as well as he would have liked, but one thing he did know was that the man was both manipulative and impatient, a combination that meant he tended to start playing his games early. It was only a matter of time before the rebuff of his offer to talk about joining the Galactic Alliance camp was countered with a discreet word to the Moffs about what luscious opportunities their senile leader had passed up without telling them. In fact, if Jason didn't do it, Pelion would lose his faith in the enduring power of self-interest which had kept the galaxy turning about its core since the planets had cooled enough to support bacteria. Where Neothel stood in this, he wasn't yet sure, but he knew her well enough to judge that her failing was her inability to stop Jason, not her active sanction of Jason's excesses as Joint Chief of State. Admiral, something significant has come to our attention, Keel said, I wonder if we might discuss it in the wider context of the war. The Empire has managed to stay out of the conflict so far, said Pelion. Thank goodness for that, Jason Solo. Faith is restored, and the galactic disk still turns. What do you mean by context? Threats and opportunities, Admiral. The war is sucking in more worlds, and the Jedi Council has upped sticks and moved out of Coruscant, which is a worrying development. It suggests more fragmentation in existing alliances, and that might make our neighboring sectors unstable. But it might also give us an opportunity to expand our sphere of influence. Pelion took a spoonful of gen honey and held it above his cup letting a long ribbon of the viscous amber run off the spoon into the calf, then twirled it with a practiced wrist while he waited for Keel to go on. It wasn't the first time he'd used the silent routine on a meeting of the moths. They never seemed able to resist it, though, and by the time his spoon emerged shining and clean from the calf, they were getting uncomfortable and looking to Keel to fill the long gap. 
Do go on, said Lesserson. Our diplomatic sources say that the GA is recruiting allies from outside its usual sphere of influence, said Keel. When the war is over, the map of the galaxy will look very different. Lesserson smiled. It always made him look more disturbing than when he frowned. Well, there's a big gap near Corellia where Centerpoint used to be, for a start. There was a ripple of laughter. Keel pressed on. Rewards may be there for the taking, gentlemen. In exchange for fighting Jason Solo's war for him, said Rossett, is there anything we want badly enough for that? The discussion began rambling over the possibilities in a tapestry of voices. Neothel's war, too. Oh, let's not forget the Admiral, shall we? If an Admiral was running it, it would be over by now. Solo could always lose the war, of course. If the G.A. is thinking this way, then perhaps the Confederation is, too. And maybe they've got a better offer. Is there an offer? The silence was sudden. It was an excellent question. Pelion thought it was time to remind them that he was not senile, that he was not a figurehead, and that he did not lack informants. Bilbringi and Borlias, if we commit troops and ships to the G.A. Pelion let the names sink in. He still enjoyed that silent moment of revelation he could create in a meeting. Yes, it was vulgar theater to reveal what he knew of the offer leaked to the moths in that way, but it was also a shot across the bows of any moth who thought he could best the old man. And of course my question would be, what's in it for us? Both those worlds are in the G.A.'s gift to give— but there's still a small population in both systems, and we still might have to fight to take them. If it's the latter, then all the G.A. is doing is turning a blind eye to any expansion on our part, in exchange for our blood. And that seems to me like paying twice. If we wanted to expand, Solo would be in no position to stop us anyway— while he's so thinly stretched in this war, and we would need to commit nothing to his land-grab expeditions. Then the question is whether we want to expand the Empire, Lesserson said. Do we? I would be inclined to wait and see what's left of the galaxy before we decide what we want, said Rossett. It might be the difference between snapping up a bargain at a sale and taking on a charity case that saps our resources. Pelion felt the surge of old emotions again. This was about duty. Wars left the galaxy in tatters, and the galaxy's wounds were freshly healed after the Yuzhan Vong War. It would take very little to tear the new tissue apart and make healing harder next time. Some worlds had recovered very little in a decade. This was the situation an empire could avoid, could stabilize, could heal. But if it meant working with the likes of Jason Solo, no. Pelion could never see that lasting. He might do business with Neothel, but not anyone as volatile and mystic as Solo. We are the Empire. We bring order and justice for the common good. The irony wasn't lost on him. This was clearly Jason Solo's ideology, too. My problem with Solo, Pelion said carefully, knowing that his exact words would reach Jason sooner or later, and wondering if it was worth the effort to track the route, is that he has no background in government or the military. Jedi are very good at being in opposition, being the conscience on the shoulder of leaders and keeping them on their toes, or even playing peacekeeping shock troops when needed. But they do not run things well. They're doers, 
not managers. Although I suspect Princess Leia has excellent leadership skills, sadly she's not the one running the junta. How different life might be then. Solo seems to be winning rather a lot, for a man whose first uniform was a colonel's, Keel said. There's a Moon Cal Admiral in a shiny white suit, to whom he owes at least some of that, I suspect. Pelion realized Jason was not a textbook Jedi, and from the rumors he was hearing, probably dabbled in the dark side. But the principle stood. The Jedi Council was part think tank, part special forces, part mystical reassurance for the ruling class. Jedi could nudge and steer and even block, but they were used to being a small weight added to tip the scales. Jason was from that tradition, but trying to be an emperor. He wasn't up to the task. Are we taking a vote on this? asked Rossett. There's no formal offer, and so no motion on the table. Lesserson drew the questions away from Pelion. I would simply suggest that we keep a watching brief on the situation, and if an opportunity arises to clarify what Chief of State Solo has in mind, then we look to Admiral Pelion to explore it if he so wishes. The Admiral has unique experience in seeing history repeat itself. He had to hand it to Lesserson. The Moff had a superbly analytical mind and didn't need to hear the gossip about Jason Solo's parallel course with his grandfather's to predict certain outcomes. Had Jason but known it, though, he was doing what every flawed and ideologically committed leader throughout history had done. His vision was all-consuming, and in time he would become so dazzled by it and so embedded in it that he would ignore and then simply not see the warning signs. There was always one more bold act, always one more final push that would vindicate him and make everything work. They all did it. The innovators and visionaries who had brilliant ideas and could get things moving had very different psyches to what was needed to reach and maintain stability. They simply looked for more glorious revolution to spark. It was hardwired. It was doomed to self-destruct, and it cost lives. Sooner or later, sooner probably, Jason Solo would overstretch himself, and then the battlefield would be open to those who could pick up the pieces and bring back quiet order. It would be left to the Empire. The Moffs filed out. Pelion hung back with Rige, until the grand room was empty except for them and a housekeeping droid who hovered around clearing the splendid pleak table. "'I love it when you drop a full payload on them, sir,' Raj said. "'That'll teach them to think I'm deaf. The blood fins aren't hauling me away yet.' But this was just the opening salvo. Jason Solo would not give up. Pelion wanted to see if anything of genuine substance was on the table before he made a more formal refusal, and he would not play by Jason's despotic rules. One Palpatine was enough for a lifetime. There was still calf left in the pot, and Pelion was in no hurry now. He chatted with Rige about the temperaments of pedigree bloodfins, and whether they could ever be safe for children to ride given their propensity to devour whatever fell in front of them in the heat of the moment. He turned aside the droid when it attempted to clear away those tasty little zirlia pastries. He felt clean and in control again. Then his comlink chirped. He recognized the incoming code. "'Excuse me, my boy,' he said. "'I must see what my Coruscant Bureau has to tell me.' It wasn't spying. Pelion was welcome to return to the capital any time as a respected veteran. He was simply keeping in touch with old friends. The message wasn't voice, but text, 
and it was very short. Rumors from impeccable sources said that Jason Solo had lost his temper after a skirmish and force-choked a junior officer to death in full view of the bridge crew. Oh, it's just like old times, said Pelion, finding that making light of enormities preserved his blood pressure for those times when he really needed to be angry. We're all back in harness, reprising the glory days of our youth. Myself, Princess Leia, and young Skywalker, Master Fett, and now little Lord Vader. The military had adored Jason for throwing his lot in with them and looking after them. How long they might keep that up if he made a habit of killing underlings, Pelion wasn't sure. Jason still had a fund of goodwill to squander yet. No, Pelion would very definitely not be playing by Jason Solo's rules. Anakin Solo Gandil Fondor Hyperlane Teb... No, she's gone. It was the second time that morning that Darth Kytus had turned to Lieutenant Tebut for a sit-rep and remembered she was dead, which left him unsettled for reasons he had to stop and ponder. Captain Shevu gave him an odd glance when he turned to the station that Tebut had normally occupied on the bridge, but said nothing. Kytus wandered across to the viewscreen to look out at distorted time and space, a respite while he grappled with his lapses. Tahiri, playing the part of a junior officer perfectly, stayed at her station with her hands clasped behind her back. Had he genuinely forgotten that he'd killed Tebut? Or was this all part of... grieving... He'd lost count of the times he'd marked a passage in a holozine for his brother Anakin, or seen something funny that he just had to tell him, or any one of a dozen things that crashed painfully when he remembered in the next instant that Anakin was dead. Kytus could remember how terrible that was, and yet he could flow walk back to Anakin's death and not suffer that again. He didn't understand why and that bothered him. He was supposed to be past those petty personal concerns now. Perhaps this was the way it was for Sith of his status. Perhaps he needed the ability to switch off and do what was necessary, however distressing, and yet not lose the passions and sorrows that gave Sith strength. If he could take terrible decisions and never feel their enormity— then he would be no better than a droid. Flesh and blood needed the protective rule of someone who understood their pain. So, he worked through things carefully, and he always found his answer. He was spared that for the time he needed the clarity to take hard decisions, and yet he still had to suffer the reality later, when it was safe to do so. If he forgot what pain and fear were, then he would also forget his duty to the trillions of beings who would look to him to stop their suffering. This uneasiness about Tebut was a price, then, not a failing, a reminder from the force of what it meant to be flesh and blood, and whom he served. It made sense. He felt reassured. "'Dropping out of hyperspace in five standard minutes, sir,' said the officer of the watch. Very good. Kytus tore his gaze from the transparisteel and strode back to his bridge position. So, Tahiri, we'll see Fondor shortly. She was in blue uniform, no badges of rank, and proper black fleet-issue boots, the ones with durasteel-hardened toe caps for safety. Tahiri hated shoes, but a warship was a dangerous place to go barefoot. It also looked sloppy and ill-disciplined. This is the next dissident planet we take back. Not today, though, she said. We're doing reconnaissance. A recce wasn't needed, 
given the intelligence Kaidas had on Fondor. Less than a standard year earlier, it had been a Galactic Alliance member state, and so its defensive capability and industrial output were a matter of record. Worlds didn't change into unknown quantities that fast. But Kaidas was still baffled by Fondor's decision to secede from the G.A., an act he saw as inexplicably treacherous. The planet's yards had thrived on the custom of Coruscant-based regimes for decades, and this very hyperspace lane was testimony to the volume of hulls that had been transported from the orbitals here to the galactic capital. No, said Kytus, we're showing Fondor how easy it is to get at them. A speeder bus ride, practically. Don't they know that? We often ignore the obvious. And this is partly education for you. Tahiri's eyes flickered a little. In which discipline? Decision-making. The task of sweet-talking Pelion into listening to Kytus' offer was something any intelligent, personable woman could do. But Kytus needed Tahiri to be more than that and he needed her to grow so that she wasn't performing like a circus rancor simply for tidbits of time spent flow-walking back to watch Anakin. The lure of his dead brother had been a legitimate way to get her interest, even if it was a tacky and rather cruel trick. The weight of duty to the dark side meant that very few would embrace it head-on without some self-gratification to hold them in its thrall while they learned the truth. It was a superficial means to a nobler end. Now he needed to hear it to understand the gravity of Sith service if she was to fill the gap left by Ben Skywalker as his apprentice. And as Ben had been blooded by the task of assassinating Durgedjan, so to hear he needed to comprehend the gravity of her role and move beyond romantic fantasies that could never happen. Anakin was dead and he wasn't coming back. The kindest thing Kaidus could do, would do one day soon, would be to force Tahiri to face up to that and live for the future. Okay, she said. Her lips moved uncertainly. I mean, very good, sir. Tahiri obviously wanted to do well. Kaidus watched the viewport not the view fed from exterior cams to the monitors, as the slightly misshapen disk of Fondor resolved into a sharp-edged planet ringed by orbital shipyards like a swarm of tiny moons. Take us in as close as you can, Helm, he said. Very good, sir. There was no hesitation, query, or even the hint in the force of any doubt about his wisdom. The Star Destroyer moved from open space into the invisible but fiercely defended borders of Fondor sovereign territory. Kaidus had neither rehearsed this nor warned the bridge crew. By now the early warning beacons had picked up the Anakin Solo's approach, and the ship's long-range sensors showed that Fondorian fighters were scrambling. Soon there would be a concerted attack on the ship, and he was counting on that. He wanted to test Tahiri's nerve and commitment. Weapons officer, he said, when you acquire a target, do not fire. I repeat, do not fire. Shields and defensive systems, offline. Nobody said a word, except Tahiri. Is this some special tactic? she asked. A feint? No. I'm leaving the ship wide open to attack. But the weapons officer will give you firing solutions. You don't have to do any calculations. You only have to decide whether or not to open fire. Kytus could see Shevu unclasp his hands from behind his back to fold his arms. But that was all. There wasn't the sense of nervousness around the bridge that might have been expected. The crew, as always, 
had faith in Kytus to deal with any situation. But Tahiri was rattled. She couldn't sense Kytus's intentions. He remained shut down in the force as a matter of course now, emanating nothing to other force users. And now she could see the flight of Fondorian assault fighters streaming out to intercept them. She had never had control of a warship. That's easy enough, she said, not sounding convinced. He could feel her probing, groping around in the force for hidden meaning, concealed traps. If someone's working out the firing solutions... Are the fighters a threat to us, Tahiri? She was having doubts now. He'd sown uncertainty in her mind, simply by asking an apparently obvious question. Possibly. How will you know? When they power up their weapons. We have weapons online. Are we a threat to them, or just ready to deal with an attack? What are your rules of engagement? What if they don't fire? To her credit, Tahiri seemed to be thinking logically. The fighters were closing in. Bridge crew began shifting in their seats now, a little uneasy. Quickly, Tahiri, you only have seconds. A second is all it takes for a missile to penetrate the hull, vent a whole compartment, kill hundreds of our comrades. Kytus knew the Fondorian pilots would detect charged, targeted, locked-on cannon, and yet no defenses. They'd think it was a trap. They'd hesitate, assess the target, wonder what they'd missed. In range. They've powered up but not acquired us, sir, said the weapons officer. Tahiri. Fire, she said. Take, take, take. Cannon fire stabbed into the flight of fighters, streams of it taking out all six of them in sudden silent blooms of white light. Naval and air engagements were always impersonal, Kaidas thought, machine on machine, not at all like the urgency of facing an enemy in a trench or street and seeing a face. It took a while to sink in at first. Reactivate defenses, and lay in a course for Coruscant, said Kytus. The Star Destroyer came alive with the lights and sounds of preparation for the hyperspace jump back to the core. Tahiri was still staring at the viewport. Now, was that the right decision? You tell me, he said. I neutralized the threat. Or you fired on vessels that hadn't targeted you, and made widows and orphans for no good reason. Which do you think you did? It's a war. Wars have rules. You told me to fire. I told you that you could fire. Kytus could see the crew trying to pretend the dissection wasn't taking place in front of them. They were all suddenly blind and deaf. The decision was yours. Is that what this is all for? You brought the ship here just for a few minutes to see if I could give a command to fire? Yes. And put the ship at risk? And kill Pilots? It's what we do. How do you feel about that? Do you think about the living beings in those fighters? Or do you think about us in this ship? And can you ever be sure you took the only reasonable path open to you? I can't answer that. To become my apprentice... You have to be able to answer that in your own mind, and live with the answer. You killed today. It should never feel easy or distant like some Holovid game. If it does, 
or it doesn't trouble you later at some time, then you're not up to the responsibility. Tahiri stood silent and wide-eyed. She looked as if she was seriously considering the implications. Like him, she'd learned from her time among the Yuzhan Vong. She knew that there was nothing like blood on your hands to make you grow up and understand all the things you had to sacrifice for duty. Kytus retired to his day cabin and sat reading the previous day's intelligence reports on the journey home. When he was still Jason Solo, Kytus had been warned that command, rule, was lonely. But now he knew what Tenelka had meant when she told him it was the price of being a leader. He was utterly alone now, rejected even by his daughter Alana. That, that was my sacrifice. He had convinced himself it was Mara Skywalker. Then he had convinced himself it was Ben's adulation he'd sacrificed by killing her. Now he knew that whatever the ancient Sith tassels had prophesied in their arcane language of knots and colors, his sacrifice was an ordinary man's precious connection to other beings, love, trust, and intimacy. He could never recover any of it. Alana was gone from him forever. His only comfort was that the galaxy would be safer for her. Lumia had said the cost would be high, but this was the price of order and justice. This was the price of stability, and his was just one life out of many, a price he considered worth paying however much it hurt. Tahiri would discover that, too, and she had just taken her first step on that path. A small gray area of right or wrong to most beings, but one that a Sith apprentice had to be able to handle. This is duty. There was a bleep at the cabin door, Shevu. Kaidas felt the man coming down the passage, heralded by a sense of wariness and distaste in the force. Shevu was a former police officer, a Coruscant security force man and he brought his culture with him. He didn't like Kytus, and he didn't approve of his methods. That was as clear as day. But Kytus trusted him precisely because it was clear even to a non-force sensitive. A man who didn't try to hide his feelings, but did the job well anyway, gave Kytus nothing to fear. This is duty, too. Shevu understands what must be done. Sir, shall I leave these reports on your desk, or would you prefer to discuss them? Shevu said. Leave them. Whether the man liked him or not, there was nothing to be gained by alienating him further. He was very good at his job. You look tired. Sleepless nights, sir. Shevu was being brutally honest. Kytus could sense that. A little anger a little fear, something worrying him, a yearning to see someone he cared for. Distractions like that could become corrosive. Problems? Family stuff, sir. You have a girlfriend, yes? Not any longer, sir. Ah. Yes, Kytus understood abandonment by those who claimed to love and understand him. I'm sorry. Isn't it time you had a few days off? I haven't taken any leave, sir. Burning out isn't being a good officer, Shevu. I need you sharp. Take seventy-two hours and come back refreshed. I can't do anything about the lady, other than say that I understand the toll that duty takes on relationships— Shevu's surprise was palpable. Thank you, sir. His mood felt as if it had lifted a little. Most generous. 
Kytus watched the doors close behind him and was reassured that he hadn't turned into a monster, whatever Ben Skywalker might have thought. Different situations required different incentives, and Shavu, Shavu couldn't be scared into compliance, or he would have been no good at an intelligence-based dangerous job. He couldn't be cajoled for the same reasons. He had to be treated with honest respect. The man was as straight as a die. There were few like that, and worth the keeping. Kaldabe, Mandalore Jaina dropped out of hyperspace in the X-Wing and hoped that making herself slow and obvious would prevent a misunderstanding about her intentions in a Galactic Alliance fighter. I must be out of my mind. I should have contacted Fett in advance. But if he'd said no, then I'd still be here, and I'd be in worse trouble. And it's always harder to turn someone away when they show up in person. And Fett respects physical courage, and— and she was a Jedi entering Mandalorian space. That was all there was to it. But she had to get past the gatekeeper to get to Fett to win him over with her straight talking. And this was no time to lose her nerve. Keldabe ATC, this is X-Wing Amber 9, requesting permission to enter Mandalorian airspace. She checked again that every weapon system was powered down so that nothing— Absolutely nothing gave them the wrong impression about her intentions. Maybe a shuttle would have been a better idea, but she had no idea how she might be received, and being cannoned up made her feel better. The X-Wing held its position. Keldabe, this is Amber 9. Are you receiving me? Keldabe ATC to 9 Amber, said a female voice, that didn't sound remotely ruffled by the intrusion of a G.A. fighter. Maybe they shot them down every day for practice. It was going to be a hard way to find out. Parasol, wait one. Would they even recognize her? The X-Wing was obvious enough, but she wasn't a known face like Jason or Mom. She was just a pilot, not even in G.A. Orange deliberately low-key in a somber flight suit with her hair tied back. All she needed to do, though, was to land and do the humble thing, to throw herself on the mercy of Boba Fett, and she was still gambling that saving the salient point about her real identity might get her a little farther. If she said right now that she was Jaina Solo, there was no telling if some Mandalorian patriot might fancy settling the family score on behalf of Fett. If a bunch of Mandalorians had shown up asking for Dad, I know how I'd react. Jaina had never been in Mandalorian space before. Mom had, in her rebel youth. She said the Mandalorians lived in treehouses, and their leader, a blonde man called Shisa, had been very charming. Jaina waited, cultivating a patience she never knew she had. Her force senses told her something was approaching, but she sensed no danger. It felt oddly benign, in fact. If she hadn't known better, she would have said, amused. Yes, there was definitely something approaching her. Nothing showed up on the X-Wing's monitors other than a medium-sized chip with a heavy drive something like a spaceport tug or some utility vessel. Perhaps it was going to escort her in. It was very close now. Jaina still couldn't see anything, but it was approaching from her port side. It was only when she turned her head as far as she could, unable to sit still any longer, that she saw a black void where stars should have been, and picked out a large, unlit shape heading straight at her. Had it detected her? It was on a collision course. Jaina got ready to run. Then the lights came on. The brilliant blue-white light seared her eyes for a split second, but when she blinked away the afterimage, she was looking at a grim slab of a vessel that was a mass of cannon turrets, turntables, hatches, and angles. There was no other way to describe it. It was a flying tank. 
Keldabe welcomes careful Aruetise if their credit's good, said ATC over the comm link. Nine Amber, what's the purpose of your visit? Here we go. Just do it. I've come to see Boba Fett. Amber Nine, identify yourself. Keldabe, I'm not GA anymore. I sound like a criminal. They might have been detaining her. It was hard to tell. I've come alone. Follow your escort. She was still in one piece. That was something, although she would have to work out what Arue Tise meant. The tank rotated ninety degrees in the horizontal and pulled away in front of her, dipping its starboard side like a wing to indicate to her to follow. She'd expected to be met and checked over by a Besulik, and was almost disappointed not to encounter the new Mandalorian fighter. They said it was faster than an X-Wing. Corellia and other planetary forces were lining up to buy them. Aunt Mara would have had fun with one of those. The memory ambushed Jaina several times a day. She thought it was better than forgetting, however much pain that would have saved her. She had learned that when Anakin died. Before she reached the upper atmosphere of Mandalore, the ungainly-looking tank was joined by a smooth delta-shaped fighter, and Jaina had her wish. It was the Besulik she'd seen on the Holonews channels. The vessel maneuvered between her and the tank, so close that she could see the helmeted pilot turn to give her a hand signal familiar to any pilot. Follow me. The tank peeled off and vanished, showing remarkably little heat signature on Jaina's sensors. What was that? she asked. You want to place an advance order? said a male voice. It was the Besulik pilot. Mandel Motors calls it the Trocod, the Star Saber. It was an elegant name for an inelegant vessel and Jaina put it on her list of things to worry about much later. Landing on Mandalore needed every scrap of her attention. She was suddenly in busy airspace over heavily wooded country scattered with small villages. Keldabe loomed in her viewscreen, a massive, disorganized fortress set on a granite pedestal ringed by a moat-like river. She could identify the Mandel Motors Tower from the logo painted on it, that grim animal skull with a flare emerging from one empty eye socket. And her passive scanners were picking up a formidable array of ground-to-air defenses. Keldabe was ready for all comers. She brought the X-Wing down in a smooth descent, tailed by the Besulik. The apron area was packed with vessels from battered gladiators and smart new KDY-armed transports to and this rattled her composure a little, old X-wings in garish paint schemes. Most vessels were disgorging passengers, all of them wearing that distinctive full-body armor in a riot of colors. Red, deep yellow, and forest green seemed to be very popular. The X-wing's undercarriage shivered as it landed. Jaina was past the point of no return. Holiday? she asked over the comlink, trying to be casual. Return of the expatriates, said the Besulik pilot. Millions of Mondoade live on other worlds. The Mondalore asked for volunteers to rebuild the planet, so they came. They're getting their land allocations. I had no idea you were so scattered. That's why you can't get rid of us. It's like trying to hammer mercury. It just breaks up and comes back together again. Jaina noted that for future anxiety sessions, shut down the systems, and prepped to pop the hatch, wondering if Amber Nine would end up appropriated by the locals and painted bright purple like an old X-Wing sitting in a corner of the strip. Get down from the cockpit, Aruati, and we'll check you out. Now, do I take my lightsaber or not. Jaina took the risk and left it in her grab bag in the cockpit. She jumped down and stood on the permacrete, an anonymous gray flight suit 
in a sea of clattering Mandalorian armor. The air smelled of fresh sawn resin trees and hot metal. Just tell me what Aruati means. Foreigner, said the pilot. He pulled a short stock Blastec blaster from his belt with a casual movement and ran a hand scanner over her with the other. Outsider. Not one of us. Even traitor. Okay, you're clean. She thought he would have been far from pleased if he'd picked up her lightsaber on that scan. What happens to me now? Someone's coming to check you out. Can't let just any old riffraff pester our Mandalore, can we? Should she admit who she was now? The man had a blaster. If he took the revelation badly, she'd have a choice of taking whatever came next, or drawing on her force skills unarmed while surrounded by hundreds of Mandalorians, every single one of them with some weapon, even the children. It would all get out of hand before she knew it, and she needed Fett's help badly. Absolutely, she said. Jaina was already having to think differently to suppress all her own training that said she should have been treating this environment as a serious threat and preparing to defend herself. The feeling of helplessness was both utterly alien and disturbing. The Besulik pilot didn't say anything else to her, and just stood with his blaster resting in the safety position against his shoulder. They waited. People were starting to stare. Eventually, a speeder bike edged through the crowd on the perimeter and headed straight for her. "'She's all yours,' said the pilot. "'Unarmed.' The rider was a man in royal blue armor, and she sensed that he was agitated, but in a distracted way that said he was worrying about something else. "'I'm Goron Bevin,' he said, looking wary. A short but serious-looking metal saber hung from his belt, as well as a blaster. The Mandalore is tied up at the moment, so you can tell me all about it. Get on. It was tempting just to come clean and tell him she was Jaina Solo. Yes, that Jaina Solo. But a black object dangling from his shoulder plate distracted her. It was alien hair, somehow familiar. Mandalorians loved their trophies. Fett went in for braided Wookiee scalps. It was pretty disgusting, but she wasn't here to be judgmental about their customs. She needed Mandalorian help. Is that Yuzhan Vong? she asked, trying to be casual. Indeed it is, said Bevin. Nothing I like better than killing crab boys. That was the sum of their conversation until they reached Kaldabe. Mom had been right. There were some treehouses along the way. But the city was just that, a tight urban chaos of granite blocks, wood, plastoid, and durasteel, with the houses packed together like a close-quarters battle. There were still signs of war damage on many walls, and even Mandel Motors' hundred-meter tower bore scorch marks. A few new offices and other buildings looked grander, but this didn't appear to be a rich city, or even a planned one. It looked like a battered survivor. Bevin stopped the speeder in front of what could only be a cantina. Its doors parted and the smell of cooking and brewing wafting onto the street. Above the entrance was lettering Jaina couldn't read, and, helpfully, a few words of basic. Universe Tap Calf. No strills inside. Barter accepted. Jaina followed Bevin inside. He took off his helmet, laid it on the counter, and ruined another stereotype for her. He wasn't some granite-faced thug, but an ordinary gray-haired man about her mother's age, with the kind of face that looked on the edge of a big smile all the time and the Fett-inspired image of Mandalore that she'd nursed for so long kept crumbling. When her eyes adjusted to the light, she found herself in a cantina full of armored Mandalorians, not all human, helmets stacked under tables. They were watching a big holovid screen in intent, reverent silence, 
mesmerized by a bolo ball match. Meshkaroya, Bevin whispered, as if he was interrupting an act of worship. The beautiful game, our other national pastime. Something small and furry zipped past Jaina's foot, but she didn't dare look too closely. One of the patrons, a stocky man with white hair and a vine tattoo curling up his neck, glanced at her and guffawed. Throw her back, he laughed. You know it's wrong to catch him that small. Bevin was looking her over suspiciously. She's come to see Fett, Kerika. We're much cheaper than he is, lady, said the tattooed man. Who do you want hunted? It's okay. Jaina winced at how uncomfortably close the joke brushed to reality. She leaned against the bar, wondering why she'd been brought to a cantina and not taken to some government building or even Fett's residence. I know where my quarry is. The place smelled of spice, yeast, and fried food, and most of the patrons were drinking a black ale or small glasses of a clear liquid that almost certainly wasn't water. Her force senses told her they were all much, much more worried about the final score than they were about having a stranger among them. Were they really that relaxed, or did they just think that nobody could touch them here? I'm sorry to stare, Bevin said mildly, but I know you, and I'm trying to think where I've seen your picture. Never mind, it'll come to me. His palm rested on the pummel of that saber, probably just a comfortable way to stand in full armor, but Jaina couldn't stop herself working out how she'd parry a blow from the thing using only the force. But you're not going to tell me until you have to. Are you? Fett knows me and my family, she said. She assumed Fett might recognize her. She thought she'd met him once when she was a kid, but someone had said it might have been an imposter. He'll know why I've come. The bolo ball provided a neutral distraction. She was almost caught up in it, so deafened as the room turned from total silence to explosive yells of, Oh, yeah! when the favored team scored, that the sensation that ran up her spine and made her hair bristle caught her by surprise. Impossible. No, that's just not possible. What's wrong? Bevin asked. He reached across the bar, grabbed a handful of something from a bowl, and munched thoughtfully. You think that goal was offside? Jaina whipped around, ready to run, and the doors opened. Something was wrong, very wrong. The Force was telling her something that couldn't be true. Two Mandalorians walked in, one in armor with no two plates the same color, and one in green, clearly much older, and walking as if his joints were painful. The older man eased off his helmet and placed it on the counter. Yes, he was old. He looked as if life had drained him dry. His stare cut straight through her, and she found herself staring back, wishing she'd announced herself the moment she landed. Hello, Jedi, he said, and drew a blaster. Chapter 5 In Mandalorian lore, the color blue represents reliability. Green, duty. Gold, vengeance. Black, justice. Gray, mourning a lost love. And red, honoring a father. Mandalorians, Identity and Language. Published by the Galactic Institute of Anthropology. En route for the Hapes Cluster. You sure this isn't a trap? Ben asked. I told you Jason was nuts. Shevu was heading for the Perlemian trade route in a small transport bearing the livery of the geological survey team of the University of Coruscant. Ben felt confident about pulling off this ruse if they were questioned, 
because they really did look like a student and an earnest young lecturer in some arcane branch of the study of igneous rocks. Ben certainly wanted to look very closely at Cavan. But he had no way of knowing that I was going to do this before he told me to take a break. He had some other motive, though. Well, he didn't know we'd go to Cavan. And he won't know we've been. Who got you this crate? Jason's ticked off a lot of people. Yes, I think he's off the party list at a lot of embassies now. If you have to know. A lot of the Corellians he rounded up were professors and students. The uni took it badly, and... Barrett Psy comes in handy, with that engineering company of his dad's. The name slapped Ben in the face. Barrett Psy. He was Corellian, from an ordinary working family who'd lived on Coruscant for generations. But he did something dumb with a blaster, talked tough about fighting the Galactic Alliance, and Ben had turned him in to Jason. When he vanished from G.A.G. custody, like so many Corellians during those awful weeks, Ben had assumed the worst. A memory came back to him. Chevu hunched over a custody record, angry at losing prisoners from the list without proper procedure. "'You found him?' Ben asked, as the memory resolved into realization. "'Yeah.' "'And you got him out?' Ben floundered, dropped from a height into an ice-cold pool of doubt. But he was armed and shooting at cops. Yeah, and you don't have to feel guilty about informing on him. The law's the law. But you bent it. You let Barrett go. Ben, everything Jason did to grab power was within the law. There's law, and there's justice and sometimes they're not the same thing. Barrett was just a kid talking through his backside, like teenage lads do. Ben's certainty wavered. He'd seen Barrett fire at the cops during a riot. He'd deflected the bolt. He wondered if he was clinging to that to make himself feel better about turning him in. And you needed an informant. Don't you? Isn't that what I'll be doing for your dad? The adult world that Ben had been catapulted into had no safety net if anything went wrong. Nobody would call time on it like a training session, and the weapons weren't modified lightsabers designed just to sting. He'd woken up to that fast. He was playing by dirty, violent, grown-up rules. What still left him struggling, though, was the compromises and he lay awake at night walking the endless maze of right and wrong, wondering if two wrongs could make a right, and if he might have learned that at the Jedi Academy. Dad always seemed to know what was right, even if he couldn't explain why. Ben realized at that moment that you never learned a foolproof formula for right and wrong, that there was no checklist of good and bad and that you had to keep an eye on yourself every minute of the day and ask, Should I be doing this? Would I want someone to do this to me? You don't have to spy for the Jedi Council, he said. Of course I do, Shevu said. Who else is going to be able to get rid of a Sith? You think the G.A. courts can bring the full majesty of galactic law down on his head? As long as we both know the score, that's fine. Ben went back to his datapad, understanding how tense Chevu was. He could have told Tenelka what they were doing, but that would have meant official Hapen security involvement, and Chevu didn't trust anybody. Ben saw his point. He'd trusted Jason, after all. Now he was back in the land of hard evidence running through all the data he'd gathered in a stunned haze while his mother lay dead in the tunnel on Cavan. She was, of course, in most of the Holovid recordings. Ben had watched those over and over until he could look past his mother's body and the pain of reliving the discovery. 
He saw instead the position of the body, the surrounding area, what material was dislodged or broken, the unoxidized bright color of the smashed bricks that told him the damage was new. He reconstructed a savage fight. So much destruction of the tunnel complex on that abandoned world that force use was obvious. There were no traces of detonite. The only other explanation for that much damage. And Mara Skywalker would never have had to use that much effort against a run-of-the-mill attacker. She'd fought someone at least as powerful as herself. Ben checked the profiles of the air samples he'd taken. There was the trace of high-energy vaporization from lightsabers, and a lot of trace elements released by smashed brick, wood, and stone. He'd almost hoped for a whisper of the air from Jason's lungs, but the datapad-sized device couldn't do magic. What could he have missed? His mother's body had been examined thoroughly by Silgal. Other Jedi had combed the tunnels for evidence— picking up on all the possible clues that ordinary technology might have missed. But there was nothing discarded except the sterile pack of poison darts that were so like Kalima's weapons of choice, and the echoes of dark energy, which were equally likely to have come from Alima. But they hadn't picked up echoes of Alima herself. Was she adept enough to disguise her passage through Cavan? Jason certainly was— he could hide in the Force, and even cloak Lumia's presence right under the Jedi Council's nose. But it was still all what wasn't there at the scene, not what was. The Hapen Deep Space Security Sensors picked up the University Transport as soon as it came within range, and the only thing that seemed to concern the Control Center was whether the Survey was looking for gemstones. They seemed touchy about that. Shevu put on a very convincing, droning voice, explaining that gemstones weren't anywhere near as interesting as the Carlanian volcanic pipes and surrounding igneous rocks that would shed more light on the latest theory about the origins and formation of the Hapes Cluster. He was reading off a data pad. It did the trick. The control center stopped him midway through a riveting explanation of the outcropping of cylindrical diatremes and gave them clearance to land on Cavan. I can do this. Ben concentrated on detached calm as the windswept surface of Cavan expanded rapidly beneath the vessel. I can face this. You okay, Ben? I'm fine. Think cop. Just keep thinking cop. It was a lot less desolate than Ben recalled. The season had moved on, and the ground was covered in different plants, tussocks of tiny star-shaped red flowers with amber spikes for leaves. Shevu set the geosurvey droid to explore and drill some convincing core samples, just in case, and they walked the course. The CSF's slang for revisiting a crime scene and pacing out distances and angles in the hope of getting fresh insight. They stood at the location where Mara's stealth X had been found, looking for inspiration. Jason must have landed here in his stealth X, said Shevu. His was signed out from the GAG hangar during the relevant time frame, and we know your mother called Hapen ATC to say she knew he was in the area. So unless he switched vessels, we're looking for traces of that special Tybana isotope. Silgal's team did the sweep. Ben had covered every angle. He was sure of that. But he wanted to be wrong, and for an unforeseen forensic revelation to emerge. Stealth X's kicked so much of it around on takeoff that traces were spread over five hundred meters. If Mom landed hers anywhere near Jason's, which is likely if she was going after him, then she wiped out his isotope footprint. Just checking. Let's do the tunnels. It was the hardest thing of all. But Ben thought cop, as Shevu advised, and saw only what was in front of him, not what might have taken place there. Silgal had found traces of blood on rubble that had fallen from a collapsed ceiling, 
as if it had hit someone below. But it had been too degraded by the energy of blaster fire to identify its source. It might even have been his mother's. The sequence of events seemed clear, though. Someone, at least two people, had fought their way through the tunnels, causing huge damage. Some was blaster fire, and some showed no signs of its cause, which Ben guessed might have been massive force pushes. It's you, Jason. I know it. We all know it. But I have to have hard evidence. Shevu looked more and more exasperated as he re-scanned walls and floors, shaking his head as he looked at the readouts. The crime scene was months old. I think that's all we're going to get, said Ben. Let's go. No, I'm not done, said Shevu. I'll try another route. You don't have to— If I just wanted him for murder, I've already got a case with real live witnesses. Lieutenant Tebot. I'm doing this for you, Ben. You need to know for sure. Did Mara Skywalker's death matter more than Patra Tebot's? It did to Ben, and he felt a little guilty about having so many resources to throw at his search for justice. He knew nothing about Tebot, whether she had a family and what they might be going through now, or even what story her next of kin had been told to explain her death. He reasoned that he was doing it for her, too, and all the beings who died because of Jason, even Boba Fett's daughter, criminal or not. I should have known what he was then. I should have known when I sat outside that interrogation room and heard Jason kill her. You're right, said Ben. We keep going. They were back outside now. The sky was filling with clouds, threatening to spit light rain. Shevu went off to pace the distance from the Stealth X's last known location, seeing the terrain through Jason's eyes, he said, and Ben concentrated on his data pad again. It was hard to ignore the image of Mom. He thought of all the things he'd never had the chance to say to her, and magnified the picture so that the screen showed a close-up of her face. The injuries were fresh. If only she'd gouged a chunk out of Jason with her nails, then there'd have been tissue to match with his— but Silgal had said her wounds were peppered with dust, as if bricks had hit her in the face. As Ben gazed at her image, he could have sworn it shifted slightly, as if something was wrong with the data pad's display. The screen reflected a short-lived shaft of sunlight. Ben angled it slightly to see better. And then his mother's face on the screen really did move— reflected from behind him, and he gulped in a silent gasp of air as he spun around, and she was there, right there, looking straight into his eyes. She was a touch away from him. She looked just as she had in life, but bathed in a haze of faint blue-white light like a faulty hologram. She smiled, a little sad frown of a smile, but a smile nonetheless, and buried the fingers of her right hand in her thick red hair to yank at it. Still smiling, she held out torn strands as if to drop them into his hands. Ben couldn't make a sound. He cupped his palm to catch the hairs, but nothing fell, and suddenly she was walking slowly away from him. He tried so hard to yell at her to stop, to wait, to talk to him, to come back, that he loved her so much. But she kept on walking, and all he could say was, Love you. Then she turned, tugged at a lock of her hair, and he read her lips, Love you too, Ben. And she was gone. Ben could hear only his hammering pulse now. His scalp felt stretched tight across his skull, and he couldn't move. Ben? Shevu called. Ben, are you okay? Get a grip. 
Did you see anything? You don't look so good. Did you see anything? No. There's nothing here that I can see that was missed the first time. And if there was, it's weeks ago and it's gone. He caught Ben's shoulders with both hands. You look terrible. Come on. Let's sit you down in the transport. Get your bearings again. Ben knew that Shevu thought he was overcome by his memories. Shevu hadn't seen Mom, and Ben had no idea how to tell him that he had. Bereaved people saw their loved ones everywhere they looked when the loss was fresh, and that was probably the explanation. Except she'd looked at him, and her gestures had been so clear, and she'd spoken, even though he couldn't hear the sound. He didn't know much about force ghosts. Nobody did. But that weird bluish haze. If his brain had been playing tricks on him, he'd have seen her as he remembered her, not with stuff he didn't understand added to it all. She came back. She came back to tell me. I'm... fine, he said. He thought desperately. He had to grab this while it was still vivid and every detail was fresh. The hair. Why had she torn out hairs from her head? Why had she appeared to him here? Why here? Why not back on Endor or at home? If she could contact him like that, why didn't she just tell him Jason killed her? Did she even know who killed her? She could have been ambushed. And then why didn't she know now? now that she was one with the Force. But Ben stopped there. He was off chasing the nebulous world of ghosts when he needed evidence in the mundane world to show everyone. Ben, I've got a flask of calf. Nice hot cup will make you feel better. Why here? Because we're doing an investigation. She was telling him hair was significant. Lon, he said, when people fight, they leave all kinds of traces on each other, don't they? Yes, but it's too late to ask for swabs from Jason. And do Jedi actually land punches? No, but— Stang! Shevu was furious. Something had occurred to him, and he was angry with someone, or maybe even himself. Stang, the stealth X! We didn't test the stealth X. In CSF, we'd normally go over that with a fine-tooth comb, as a matter of course. Nobody thought it was Jason at the time. Nobody thought that there might have been anything to look for anyway, because we don't fight like non-force users. And what would we be looking for? Shevu asked. Come on, Ben. What's on your mind? Ben swallowed. Hair. Mom's hair. Could she ever have flown in Jason's stealth X? If we find anything, is there any other way it could have ended up there, apart from being transferred on his clothing? I know she came to see him at GAGHQ, but did they have any contact outside work that would have led to transfer? Not that I know. Then we've got to go for that, Ben. How are we going to get a chance to go over the thing? and he's had weeks to clean the cockpit. We'll think of something. Shevu looked torn between staying and doing more searching while they had the light and heading back home. If we come up empty, fine. But I'm not leaving that stone unturned. Come on. They retrieved the droid and took off toward the hyperspace lane. A hundred times on the journey back, Ben shut his eyes to replay that memory of his mother and saw her lips moving. Love you too, Ben. Two. She'd heard him. She'd heard, seen, sensed, whatever. But she knew he'd said he loved her. He burst into tears and sobbed until his abdominal muscles ached. Sorry he said at last, wiping his face on his sleeve. I'm a bit crazy. Your mother was murdered, Shevu said quietly. 
you're entitled to go as crazy as you like. Ben wondered whether to tell Shavu about the apparition, but thought better of it. Later, maybe. He might not even tell his dad for a while. He didn't know how. But he'd call him and let him know where he was as soon as they dropped back out of hyperspace. He missed Luke, and couldn't imagine why he'd spent so much effort in the past trying to escape his attention. He cherished every second with him now. The dead talk, Ben, Shavu said. They bear witness. Yes, said Ben. They do. Bevin Vasser Farm, outside Keldabe. Dr. Bellwine gave Sintas another shot of tranquilizer and checked her pulse. This time she didn't lash out. I wouldn't usually administer this he said, but she'll injure herself knocking into things if she isn't sedated. Fett saw the open maw of the sarlacc a split second before he plunged into the lightless, hopeless pit of acid. Thanks, Solo. They do say. Stop talking about me as if I'm dead, Sintas snapped. Everything's so loud. Where am I? Why can't I see? She looked dazed now, but it was an improvement on stumbling around the room. She sounded sane enough, too, but sanity was a fragile thing, and Fett knew the odds. It was fifty-fifty that she'd ever be completely normal again. He didn't know where to start explaining, and even Myrta, who usually had all the smart answers, erred on the side of extreme caution. Sintas sat on the bed, hugging her knees, blind gaze wandering unsteadily between voices. How did you tell a woman she'd been frozen down for thirty-odd years, and that while she was busy being unconscious, her daughter had gone after her ex-husband, bent on deadly revenge, and then that daughter had been picked up by the secret police and tortured to death, and that she had a granddaughter, and— Fett had rehearsed it in his mind. Stang! It sounded just as bad now as it had three months ago. Worse, maybe. If she remembered that all on her own, it was going to be bad enough. Medrit, to his credit, did what Bevin would have done had he not been out chasing another potential problem. He saved his Mandalore from embarrassment and handled the diplomacy. Your Sintas Vel, Medrit said quietly. She seemed very sensitive to noise. It was just as well she was blind, though. Had she seen Medrit, a pillar of muscle with a frown that announced his short temper, she wouldn't have felt reassured. You've been encased in carbonite for a while. You know what that is? Of course I do. Okay. You're in Keldabe, on Mandalore. I'm Medrit Vasser. This is my farm, and you can stay here until you're well enough to leave. What's the last thing you can remember? Sintas stared straight ahead, sightless. She kept rubbing her eyes in evident frustration sedated or not. Where's my necklace? Can you remember a necklace, madam? Bellwine asked. I had a necklace. Where is it? Bellwine turned to Fett. Did she? Yes, Fett said. She did. It's very encouraging that she recalls it. Fett looked at Myrta. Their eyes locked, and she reached inside her collar to take off the Heart of Fire, or at least the half of it that wasn't buried with Aelin. He'd given it to Sintas as a marriage gift when they were both too young to know any better. But that wasn't what made his gut tighten now. Sintas was from Kifu. The gem, one of the rarer gold ones, 
shot with inner light in a rainbow of colors, was said to hold part of the soul of the giver and the receiver. Kifar could sense the memories stored in the stones as if it were a data crystal, but with the added layer, the added unasked-for complications, Fett thought, of the emotional elements. Even if she was crazy or blind, that stone might just speak to Sintas and jog her memory far too fast for his liking. He was a man who said only what he had to say, which wasn't usually a great deal. But this was different. Who am I more worried about, Sintas or Myrta? Neither woman had the full picture of the mess their family was. Yet. Bellwine, who didn't impress Fett half as much as the local farm vet who'd treated him, made a valiant attempt to earn his fee. He pulled up a chair beside the bed and spoke to Sintas in his best bedside manner. Do you recall being in Carbonite, my dear? Were you conscious? Sintas jerked her head as she heard the med droid enter. Nothing. I don't remember a thing. And you can keep that droid away from me, too. Myrta dangled the heart of fire from its leather cord wrapped around her forefinger. She gave Fett a meaningful look. Now or never, Babuir, and approached Sintas cautiously. Here's your necklace she said. She wrapped her grandmother's hand around the stone, folding her fingers gently. I kept it safe for you. My name's Myrta Gev. We never met, but I'm a relative of yours. Sintas froze for a moment, almost massaging the heart of fire in her hand, gaze fixed. It's not the way I remember it. Fett detached at that point. He'd learned to do it in the days after his father was killed, a trick of flipping a switch between emotions rubbed raw and complete numbness. He found he could do it with physical pain, too. Anyone could learn to do it if they wanted to escape pain badly enough. We had to break it, he said. You can get another one. Sintas turned her head slowly toward him, and for a moment he expected her to recognize his voice. She certainly looked as if she was pondering something, but she lowered her head and seemed to be focused on the heart of fire. Myrta just sat there on the edge of the bed with her shoulder touching her grandmother's her face set in that grim way she had when she was determined not to let him see how upset she was. "'And do I know you?' Sintas asked. Bellwine leaned close to Fett. "'It might be too much too soon. The case studies I've read say that excessively rapid exposure to their real situation can cause carbonite patients to go into a catatonic state.' Fett got the picture. He grabbed the excuse. A long time ago, Sintas, he said. The name felt alien in his mouth. He didn't dare use his pet name for her, Sin. She'd called him Bo. Those were relics of a brief, happy time. Get some rest. He paused to stare at her for a few more minutes, wondering what had happened to his own life in the intervening years while she'd slept, and then there was the sound of doors opening. Fett stepped out into the passage and shut the door. The kids squealed in a nearby room. Babuir, the lady's awake! She's crazy, and she can't see! Cool. Medrit's voice was barely audible. He made a shushing sound. That's not nice, Brela. She's not well. That's the Mandalore's wife. But he's so old, and she's beautiful. 
Like the irony hadn't occurred to me. Fett strode into the room, once again impervious to any opinions but his father's. That had always been the only constant in his life, the self-esteem and sense of being loved that his father had given him. Everything else was too fragile. Even the sea eel that Fett kept as a pet on Camino. That poor creature hadn't escaped his taint either. He loved it in the way that small boys loved unlikely animals. And when he had to leave Tipica City with his father for the last time, he let it free in the ocean. It was eaten by a predatory fish before his eyes, in seconds, before it had even tasted freedom. Everything he'd ever loved got taken from him somehow, or was subject to some unknown curse that said Fett was better off alone. For everyone's sake. Kids, Medrit said. Fett studied his gloves. They say I was one once. Goron just calmed to say he's down at the Oyubot. And you're not going to believe what showed up in the X-Wing. What? A Jedi. He thinks it's Jaina Solo. He remembers the hollow images that Sal Solo was flashing around when he put the contract out on the Solos. Well, well. She wants to see you. Did she bring her credit account? Fett was almost grateful for the interruption. This was work. He could handle that a lot better than what was going on in that room. I said I'd sell the Besu leak to her scumbag brother in person, or not at all. But let's see what she's offering. So how's it going with Sintos? Myrta gave her the heart of fire. That's keeping her occupied. Bellwine's a waste of credits, by the way. Not too many doctors see carbonite cases these days. I meant that he hasn't asked what happened about your terminal illness, especially after being summoned to Camino about it. He can see I'm still breathing. I let Heisha Maycat know that she might be needed then. Fett let the amusement of the tough nerf doctor lift his spirits a little. Let's see what the Jedi wants, and give her ten bonus points for having the gall to come here. Oyubot well, Tapcalf, Keldabe. It was the last place in the galaxy that Jaina had expected to run into another Jedi, and she definitely hadn't expected to meet one who would pull a blaster on her either. But she was staring a blaster in the muzzle right now. You can talk your way out of this. You have to. I'm right, aren't I? said the old man. You're a Jedi. She wasn't imagining it. The old man made a big, disciplined impression in the Force, as if he'd been trained. The other man in the multicolored armor, now that was harder to pin down, but she was sure he was Force-sensitive. It was like hearing an accent that anyone from out of town wouldn't catch. The crowd in the tap calf had suddenly lost interest in the bolo ball, and every single one of them had drawn at least one blaster on her. Some had two. Where's her lightsaber? asked the vine-tattooed man. She's not carrying it. The old Mandalorian didn't even blink. His eyes, pink-rimmed, watery, a faded light color that might once have been green or hazel, were fixed on hers, boring into her, in the way that only another Jedi could. He took half a pace forward, not quite so frail and grandfatherly now. I had a very strong feeling you'd arrived. I'm Jaina Solo, she said at last. 
A Jedi name used to be enough to make doors open back at the core. It closed them here. And I've come to ask Fett to help me. She could have sliced the silence with a vibroblade. She'd expected derisive laughter. Bevine just watched with the mild annoyance he might reserve for a kid. She could feel it. Didn't we save your papa's shebs at Kalula Station? asked the tattooed man. Ask him if he remembers the funny folks in armor who were killing the Vongis for him. It might jog his memory. And tell him Carid sends his best. I apologize for sneaking in, Jaina said. She was now totally reliant on powers she hadn't used or trained, ones she'd seen her mother use so often with not a force trick in sight. Diplomacy and persuasion. It was much harder than it looked. But how far would I have got past your ATC if I'd announced who and what I was? I really need Fett's help. Give her some credit for coming here unarmed, at least. The man in the motley armor took off his helmet, a blood-red and gray thing that didn't match another plate on him. He was in his fifties, with very dark eyes and gray-streaked black hair. I'm Venku, also known as Kataka. He looked at the old man with a distracted fondness. My respected Oribuir here is Gotab. Well, so we all know what we are. We're Mandalorians, Jedi Solo, said Venku. What did you think we were? It struck Jaina that maybe the rest of Keldabe didn't know these men were Force-sensitive. Given the enmity between Jedi and Mandalorians, maybe they were undercover, or stranded here, or... or... no. She couldn't come up with a plausible explanation. She couldn't imagine any Jedi being out of the loop for so long that she didn't know of them. But there was always the possibility that they weren't Jedi, and just Force sensitives. But the old man radiated trained powers, and a sense of... of healing, of reconciliation, of all kinds of soothing things that didn't go with the blaster or his hostile expression. He wasn't a random genetic event. You're not here to ask too many questions. You're here to learn from Fett. If Jaina kept testing that force presence, however carefully, these men might feel threatened. If they were living here as Mandalorians, nobody here was treating them as if they were strangers, she noted. Chances were that they wanted to keep a low profile. Oh, no. Tell me they're not Sith. Mandalorians always fought for the Sith in the past, didn't they? Fett was Vader's hired help, too. We can't escape each other. But she was sure she'd have felt dark energy around them had they been Sith. She'd had way too much practice at feeling Sith and dark Jedi in the Force these past months to make that mistake. I might need their help as Force users. Don't push it. Doesn't matter, Jaina said at last. My mother came here during the Empire's occupation. She met your leader at the time. In fact, she... We're doing a lot better than we were in your mother's day. No thanks to the New Republic. Or the G.A. Have you come to negotiate some arms deal? Ouch. They hadn't forgotten the Yuzhan Vong War then. Had anybody? In a way, I suppose I have. Fett's on his way, said Bevin, and most deals are negotiable. Gotob, apparently satisfied that there were enough blasters trained on Jaina to allow him to rest, slid his weapon back in his belt and replaced his helmet. We'll be going, Venku said. Bevin, if you need anything... Call. Bevin's expression said that he was freshly puzzled. 
How come you spotted her before me? I had Sal Solo's ID images. Maybe you weren't the only one here who was offered the contract on the Solos. Jaina reminded herself that she didn't just have a troublesome brother. She'd had a pretty toxic uncle, too, and Fett had helped dispose of him. And Venku obviously didn't want to reveal that he was Force-sensitive. Lovely, she said, letting her Leia state of mind slip for a moment as she watched the two Force-sensitives leave. I'll take it as a good sign that none of you came after us. Only Fett's daughter, Bevin said quietly. And for her, Han Solo was just bait for her father. Jaina made an effort to imagine her grief over Aunt Mara transferred to Fett, and what state of mind he might be in now. But where was he? How come the Mandalore, the ruler, didn't have some official residence where she had to seek audience with him? They were meeting in a shabby cantina. She leaned her back against the bar and thought better of trying to make small talk with Bevin, who was managing both to keep her in his field of vision and yet not to meet her eye. Eventually, patrons holstered their blasters and went back to their ale, muttering about missing the end of the bolo ball match thanks to a Shabla Jedi. In basic, so that I know I've ticked them off. Good start. Then the doors opened, and a man in dull green armor and a tattered cloak stood in the entrance. Her impression in the force was one of a lonely man resigned to being that way. Was this Fett? His armor fitted the description, but she'd seen plenty of green armor plates in the last hour or so, every shade from pale waranut to the deepest forest. A few of the cantina crowd glanced at the man for a moment, as if they were just checking who had come in, but they went back to the holonet screen in what looked like the post-match dissection in their own language. It probably wasn't Fett then. She'd expected him to be huge, monstrous, iconic, but this man was of average build, and apart from his very confident walk, not a swagger, just a sense that he answered to nobody, there was nothing she'd have stopped to check out twice. He came to a halt a meter in front of her and hooked one thumb in his belt, his other hand steadying an EE-3 blaster that hung from a shoulder sling. Then she spotted the Wookiee scalps. Oh, it was him. You wanted to see me, Jedi? Fett? There have been imposters, but I think I got them all. Let me know if I missed any. I'm Jaina Solo. We know. He tilted his head a fraction. You look like your mother. Jaina, used to the protocol and twittering fawning entourages of world leaders on a dozen planets, wasn't ready for a warlord who walked around unescorted and whose people could ignore him in favor of a bolo ball game if they felt like it. Either Fett had the casual confidence that stemmed from huge power, or he was of no importance to them. She'd have bet all her credits on the former. Fett just stood there, waiting. Dad was right. Not being able to see his eyes behind that visor was unsettling. You saved my father a couple of times, Jaina said. I ought to thank you. I handed him over to Jabba, too. But I did time in the Sarlacc, thanks to him. So we're even. What do you want from me? Jaina felt the ice thinning under her. She swore she heard it crack. She had to play this carefully. It's my brother, Jason. The cowardly barve who killed my daughter... I'm afraid so. I'm sorry. Fett's voice was all passionless gravel, 
with not a spare syllable that didn't have to be there. So he wants to buy some Mondo technology. No, said Jaina. I want you to teach me how to capture him and stop him destroying the galaxy. She paused. Please. Fett didn't reply. He wasn't exactly a chatty man, but there was keeping one's counsel, and then there was stunned silence. And Jaina knew which she was listening to now. In the force, Fett felt like a sudden torrent of icy water. She had his attention then. Now she needed his agreement. Chapter 6 Hati Shorare Jate Shia Urisol Aruike Nuhatish. Better one big enemy that you can see than many small ones that you can't. Mandalorian Proverb Coruscant, Lan Shevu's apartment. Can you trust Captain Geardin? Ben asked. As much as a hut, Shevu said, sitting with his elbows braced on his knees, head resting on his hands. He stared at the holochart propped against the chair as if he were trying to levitate it. He all, bless him, is a career man, and trust has a very different meaning for our colleagues who were recruited from the intelligence services. Let's say it's flexible. The rift between the former spooks in the Galactic Alliance Guard and people recruited from the police had started opening early, just after 967 Commando was formed. Spies accepted that losing prisoners as in killing them, was part of the job. CSF-trained personnel didn't. After that, they'd never quite seen eye to eye again. Try again, Ben said. They had to get access to Jason's stealth X. Ben would have difficulty infiltrating the GAG hangars. Not impossible, but not a stroll either. And even Shevu, with all his valid pass cards, would draw attention if he so much as popped the canopy. They needed an hour in a cramped, conspicuous space to do painstaking work. It wasn't like slipping in and attaching an explosive device and sliding out again. In a saner world, they could have applied for a search warrant. Ben knew that would rapidly become a death warrant for Shevu if he tried to do it by the book. But Shevu could be as flexible as Girdin in his own way. Maintenance, Shevu said. Somehow we need an excuse to call it in for servicing. Don't stealth exes have a thousand-hour maintenance interval? Unfortunately, and I don't think Incom will oblige us with a recall. Who can we trust on the ground crew? Shevu sat upright. It's not a matter of trust. The fewer who know, the shorter the chain. The less we risk being discovered. Ben had another brief urge to abandon the idea and just go with his gut rather than put Shevu at risk. If only Mom had said one word. Jason. It wouldn't have been perfect proof in a court, but Ben would have had closure. And maybe the end would be the same anyway and Jason on trial was a pipe dream. I better call Dad, Ben said. Don't worry, we'll think of something. Ben suspected that his father would have a good idea of what he was doing, even if he didn't know where he was doing it. He'd break it like he'd planned, gently, audio only. Hi, Dad. How are you doing? Luke sounded as if he was making an effort to switch into an upbeat voice. I'm okay. Where are you? I can't trace the link. Coruscant. I thought as much. Would it really help to hear me say the same things again, Dad? I'm sorry I never told you. I could take it, actually. But thanks for trying to protect me. Dad, I'm... I'm pretty sure Jason was implicated. 
if Ben used the detached oblique language of investigation, Luke would know he was in full control of his emotions, and not about to do anything dumb. But he didn't say, Mom's murder. He found himself stopping short of that. I have to prove or disprove that for my own peace of mind. He's worse than you imagine, Dad. He just killed one of his own crew. He broke her neck. There was a faintly crackling pause, and then Luke said, I know. Admiral Neofel told me. Neofel? Chevu looked up at the mention of her name. She's moved from being helpful to us to taking the risk of contacting me direct. Then, I've told her to trust Chevu. Where do you think I am? There you go. You trust him too. How far do you think she'll stick her neck out? Pretty far. As far as Cal Omis and Dur Gedjan did when they met in secret to discuss removing Jason? And look what I did then. If I hadn't assassinated Gedjan, would we be here now? Is this all my fault for just obeying Jason? You might hear that I've asked a favor of her then, Dad. Sooner or later... Ben struggled again with the thought that was uppermost in his mind, more important even than nailing Jason, that he had seen his mother's force ghost. The first thing he'd wanted to do was tell Luke the news, and then he wondered how his dad would feel when he knew that his wife hadn't appeared to him. Ben now knew exactly how desperate you could be to grab one more minute, one more second, even, with someone you'd lost. It was the greatest hunger he'd ever experienced, all-consuming and blind. But he'd got that wish. And Dad hadn't. Would he feel robbed? Would he torment himself, wondering why Mom had chosen Ben? Did I even see what I thought I did? Ben was sure he had and there would be a better time to tell Dad. Maybe he had seen her too, but wasn't saying so yet, for exactly the same reason. Just tell me if I'm likely to run into you while you're doing it, Luke said, jerking Ben's attention back to the here and now. And you might hear crazy rumors about Jaina too. They'll be true. How crazy? She's gone to ask Fett to train her to take on Jason. Ben didn't find that crazy at all. We all have to think outside the box these days, Dad. He could have sworn his father started to laugh for the first time in months. You know, I must have blinked and missed you growing up. And overtaking me. Ben almost relented and risked telling him about Mom, but the moment was lost. It would come again. Take care, Dad. Chevu fidgeted, waiting for Ben to end the link. What about Neofel? What did he say? She went to see Dad. She's come out against Jason, at least privately. That could be a break. Specifically? She can authorize things. All I have to do is ask her. That's dangerous. So is breaking into the GAG hangars and getting caught swabbing the seat of the Chief of State's personal stealth X. We could drop this right now. No. Because now I have to know too. And this is a reported crime, right? Forget that murder I mentioned, officer. It doesn't work like that. I could get you killed. I could get you killed. Chevu pulled the holochart onto his lap, balancing it on his knees. Even if Jason's away on one of his jaunts minus the stealth, then someone will have to have a pretty good reason for scrambling all over it, or he'll be on full paranoid alert. I'll find a reason and get Neofel to make it happen. 
and I'll make sure I'm always wired with a holo recorder when I have contact with dear Jason, even if it's only audio. You can never be too careful. Shevu was casting around for any evidence he could grab. Every loose thread Ben followed, every connection he made, seemed as fragile and flimsy as a hair. It was all if, if, if. They might risk their lives getting into the stealth X and find nothing. Ben saw Mara Skywalker again, tugging strands from her scalp and dropping them into his palm that would have waited forever to catch them. Perhaps they were still falling somewhere. He hoped that whatever unknown forces determined the existence of ghosts would allow her to appear to Luke when his father most needed her. Mom would know the right time, if she could choose. Joint Chief of State Neothel's Suite Neothel consulted the fleet status repeater display on her office wall, known as the tote board within the service, and noted that the Anakin Solo had returned from Fondor. He's always been a day-tripper, she said to her droid administrator, recalling Jason's unexplained absences in previous months. If I didn't know he was wasting munitions on pointless exercises, I'd say he had a secret lover. There was minor enemy contact off Fondor. How off? In Fondorian space. I hate it when he throws stones and goads them. I'll assume he's testing their resolve before the big push. I believe he was training his new assistant. Is that girl even enlisted? I won't have civilians playing battleships. Not in my navy. At least the Skywalker boy had a proper commission. She remains a civilian, Admiral. We'll see about that. She tapped a note to Jason and submitted it to the system. He'd see it come up on his data pad next time he deigned to check it. There have to be some limits to this unstructured style of leadership. Putting on a display of niggling annoyance was superfluous with a droid, but Neothel had to remain in character so that she never slipped. If she looked as if she'd gone off the boil, Jason would turn his attention to her. She knew enough about him to realize her mood was transparent to his force senses, and so she kept it set at a steady temperature of irritated contempt and disdain. It really didn't take much effort. It came naturally. Neothel could still manage to keep tabs on most of Jason's movements by logging his ship's movements or the times his stealth axe was missing from the hangar. An incomplete method, but more than she expected to be able to do at this stage of his megalomania. And whether he liked it or not, procedure said there had to be someone contactable to make decisions as need arose, and that meant that he either had to hand over the reins to her completely or tell her where he was going if he wanted to be consulted. The Anakin Solo wasn't hard to track anyway. Even Jason couldn't make a Star Destroyer disappear, and he didn't seem to be able to secure the ship against intruders, so either he was less omnipotent than most supposed, or he used the ship like an insect trap. If she pressed him, she had a feeling he would say the latter. Not knowing how powerful he actually was, that troubled her. No military strategist could be comfortable while the enemy's strength and assets remained undefined. Neothel stared in slight defocus at the image of Moan Calamari on her office wall, losing herself for a moment in the unbroken horizon behind Reef Home, her home and wondering when she might find time for shore leave again. I wanted the top job, and I got it. Serves me right. Colonel Solo to see you, Admiral, said the droid, 
using their military titles. Neither needed to be reminded they shared control of the Galactic Alliance. But Neathol needed to hear the word Admiral to be made to remember how she'd first signed up to serve the state. It was too easy to slide into the other role. Jason strode in and perched his behind on the edge of a table facing her desk. He was close to knocking off a pile of flimsy and data pads with his long black cloak, and that casualness annoyed her almost as much as the fact that his business-like black G.A.G. fatigues had given way to this pointlessly dramatic wardrobe. I'm hearing interested noises from some of the moths about joining the G.A., he said. They're thinking thoughts of empire again. Heard personally? she asked. Jason had said he wouldn't negotiate without her explicit involvement. Or does this emanate from their gentlemen's clubs and smoke-filled tap-taps again? Let's say the latter. How? I'm fed up guessing like this is some party entertainment. The military attaché was passing through Munalinst at the same time as a moth who has relatives there. Doing charity work for bank employees, no doubt. If I'd sent him to talk to the moths in Ravelin itself, you'd have accused me of bypassing you. I would. Neathal worried about the moths. The Imperial Remnant had been quiet and content to live within its borders for years. Or so she'd thought. Content was a relative term. What impression have you given them? Jason slid off the edge of the table and activated Neothel's holochart, the one she used when she had staff meetings. He zoomed in on the northeast quadrant, filling the table with translucent planets, stars, and threads of colored light representing the major hyperspace routes. Here's what we've hinted is on the table, he said thrusting his fingertip into a cluster of worlds to the Nazoth side of the core. Borlias and Bilbringi. You're reassuringly transparent. Come on. Bilbringi is always going to be a system that they want back. We've not consolidated our claim on it since the Yuzhan Vong War. All we did was defend it. Let's just say that now we're not going to be defending it. The mineral resources are still there, and, as they say in real estate, it's ripe for sympathetic restoration, as shipyards again. Neothel thought that it was all a little too close to Coruscant for her comfort. And Borlias gives them fast access to all the major hyperspace routes. Resources, infrastructure, with a little bit of work, of course, and mobility. What more could a red-blooded moth want? Blue-blooded. They're such snobs. I'm just concerned that they're all dressed up with nowhere to conquer. And we're giving them delusions of glory again. They're still not big enough to worry us. The deal is that if they commit their considerable military machine to the war effort, then their reward will be a major expansion of their territory. Jason tilted his head this way and that to consider the three-dimensional view of the galaxy's flattened disk. So I suggest we ask them to help us take Fondor. Jason, you just can't leave Fondor alone, can you? It was clear that, politically, Fondor irked him. It wouldn't toe the line. It was Corellia all over again. And whether he admitted the irony or not, Jason's own Corellian blood made him a man who didn't like the word no. Strategically, though, he had a point. Fondor fed ships and weapons into the Confederate war effort at a prodigious rate, 
so shutting down the orbital yards made sense. Taking the planet and appropriating its industrial capacity, though, that would take more resources, and an army of occupation to keep the workforce running the yards and not sabotaging them. Neothel had her doubts about that, and for several reasons. You realize, she said, that the remnant might think Fondor is up for grabs, too, seeing as Borlias and Bill Bringy would extend their range to within striking distance of that side of the core. They might well think that. Don't play games with them, Jason. They'd be awfully close neighbors to Coruscant. And with enough corridor to defend between Bastion and Borlias, to keep them too busy to start getting ideas about us and Pelion. Never forget Pelion. He knows how to keep the moths in line, so when we have his blessing, we can move. If, said Neothel, if we get his blessing, he hates your guts. So do you, Admiral, Jason smiled. But we still work well together. It's an efficient strategy. Two beings with no love lost between them, maneuvering. This was the problem with Jason. If he had been demonstrably, consistently, visibly incompetent or insane, it would have been easy to dismiss him and much easier to consider removing him the hard way. On sleepless nights, Neothel even found herself wondering how she could assassinate a Force user with prodigious powers and awareness of approaching danger. She always chose bombarding them from orbit with a planet killer. Hypothetically, at least. Usually she thought about mutiny, and whether she might be on the receiving end of it if she didn't make up her mind. She had never had those thoughts in her life before. But then Jason would confuse her and negate all those justified fantasies by being strategic, sensible, and successful. She needed him to do something barking mad to steer her one way or the other, and the murder of Lieutenant Tebut was pretty close to the final get-rid-of-Jason token she needed to collect to salve her conscience. As if I could take him down alone. I agree that we should take Fondor out of the game sooner rather than later. Is that a yes to formally approaching the Imperial Remnant? It'll make us look as if we can't handle the job on our own, but... Yes, we're at overstretch. I can't complain having nagged you about that so often. Excellent, Jason said. He seemed as pleased as a child, being told he could hold a party and invite friends. I'll send Tahiri Vela to see Pelion. Haven't we got a more seasoned officer free to do the job? She can be very persuasive. Much tougher than she looks, too. Very well. But next time you want her to play with cannons, make sure she's a member of the Defense Force. Give her a commission. Enlist her, if you don't think she's officer material. But make sure she understands wars are not for civilians. Jason's guard seemed as down as it would ever be. They'd argued after a fashion, admitted they disliked each other, and yet reached an agreement. All mistrust seemed to have been aired. Neothel slid in her knife. What kind of Jedi are you, Jason? She asked. Because my meetings with the Jedi Council were never quite so target-oriented and ruthless. I don't do things their way. It's true. Are you a Sith? Jason's loss of composure was always betrayed by his eyes. He could control the rest of his face and his body language, 
me awful new human psychology almost as well as Moan Cal's now. But there was always something in his eyes when he was caught out. She couldn't even pin it down beyond a slight flicker. But whatever it was, she saw it now. What do you know about Sith? He asked, all quiet reason. Oh, not much. I know Palpatine was a Sith, and he was a brilliant tactician. No quarter given, all exits sealed. The kind of total war that I could never see Master Skywalker waging in an eternity. Which is why I ask, because your ability to see the whole picture reminds me of that. The first sentence was true. The second was a lie, of course. Yes, Jason said quietly. I'm a Sith. We should teach Sith tactics at the Academy, then, said Neothel, knowing that she would probably rather have the Yuzhan Vong back instead. Jason gave her that patronizing smile that said he didn't think she understood what was happening and pitied her for being so inadequate. That was fine. She was pleased with her progress, and hoped he detected that and misinterpreted it as basking in his temporary approval. I'll brief Tahiri, he said, and left. Neafel suspected that Tahiri was already on her way, but it didn't matter. She sat looking at the holochart and wondering how an imperial moff might see it, what temptations it might suggest. Had Pelion not still been running Bastion, the Remnant might have already been in the war, or at least circling the battlefield, looking to take advantage of the chaos. But he was in his nineties, and wouldn't live forever, so perhaps managing their ambitions now would prevent them boiling out of the Braxent sector in a few years' time like kids let out of school bent on mischief. I hate it when you might be right, Jason. Admiral, said the droid, Captain Shevu asks if you can spare him five minutes. Yes, show him in. Neafel shut down the holochart and had the feeling she might need to erase a little of the droid's memory. If anyone calls, tell them I'm in a procurement planning meeting. Shevu wasn't the kind of officer who popped in for a chat. Neothel had almost expected him since Luke Skywalker had identified him to her as a potential ally, and he hadn't wasted any time. Considering he was the most senior officer in Jason's personal elite, 967 Commando of the Galactic Alliance Guard, he was taking a huge risk, and Jason couldn't have made a worse-placed enemy. She gestured to him to take a seat, and wondered who would say it first. It's all right, she said. I sweep the office for surveillance devices every time I enter it. Shevu slid a small scanner out of his pocket, and aimed it at various points around her office, before looking a little more relaxed. So do I. So we understand each other. I think so. What can I do for you? I need to carry out forensics tests on your colleague's stealth X. He didn't say Jason. This was a man used to giving others very little to use against him. Is there any way I can get access to it, uninterrupted, for a few hours? He's gone to brief his new minion for a mission to Bastion. Neothel ran through all the routine procedures a stealth X would undergo, and why. Jason's was one of the few that the Jedi pilots hadn't taken when they withdrew. How urgent is this? We should have done it three months ago, Shevu said. He mouthed Mara at her. Might turn up nothing, of course. So it wasn't just Ben who thought Jason had been involved in Mara's death then. Even though Luke had told Neafel, the idea seemed far more shocking coming from an objective outsider, a professional investigator 
like Shevu. If you do it, Neothel said, won't he sense that you've been in the vessel? That's why I'm getting a droid to do it. A GAG unit? No, a CSF one. Leave me to worry about scamming the identichips. Very well, Captain. I'll arrange for the ground crew droids and personnel to be told it needs a special examination. Checking for canopy seal integrity. Fuel leaks into the cockpit. Whatever I can think of. In fact, let's do all the space-capable vessels the GAG has, too, to make it look convincing. You don't have that many. Thank you, Admiral. And we'd better come up with a good cover story, in case anyone compliments the Guard on their extra attention to safety standards, and it reaches His Celestial Highness's ears. A few months ago, Shevu said, I'd have expected him to know all about it right away. He was hands-on with his troops. But he's taken his eye off the little people now, and just focuses on the big players. We'll use that. You know how dangerous it is to go after him, don't you? Neothel said, slightly ashamed that she wasn't leading this quiet revolution against Jason. Not half as dangerous as it'll be if I don't said Shavu. Oyubat Tapcalf, Keldabe. What can I possibly teach you, Jedi? Fett asked. At any other time, Jaina Solo's plea would have been amusing. No, satisfying. There was no humor to be had from this. A voice inside Fett still said that he should personally make that barve Jason pay for what he had done to Aelin. But he'd made up his mind, when he saw his daughter's body, that his revenge would need to be more substantial, more complete, the kind he should have planned when his father was killed in front of him. Jedi had robbed him of what little family he had and now they expected him to help them clean up their own mess. You've killed and captured more Jedi than anyone, Jaina said, looking like the words were choking her. Oh, I don't know. Some of my brothers racked up a pretty good score back in the day. She didn't react. Jason and I are matched in terms of force strengths, but he's picked up training in force techniques I don't even understand. So my best chance of taking him is to use skills he doesn't have. And I'm pretty sure you never gave him the top ten Mandalorian tips on Jedi busting. Only if he paid me, said Fett. But what do you care about Aelin? It's not only your daughter he's killed. Jaina was doing a good job of looking desperate, losing that steady gaze for just a moment. She was desperate. Fett could taste it. He might even have been involved in Mara Skywalker's death. Ah, so that's when you decide he needs stopping. He was totally unsurprised by the idea, just taken aback that Jaina had come here. Families feuded. No shock there. When it's Jedi getting killed. Bevin hauled himself onto a bar stool and put his helmet to one side while he thumbed through his data pad. He kills his underlings too, Mandalore. He held out the pad so that Fett could see the message from one of his long list of informants. Coruscant wasn't half as far from Mandalore as it thought it was. Look, Ma, no hands. He's learning to break necks with the Force. Some lieutenant called Tebut, and it's the talk of the fleet. Well, the people I know in the fleet, anyway. He's so adorable. Just like old times, Fett said. Except I almost liked Vader. Jaina's face fell slightly as if she hadn't known about Jason's latest victim. She didn't accuse him of lying to wind her up, either, because they both knew what Jason had become. 
It was funny how victims mattered more when they had names. Fett resisted the urge to remind her that beings in all the places that Jason had attacked had names, too. You sent the crush gaunts, said Jaina. So we took that as a big hint. Try ten tons of high-spec thermal detonator. We want him alive. Alive's always more complicated. Only do alive if they pay extra Jedi. Fett laid his blaster on the counter and removed his helmet two-handed. He was more comfortable revealing his face now. Up to a few months earlier, he wouldn't even have let his own men see him without the helmet, except Bevin. But he'd seen the look on Han Solo's face when the man had looked into his eyes close up for the first time. He could read Solo's reaction, that the cold, implacable, toughened Durasteel helmet didn't conceal a heart of gold, just more Durasteel, more cold, and less heart. If they wanted to see a happy and well-adjusted Mandalorian under the armor, then they could go admire Bevin. Fett watched Jaina's eyes take him in. If I don't do it, she said, I don't think anyone else can. Bevin was used to playing a double act with Fett at times like this. Nice Mondo, nasty Mondo. He slipped into the role without even needing a cue, while Fett just stared into Jaina's face, testing her nerve. You've got a lightsaber, lady. And Jason Solo doesn't have Beskar Gam, Bevin said. What can we possibly teach you? Ambush? Blaster Masterclass? He drew his ancient Beskod, the traditional Mandalorian iron saber, halfway out of its hilt. My handy Vong-splitting technique? Jaina's eyes never left Fett's. Beskar is your special iron, yes? The metal the crush gaunts were made from. Available at all good arms dealerships now, Bevin said cheerfully. We've got a lovely new supply. Is this all you really want? Just a few tips on whacking the bathrobe brigade? Fett, Jaina said, undistracted. You can teach me to bring down Jedi. You've done it often enough. Fett counted two beats. And end the war? Just when our economy's getting back on its feet? You'd sacrifice whole worlds for your own ends? You sacrificed Mandalore to the Vong for your own ends. I'm sorry we didn't give you the reconstruction aid we should have, Fett. I'm not proud of that. But can't you see what Jason's going to do if he carries on? I need to stop him before he consolidates his power. She wouldn't back down. He gave her that much. If Sintas hadn't been back from the dead, with all the unfolding misery that went with it, Fett might have found training Jaina Solo as near to enjoyable, as near to sweet revenge, as he'd come in decades. Do it. Jason Solo needs removing, because there'll still be plenty of business in his wake. And there's no irony finer than the Jedi elite fighting their own. Twin-on-twin -twin combat, just like the Vong boys always wanted. Shame most of them are too dead to enjoy it. But if he really listened to the unquiet voice in his mind and didn't slap it into silence, he heard what it was whispering. That the more the war spread, the more likely it was that Shalk and Brela might see their father killed in action. No kid deserved to go through what Fett had. Mondoade fight. Always have. What's wrong with you? What was wrong was that they were Bevin's grandchildren, 
and Bevin and Medrit had adopted the kid's mother, Dinua, when her own mother was killed fighting the Vongese with Fett. They'd all had enough of bereavement. Fett's whole life was tangled in orphans and unlived lives and moral debts. He looked Jaina up and down. She was small, and her smooth hands said that she'd never had to build an entrenchment with them. But she was a Jedi. He could treble her weight and reach based on that alone. And she was going after her brother whether Fett trained her or not. He could see it in her eyes. A little fear, maybe not of him, and shame that she'd even had to ask the favor. It clearly stuck in her throat to beg her father's old enemy for anything. But she was going to tough it out to get a necessary job done. Fett respected that. It was the first lesson any bounty hunter needed to learn, to forget the emotional baggage and focus solely on an objective. If I'd been around for Aelin, I'd have trained her to fight, to look out for herself, maybe to hunt Jedi, too. Every Mondo trains their kids, even other folks' kids. They say you're not a man unless you do. Shisa's dying voice was back in his head a lot lately, after being silent for so long. If you only look after your own hide, then you're not a man. It joined the chorus that nagged him most days, all advising him on what he ought to do. All his dead were coming back to haunt him in one form or another. Okay, I'll do it, said Fett, and it's going to cost. I wasn't asking for charity. Jaina raised a withering eyebrow. She was Leia's girl, all right but her shoulders relaxed a fraction. She took a very large denomination credit chip from her flight suit's breast pocket and held it between neatly manicured fingertips. Not even vengeance gets in the way of business, does it, Fett? That's your first lesson, Jedi. I'll bill you for it later. Fett didn't need the credits, but he had his self-respect to consider, and she needed to hang on to hers. It was going to get pretty battered. But let's avoid the tax bill. What else can you do to earn your keep? I'm a fighter pilot, but I'm pretty handy with mechanical stuff, too. We're all pilots here, Fett said. But we can always use mechanics. Lots of exiles coming back, infrastructure creaking under the load. You'll be useful. Fett put on his helmet and turned to go. Jaina called after him. When do we start? We already have. I'll be back tomorrow. Take a room here and get a good night's sleep. She didn't look like she had anywhere else to go, and Fett wouldn't ask Bevin to find room for yet another stray. Baltan Kerid, whose vine tattoo seemed to have sprouted a couple of extra leaves, called to the barkeep, Better kick the strill out of the executive suite, Chamika. You've got royalty. Fett paused outside the Oyubat to take stock, then paced across the square to the sheer drop that stared down into the Kalita River. Bevin kept his counsel and waited with him both of them leaning on the balustrade, watching the current as it tossed small, freshly broken branches onto the rocks. There was a lot of construction going on upstream. Jedi can be healers, Bevin said. Now that's something none of us can do. Fett braced his hands on the top rail. I don't want her fixing Sintas. Let's keep the problems from interbreeding. Just a thought. Thanks anyway. But if you need the Jedi kept in line, 
There's always room at the farm. Bevin would make a far better Mandalore than Fett ever had. He was more in Shisa's mold, as ready to boost morale and build alliances as he was to put his best god through the nearest enemy. And everyone liked him. All Fett had was his record on the battlefield and his dynastic name. He was an image that Mondoade liked to present to the world, not someone they actually needed, more a living talisman than a leader. Every Mandalore had his own style. In the end, it didn't seem to change the essence of Mandalore one bit. I told Myrta I killed Shisa, Fett said. Bevin sighed. Might as well have all your Osik hit the fan at the same time and get it over with, Bobica. I didn't explain. Just told her. You ever going to tell me? Okay. I put Shisa out of his misery. We were surrounded. He was too badly hurt to escape, and I couldn't leave him to the Sevets. Tough decision. But we guessed that. He asked me to do it. So you got the top job. Nobody ever argued about it anyway. You can't blow a man's brains out without taking his last wish seriously. He made me give my word. It was non-negotiable. Django Fett had taught his son from the cradle that his word was everything. He made me swear I'd be his successor. He always wanted me to be Mandalore. If I didn't know better, I'd have said he arranged it. No witnesses. You think I wanted this job? Says a lot about you. I said I never wanted to be Mandalore. Bevin sounded a little testy. I meant, Bobica, that you could have sworn anything to Shisa, and nobody would ever have known if you broke your word or not. Fett gripped the edge of the stone balustrade. I'd know. Bevin just nodded. You'd never abandon anything without a good reason. No. For once, Bevin was wrong. And if Sintas got her mind back, she'd tell him so. Chapter 7 no Mandalorian soldier should have to fight an Aruetes war for the price of a day's food. No Mondoad should have to fight at all, except to defend Mandayayim, his home, or his family, or because he wants to. We have to stop being the tool of governments that don't care if we live or die, so long as we do their bidding. Kadika also known as Venku, addressing an informal gathering of clan leaders. Bevin Vasser Farm, near Kaldabe. Fett waited outside the door for a few moments. He could hear the droid whirring as it moved around the bedroom, and Dr. Bellwine's murmuring voice. As soon as the doctor came out, he'd go in and sit with Sintas for a while. After that, he'd start his sessions with Jaina Solo. His day was planned. Grandmama keeps asking where she is. Myrta came up behind him and nudged him in the small of his back. She wasn't quite up to taking his hand or hugging him, and he wouldn't have known how to respond to that kind of intimacy or compassion anyway. We keep telling her, but her short-term memory is shot to Haran. Early days, Fett said. Wondering who we was. She won't let go of the Heart of Fire. Did you call her Grandmama? I thought that would be asking for trouble, Babuir. Fett heard boots in the passage behind him, slow and careful, 
like someone was creeping in and trying not to be noticed. Even without his helmet's 360-degree vision, he knew who it was. Morning, Orade. Sukui, Mandalore. Guess Orade. Myrta's new love stopped in his tracks, clutching some wild vormer blooms. I brought some flowers for Sintas. She's blind. Orade gave him a look that said, heartless barv. She can smell the scent. It was a nice touch, something Fett hadn't thought about. He'd better treat my granddaughter like a princess, too. Fett turned slowly to give the lad the full benefit of his unspoken warning. You marrying Myrta, then? Yes, Mandalore. You're the only Mondoad on this planet who cowers to me. Don't. Orade was a typical tough Mondo lad, but in-laws were a lot scarier than Yuzhan Vong. One minute I'm an orphan. The next I've got family coming out of the woodwork like squalls. Okay, said Orade, spine stiffening. I'm marrying Myrta, and if anyone has to take care of her grandmother long term, it'll be us. My grandson-in-law, Fearfeck, Fett assessed him, and thought he'd do. A Mandalorian wedding consisted of four short vows and was usually a private ceremony for the couple, not their families. Fett, still thinking in Aruati terms, wondered whether to feel offended that he hadn't been invited, and then realized nobody else would attend either, although there'd be communal drinking and sentimentality afterward. Not a credit would be wasted on fripperies. Mondo Ade operated on plain, honest pledges and contracts, in love as well as business. No urge to revert to Kifar culture, then? He asked Myrta. I've made my choice, she said. The door swung open and Bellwine came out, looking anxious. Fett took him to one side, while Myrta and Orade slipped into the room. Is she going to get better? Fett demanded. The fact that she's alert and mobile is remarkable enough. Bellwine lowered his voice so that Fett had to strain to hear him but he seemed indignant that his treatment hadn't been appreciated. Most cases were in some degree of coma for months. Her Kifar brain chemistry may have offered her some protection from the worst of the carbonite trauma. Kifar were different. Fett knew that. The ability to detect past events from inanimate objects was proof of that. Just like Gotab had done when he'd told Fett far too much about his history with Sintas simply from holding that heart of fire stone. He had to be a Kifar, too. So she might improve. She might. Carboniting affects neural connections in the brain. That's why your wife can't see, and why her memory is affected. Given time, neurons do regenerate. Stimulation helps— little mental exercises to stimulate her memory, objects she might remember, like the necklace, hollow images, that kind of thing. Ex-wife, doctor. Ex-wife. But the weight of responsibility felt the same. Fett had never been very good at thinking for two, unless the other was his father. You're saying she's brain-damaged. Technically, yes. But therapy... You said I had a year to live. I'm fine now. Bellwine squirmed visibly. You found your Caminoan scientist, then? I found what I needed. Fett hadn't had a checkup since the veterinary lab had cleared his blood samples. Physically, he felt fine. He suspected fate had spared him a premature death, so he could hang around and have his past catch up with him. I'm not proud of anything I've done. 
I'm not ashamed of anything either. I did what I had to do. I'll find Sintas what she needs. If I need you, I'll call you. Belwine was always good at knowing when he'd been dismissed. Myrta stuck her head out of the doorway, face set in a frown. Whatever Medrit says, Belwine did a good job, she said. You're so ungrateful. Grandmama could easily have died. Fett recalled his first lessons in combat, learned at his father's side. Commit fully to the attack. Don't let up. Don't stop to think. It was good advice for facing your past, too. He walked in and sat down at the bedside. Sintas was sitting cross-legged on the mattress, turning the heart of fire over in her hands as if she was searching. Who are you? she asked, turning her face to him. Don't stop to think. I knew you when we were younger. What's your name? Don't stop to think. Don't... Boba. Boba Fett. He expected the world to come crashing down at that moment. But Sintas just looked blank, as if she was trying to remember something minor, not the man who'd put a huge dent in her life. I'm Sintas Vell, and you're Boba Fett, and she's... She's... Myrta took up position on the opposite side of the bed. I'm Myrta Gev, she repeated patiently. Yeah, Myrta. Are you my little girl? I have a daughter. Fett switched off. He hadn't planned to, but it happened automatically. It was like a thermostat switch that tripped whenever things were in danger of overheating. Aelin, he said. How could he know how much she could handle at one time? She forgot it all the next moment anyway. Your daughter's name was Aelin. She was about sixteen last time you saw her. I have to find her. She'll be wondering where I am. Myrta fixed Fett with a stare that said, Don't even think about it. Lots of things have happened while you've been in Carbonite. Myrta took a deep breath. I'm your granddaughter. Sintas didn't react for a while. She kept turning the heart of fire between her fingers, lips moving silently. Fett wondered if she was reading it and trying to tie up its information with what she was hearing. Sin was always sharp, analytical, looking for the angle. He didn't know what always meant, of course. From meeting her to leaving her had been just three or four years tops. She placed the heart of fire around her neck, one hand still clutching the stone. Orade leaned over and held the flowers in front of her. These are Vormer blooms, he said. It's me, Orade. Remember? From yesterday? Sintas inhaled the scent and just smiled. At least she wasn't distressed now. That was something. Myrta got up and took something from the cupboard, something Fett hadn't seen in a very long time. It was a red oblong canister with a handle on the top. Somewhere, not here, not now, his heart sank. But he didn't let it touch him. We found this in Rezodar's effects, Myrta said, opening the lid. A hologram leapt into life with a faint hum, triggered by the mechanism. Myrta looked up slowly fixing Fett with an expression that might have been recrimination, or a cue to tell Sintas what he could see and she couldn't. Fett couldn't tell which. The hologram showed Sintas holding a baby, all smiles, and Fett standing with one arm around her shoulder. 
I could have said it was Spar standing in for me, doing Shisa's bidding as usual, the idiot. But that's me standing there. I remember the day. Fett also remembered killing a lot of scumbags to retrieve that hologram for her, long after they parted. He couldn't, wouldn't, remember how he'd felt when the image was recorded. What is it? Sintas asked, reaching out toward the source of the hum. It's an old hologram, Myrta said gently. It's you and your daughter, I think. My mother and... your husband. Her eyes were fixed on Fett's, back to the cold black stare she had given him when they'd first met. It was as if Aelin's lessons in hating him were all flooding back to her. It'll make sense when you can see again. Sintas half-smiled, looking embarrassed. I have a husband? What happened to him? How long have I been out of it? Come on, tell me! She might have lost her memory, but this was the old Sintas, all right. A no-nonsense bounty hunter who didn't have time for excuses and platitudes. She always wanted to know the score. Fett took a long, slow breath in the same way he did to prep for storming a room. She won't remember tomorrow, Orade mouthed at him. Fett kicked down the door in his mind. Thirty-eight years. Get it over with. He even looked Sintas straight in the eye, although she couldn't see him. And I was your husband. I'm Boba Fett. He counted to three, like timing a debt and getting ready to fling himself flat just before the blast wave reached him. But it never came. Sintas's eyes moved from side to side as if she was searching. Her expression was almost beatific as some realization dawned on her. Who carbonated me? I don't know. Yet. But you found me. Yeah. You found me. We found you. There was no point giving Sintas the wrong idea. He owed her more than that. Myrta did all the work. I don't remember, Sintas said. I don't remember anything. But if you came for me, after all that time, you were still looking. Fett parted his lips to explain that it wasn't quite like that, but Myrta held up a warning finger. She doesn't need to know that right now. He stopped in his tracks. You're going to be fine, he said. I'll come back later. It was a tactical withdrawal. When Fett turned, Bevin was standing in the doorway with his arms folded. He stepped back to let Fett pass, and then followed him down the passage through to the front of the farmhouse where Danua and Jintar were having breakfast with their kids in the kitchen, in a world of their own, and clearly delighted to be together again. Fett caught a snatch of their conversation. Jintar was discussing his plans for a new workshop, so he obviously wasn't planning on more mercenary contracts for a while. Some people managed family life effortlessly, even in the most trying conditions. I could take the Jedi off your hands today, Bevin suggested. Unless you want to be elsewhere. Sooner I kill her idea that I'm some devoted husband, the better, said Fett. Just makes it harder for her when she finally gets the full picture. He reached the front entrance, but Medrit was blocking it. He was big enough to do that. Medrit had been born solid and tall, but years of pounding metal as an armor smith 
had added prodigious muscles to his frame. Wait, Medrit said imperiously. No sparring with Jaitise until you're properly dressed. He crooked a soot-stained finger at Fett and led him to his workshop. Heads will not roll, okay? Laid out on the bench was a set of armor plates, the mid-green paint still unmarked. It was a common color for Mandalorians. It happened to be Fett's color, too. Might as well make the most of the new Beskar deposits. Medrit picked up the breastplate and twirled it between his hands. I said you should ditch that Durasteel armor, didn't I? Here's your proper Beskar gam. Wear it in case the Jedi gets lucky. She'll need to hack away with her JT cod for a week to dent this. Humor him, Bevin said. He made a collar section specially... Fett didn't plan on testing the Beskar gam in earnest. But the collar intrigued him. It was a near circular band that hinged open and protected the neck between the helmet and gorget plate. If his father had worn one, he would probably have survived Mace Windu's decapitating lightsaber blow. Fett slipped it on and rolled his head to test the range of movement in it. You think I'm going to spend my time fighting Jaina Solo, do you? Fett submitted to having some plates swapped out. Plenty more ways to train her to hunt her brother than wearing myself out. If I had my way, you'd be wearing greaves, too. You ask for trouble, Mandalore. It doesn't look like mine. Too new. Okay. You want your dents in it? I'll paint dents on it if you want to look roughy-tuffy. It's best car. It doesn't dent. Myrta's reminder that he was an ungrateful shabuir wormed into his head. It's good, Medrit. Thanks. Bevin helped him attach the rest of the plates. The new helmet, he'd sort that later himself. The Durasteel one would do for today. He swung his arms a few times and accustomed himself to the extra weight before replacing his jetpack and Wookiee braids, and then set off for the hangar that he'd earmarked as a training area. Bevin followed him. You want to watch the show? said Fett. I'm just going to see what skills she's got first. I don't trust Jedi, Bobica. Not that I don't think you can handle her. We all trusted Kubariot during the war. He was a different kind of Jedi. May he find rest in the Manda. Bevin was a traditionalist. He might not have believed literally in the collective oversoul, but he wished fervently for its existence. He patted the pummel of his Beskod. But I'll give the woman the benefit of the doubt. Jaina was waiting for them in the barn, looking very small and dejected as she sat on an upturned pail. She flinched when Fett approached her. He was so used to getting that reaction that he thought nothing of it until he realized the look on her face wasn't alarm, but concern. Something wrong? she asked. Fett felt naked. She could sense anxiety clinging to him. He was sure that he wasn't letting Sintas get to him, but Jaina seemed to smell trouble anyway. Family problems, he said. Yeah, tell me about it. She stood up. Your granddaughter? There was no reason not to tell her. Everyone in Kaldabe knew anyway. The shock might teach her a lesson about not letting anything distract you from the task in hand. My ex-wife, he said. She's just shown up after being carbonated for thirty-eight years. 
and she doesn't know your brother killed her daughter. Yet. If you'd rather be with her now, we've got work to do. His eyes met Jaina's, and he saw a shared pain he wasn't expecting. Both of them had families torn apart by tragedy. Both had harsh duties ahead. For a heartbeat, they looked at each other, and he could have sworn there was some sympathy, some real compassion in her. He didn't like that at all. Jaina drew her lightsaber with slow caution, as if she didn't want to make anyone too jumpy. Want to see what I can do? Fett's mind emptied instantly of all superfluous thought. Combat was cleansing. He'd done this so often that it was almost a form of meditation. He was in his natural element again, freed from the alien world of relationships he'd never learned to handle. But he'd learned to master every weapon the galaxy had to offer, bar one. Me too said Fett, drawing a lightsaber. We can teach each other some new tricks. Bevin Vassar Farm, outside Keldabe. Jaina had thought that she might start her bizarre apprenticeship with a discussion about Jason's prodigious catalog of force powers, but it wasn't to be. I'm no swordsman, Fett said holding the lightsaber like a hammer as he circled her. Its blade was green. She wondered whose hand he'd taken it from and how. And I've never trained anyone. It'll be an education for both of us. It had to be a trick. Jaina matched his movements, keeping a constant distance from him. She was aware of Bevin as a deep blue blur to her right, watching and she didn't feel comfortable. Suspicion emanated from him. But there was a core of, she could only call it, good humor. Maybe he felt this was a joke, but palpable malevolence was missing. She found herself mapping him in her force awareness of the environment anyway. A transponder on a holochart. An enemy vessel not in range, but worthy of cautious monitoring. I want to learn... What Jason hasn't, she said. Fett stopped and stood with his head slightly tilted. He looked as if he might be smiling under the helmet, and she was ready for that. She thought he'd taunt her, mock her, generally wind her up to see how fast she lost her temper and how many mistakes she could be provoked into making. Tell me what he can do, said Fett other than kill unarmed women without touching them. Jaina felt Bevin move slowly out of her peripheral vision. So Fett didn't want to test her fighting technique. He was distracting her. Apart from the Academy basics? Apart from the leaping, mind-influencing, throwing rocks around with his mind. Telekinesis. Jaina took a step back to keep Bevin in physical view. He had a blaster and that short, flat saber, both hanging from his belt. I've known him to move starships, deflect ion cannon, even turbo lasers. He can hear at huge distances with some Theron force listening technique. He can create elaborate force illusions that feel real. He can walk into the past or future. He can control objects like scanners. And he can mind-rub. He even mind-rubbed Ben. Made him forget. Yes. He could get rich on that. Fett didn't sound as if he were mocking. In fact, he felt totally neutral to her. A blank slate in the force. Nothing to read. Why does he need spies and secret police? If he can eavesdrop wherever he wants. I... I don't know. If he can stop turbo lasers single-handed, why does he need a fleet? Jaina looked for the angle. Again, no idea. Why does he need shields on ships when he can create his own? 
She was balanced on the balls of her feet now, ready to leap. It was so instinctive, so ingrained by training, that she couldn't override it. She felt threatened. In the corner of her eye, the thin strip of light that marked the barn doors expanded into a wider ribbon, and someone, several someones, came in. She had an audience. I'm the cabaret. Okay, Fett. I never thought this would be a stroll anyway. Fett lowered the lightsaber and held it with its tip just above the dusty floor, kicking up little clouds of particles as he walked slowly toward her. Anything else? We can't sense him in the Force. Welcome to the mundane world, and he can make himself invisible. Sometimes. Bevin burst out laughing. Hwahi gar orishupla! Jaina almost turned, triggered by the simple instinct to face the source of a sudden sound. But she fought it. Fett was totally relaxed, now a couple of meters from her, lightsaber held loosely in one gloved hand. His armor looked different, cleaner, brighter. Maybe he'd put on his holiday best. What's that mean, Myrta? Fett said. One of the Mandalorians who'd come in was a young woman. Jaina remembered. Uh-huh. His granddaughter. The one Mom and Dad met. The one who tried to kill him. I've come to the right place. Fett understood family rifts. She could feel anxiety in the girl, but it had nothing to do with her. It was more like a bad memory she was trying to forget. Bevin says, Oh dear, you're totally screwed, Jedi. Myrta moved into her field of view behind Fett, a figure in egg yolk yellow plates with her helmet under one arm. She felt sharp and bitter now. Jason's very clever, isn't he? He killed her mother. Oh boy. Jaina felt them all come to a halt. She was tracking multiple targets in her force sense, aware now of Bevin, Fett, Myrta, and three other armored figures that stood waiting. Maybe she'd made a terrible misjudgment. Maybe they were just going to make her pay for the death of Aelin Vell, an eye for an eye, a daughter for a daughter. Fett was now within striking distance, but his weight was on one leg not evenly balanced to ready for a blow, and he exuded calm. He was just tormenting her. He shut down the lightsaber blade and studied the intricately carved hilt. Jaina lowered her lightsaber and then shut it off. You've got problems, Solo, Fett said, hooking his thumb in his belt, weight still on his right leg. Jaina didn't need to be told that. How you going to take him, then? She had no answer yet. Fett shrugged, and then, the next thing she knew, the wind was knocked out of her as he landed a punch in her gut. Her lightsaber was back on and slashing up across Fett's chest in a split second, unplanned. She snapped straight to instant raw instinct. Fett fell back a couple of steps. Jaina bent almost double, gasping for air as her solar plexus screamed in agonized protest at the punch, but she held her lightsaber out in front of her to ward him off. You! Nobody had ever jumped her like that before. She hadn't sensed it coming. She struggled for breath. But nobody was mocking her, and she'd expected contemptuous laughter. What's that lesson over? Fett said, inspecting his chest plate. Jaina's eyes were watering, but she could see a scorch mark across Fett from belly to chin. The green paint burned away in a line that spanned the sections of armor like a careless black brushstroke, exposing a streak of bare gray metal beneath. Hurts, doesn't it? 
Jaina steadied her breathing with a little help from the force to settle the disrupted nerve impulses. Yes, it hurts, you cretin. She fought to keep her dignity in front of the audience. News of her gullibility would be all over Kaldabe in hours. And there's a point to all that, she said, determined not to show just how painful the blow had been. Fett still held the lightsaber hilt in his right hand. He'd used it like a knuckle duster. And seventy-plus or not, he still had a serious punch on him. I hope... There is, he said. He was still looking down at the lightsaber scar across his plates. I'm waiting for you to work it out. Janus straightened up and finally decided it was safe to deactivate her lightsaber. If anyone was going to try their luck with her, they'd have done it by now. So that's Beskar armor, is it? Beskar gam. Bevin said behind her. It means iron skin. We live in our armor. And if the Mandalore hadn't been wearing it, I wouldn't have let him get that close to you. If I hadn't been wearing it, said Fett, I wouldn't have tried. Bevin, helmet under one arm and a pleasant smile on his face, drew his saber one-handed and held it vertically so that Jaina could look at it. If you're willing to spar with me, I'll assess your technique. Modest, aren't we? Jaina said. Does your brother know how you handle a lightsaber? Yes. So maybe I can show you how he might use that technique against you. Humility, girl. Remember humility. Of course. Thank you. The barn was roughly constructed out of timber and duraplast sheeting pierced by shafts of sunlight from dozens of gaps in the boards. All Jaina could see those gaps as now were sniper positions, vulnerabilities, and she'd never felt exposed like that before. She had strong enough force powers to get herself out of trouble, didn't she? She could deflect blaster bolts. She could leap clear. She could force throw. Fat had psyched her out. That was it. It had to be. It was all the family baggage. All the stories she'd grown up with about what he'd done to her father, and how he never stopped, never gave up. How he just kept on coming, and not even the Sarlacc could kill him. But that wasn't going to help her defeat Jason. Now that she could pause to look at her small audience, she found it was a big man in dark gray armor face obscured by a helmet, a young, blonde, bearded man who seemed to be with Myrta, and another older man with magnificent black matted braids strung with gold clips, his ebony skin marked with raised scars. He gave her a knowing wink. If she'd met him in another context, she would have taken an instant liking to him. Don't you get it, Solo? Fett asked. You played on your propaganda, I think. No, I played on your mistakes. You read my body language wrong. You assumed you were safe. It's hard to sense danger from you. Oh, that's clever. You're just confirming how he can kill more Jedi. She gestured with her thumb at Bevin. I was picking up more from our friend here. And you still held back. She pointed to the burn across his plates. Hey, I hit you fair and square. You assumed too much. You're just training. Nobody wants to hurt you. And nice Mondo is helping you. He's standing all wrong to attack. You want to win? Start out to win. Hit first. You're telling me to fight dirty. I get that. No. I'm telling you this isn't about lightsaber technique. I'm more than twice your age. No force powers, and I still got you to drop your guard. 
Winning isn't about being better. It's finding your opponent's weakness and exploiting it. So what's Jason's? What's yours? Jaina chewed her lip in thought, aware of Myrta's gaze. She looked like more trouble than her grandfather. What if I just walked in and laid into Fett? No hello, how are you, anything, just went for him. Could any of them have stopped me? I— The realization dawned on her. I use appropriate force, with a small f. I follow the rules of combat. Good. Fett rolled the lightsaber hilt in his palm, and then slid it into the dump pouch on the thigh of his pants. You're learning. Next lesson. Goron will show you how to go crazy with a blade. But what about Jason's weaknesses? They're yours. He's my twin. I know him. And he knows you. Be someone else. Jaina clipped her lightsaber to her belt and understood both the simplicity and enormity of her task. The solution was obvious. It was just very hard to achieve. She didn't need to be fitter or stronger or more skilled. She needed to play it so out of character that Jason wouldn't be able to counter or anticipate her. If I could be that different, Fett, I wouldn't be a Jedi. There you go, said Fett, and walked away. Myrta and the two men without helmets followed him. Bevin stayed. The big guy in dark gray took off his helmet and gave Jaina the kind of look that said she was something he'd wipe off his boots. Is this Fett's idea of mystic enlightenment? she asked. Bevin shrugged. It's not hyperspace engineering. Pity. Jaina considered wiping the scowl off the big silent guy's face, but decided it was impolitic. I could handle that. Bevin walked toward the doors and jerked his head for her to follow. The man in gray ambled along beside him. We'll try to give you an alter ego, Bevin said. A nasty Jaina. A crafty, cheating Jaina. A bounty-hunting Jaina. You up for that, Medica? I'm all for giving folks a second career option, he said. He was very well-spoken, surprisingly so, as if he was a highly educated man. Jaina had expected him to be an inarticulate brute. But she can service the tiller droids first. Can't we send her back and get an Agricor Jedi instead? Bevin laughed. Ingrate! Fat had vanished. Jaina wondered what he got up to in his private hours. And when Bevin pointed out the hovel Fett was staying in, she was genuinely shocked. He could have had a palace. Bevin's farmhouse, with its shanty town of outbuildings and moat-like boundaries, reminded her more of a bastion than a haven of rural peace. The tunnels and passages seemed to run everywhere. Nothing was quite as it seemed. She stood in the grimy workshop with her arms in the oily guts of a tiller droid, listening to the whine and roar of vessels overhead. Fighters, definitely, the way the falling note indicated something moving away from her at high speed. While she adjusted clearances and checked filters, a small girl, five, not a day older, she was certain, appeared in the doorway to stare at her. She wore a tiny version of the flight suit every Mandalorian had with scaled-down but loose-fitting plates that looked a couple of sizes too big, and a hold-out blaster hanging from the belt that looked full-size on her. The blaster was real. Hi, kid. Jaina smiled, ready to deflect a bolt. Sukui, JT. Is that your blaster? Mama gave it to me. The girl unholstered it like a professional, checked the safety catch, and held it with the muzzle pointing safely away from Jaina. I'm five and a half. I'm training. 
You and me both, sweetheart. Jaina swallowed hard, more touched than worried. You and me both. No. Mandalorians weren't what she'd expected at all. And she would learn to be as much of a surprise to her brother as they were to her. Thanks, Fett. Imperial Palace, City of Ravelin, Bastion, two days later. Show the young lady in, Vitor. Receiving visitors in the palace drawing room always reminded them what they were dealing with, Pelion thought. It was an imposing chamber that whispered casual wealth. It hinted that the Empire didn't have to try too hard. While he never let himself think of having an emperor's role, that way lay delusion and moral corruption, he was sure. He was in command, and he liked visitors to know that. And will it be Kaf or Muratizan, sir? Both, please. Pelion could see a patch of vivid turquoise sky from the floor-to-ceiling windows, a little promise of escape in an otherwise stormy day. He missed being out with the fleet. And monitor the meeting, will you? Of course. Pelion saw no reason not to listen to what Jason Solo's envoy had to say. Listening committed him to nothing. It simply filled in the gaps, if his informants had actually left any. In a career spanning more than seventy years, he had built up a personal network that could give any state intelligence corps a run for its money. Even the apparently omnipotent Jason couldn't do much without leaving traces. He had to work with the raw stuff of society, troops, civil servants, clerks, even droids. The ship of state could leave an awfully big wake if you knew where to look. Tahiri Vela glided into the room right on time. Her bright blonde hair and general artless demeanor made her look too young to be sent on a task like this. Although the Yuzhan Vong markings still visible on her forehead evoked unpleasant memories. Jason, if you send a pretty girl to sweet-talk me, don't break the spell by reminding me of the Vong. Pelion stood and ushered her to her chair. The spell was definitely broken before she'd even had a chance to cast it. Is this your first visit to Bastion? he asked, pouring her a muratizan that spread an amethyst pool of light on the white marble table. If it is, don't leave without seeing the Imperial Gardens. I'll make a note of that, Admiral. So, he settled down in his seat, making a point of being slow and old, looking like easy prey. We live in challenging times, but here in our little backwater, we've managed to avoid the war, and I'm wondering what could possibly make it worth our while stepping out into that fray. You have a very small empire, but it's perfectly formed. Here's our view in the G.A. Tahiri leaned forward slightly, like an earnest student. The longer the war goes on, the worse the prospects for all of us, not just those directly involved in the fighting. We want stability. What we have is not just a split between G.A. and Confederation, but also systems unaligned to either and fighting their own local disputes. Hit the most powerful systems working against the G.A., and things will be over faster. You realize, Pelion said, that I've been here before, and more than once. And wasn't the short, sharp shock supposed to bring Corellia into line? Tahiri evidently hadn't been briefed to argue a wider case than the offer to be put on the table. She blinked a couple of times. It would work if you added your fleet and troops to ours. Now give me a more immediate benefit 
for expending imperial citizens' lives on this gamble. And it is a gamble. Pelion couldn't look too willing. Every word would be reported back. Recorded, he suspected, and Jason would look for a deeper motive if he didn't raise objections. He'd raised them over targeting Corellia, after all. I have to make a good case to the moths, beyond vague plans for peace and galactic harmony. Permacrete, not vapor. The G.A. is prepared to offer you Borlias and Bilbringi. What are the conditions? That the Empire first sends vessels and troops to attack Fondor with the G.A., Ah, performance-related pay. Very wise. With what objective? To hear his eye movements, the occasional wobble as she tried to process the words, showed she wasn't yet used to the military jargon. To bring it back to the G.A. But the detail matters, my dear. Is Jason planning to take over the orbital yards? or destroy them? What about the planet itself? Does he simply want to force a surrender? Is he preparing to subdue it by occupation? Each objective requires very different resources. Tahiri recovered well. I think the strategy is something you need to discuss with the Joint Chiefs of State. I'm only here to make the initial offer. A good point, Pelion said. Jason was nothing if not consistent. He really was working through his shopping list of planets to batter into submission. I'll put it to the moths. But it's you who really calls the shots here, isn't it? However much power a man has, it's impossible to keep it for any length of time— unless he has the support of most of those under him. I consult. Chew on that, Jason Solo. If he was smart, Jason might take it as advice from an old man who'd seen other autocrats pulled down by their underlings over the decades. Either way, Jason needed the Empire. If Pelion had read him right, no. If Jason thought like Pelion, then he knew he didn't have the numbers now to quickly crush key targets in the Confederation. But a sudden injection of troops and hulls might well tip the balance. One battle could change the course of a war. The only problem was that you never knew which one until years after the ceasefire. And if you do win, Jason... The war still won't be over for the Empire. What kind of a galactic regime do you really have in mind? Thank you for the Tizan, Tahiri said. We'll be in touch, I hope. After she left, Pelion summoned Rige. Vitor, call the moths. Let's see who jumps at this and how fast. Raj consulted his datapad and began tapping messages into the office comlink system. Well, most of them are on Bastion at the moment, so you'll have nearly a full house to debate this. Are you accepting the offer, sir? Pelion nodded. If or when Jason gets his backside kicked, then the G.A. might fall apart and we'll be there to pick up the pieces. If we sit it out, we take our chances. But if we back him, then we at least get greater control over events, whether he succeeds or not in the long run. You think he will fail? He's now faced with occupying or subduing half the galaxy to put the G.A. back together again, and he can't keep that up forever however successful he is as a commander, unless he comes up with a convincing peace deal that somehow bypasses the principle of a pooled G.A. defense force 
Then I don't see this ending. That's why the war started, remember? Pelion waited for the moths to gather in the meeting room and tried to think like Jason. The man wasn't a fool, but could he see the galaxy through Fondorian eyes? Did he know which battle he was trying to win? He seemed to see worlds as controlled by a few stubborn leaders whose removal would free the population to see things his way. He didn't see that the general population didn't want to do things the G.A. way either. If you wanted to build an empire, well, the trick was to leave the population to get on with their lives. Pelion got up and walked across to the cabinet that housed hundreds of data pads, antique-bound flimsy, and even ancient animal skin scrolls, military histories from a thousand worlds spanning millennia. He knew that if he picked one at random, any history at all, he would find much the same story as the one he was living through today. Seizure of power, the desire for expansion, and the inevitable inability to hold all that had been grabbed. The only variable was how long it took to fall apart. The longest-lived empires were those with the lightest hand on the reins. Empire can be different, he muttered aloud, provided we shoot all the lunatics who enjoy the idea. Where that left him, no, he was purged of ambition at ninety-two. He simply wanted to leave the galaxy tidy and clean when he left it for the last time. That was what government was about, and the military was its instrument to achieve it. The moths, predictably, were mostly split between enthusiasm for the Jason Solo plan, ill-defined as it was, and those like Rossett who wanted to know more before signing up. "'I'm with you on this, Admiral,' said Rossett, sitting opposite him across the mirror-polished table. "'Putting orbital yards out of action is a very different proposition from subduing the planet itself.' Are we going to end up policing Fondor for Jason Solo until Mustafar freezes over? Pelion was fascinated to note how Admiral Neothel had been erased from the scene. It was seen as Jason's war. The Moncal schemer would probably be happy about that, he thought. She could step in when Jason hit the buffers, hands relatively clean. How badly do we want Bill Bringy? Borlias. They're not going to be costly to take, said Kiel. Very small population on Borlias post Yuzhan Vong. Probably happier to have someone like us look after them than not. Bill Bringy might require some military effort, though. Like I mentioned before, Rossett said. We could take both systems if we wanted to without committing anything to the G.A., because I don't think Jason's in a position to stop us. Keel had an expression of almost religious epiphany on his face. But the G.A. isn't going to be able to hold Fondor without us, because that'll require an occupying army after it surrenders. Poor old G.A., short of hands and we offer to look after the place while it's busy hammering more wayward systems back into the Alliance fold. We end up staying, and possession is nine-tenths of the law, after all. Rossett let out a long breath. I think they'll notice we tried to steal Fondor from under their noses. I don't think they'll see it like that, Pelion interrupted. He was wary about agreeing with Keel even about the time of day. But the moth had a point, and if Jason was going to fall sooner or later anyway, when he stretched himself just that little bit too far, if we have both Borlias and Bilbringi, then that gives us a platform from which to maintain a presence on Fondor, and then we'll have expanded down past the core again. Pelion didn't have to elaborate on that at all. Every moth understood the potential. Are we all agreed, then, gentlemen? We accept the G.A.'s invitation, 
subject to their sharing the Fondor plan with us, and our being able to resource our role? Normal practice was to go around the table and record votes for and against. But the Moffs paused in silence for a moment, and then all burst into spontaneous applause. Pelion wasn't sure if they were applauding him, or simply overwhelmed with martial emotion at the prospect of being back in the saddle. You are not entirely happy about this, are you, Admiral? Raj said as he made Pelion's nightcap, a mix of two parts Corellian brandy to one part water. You've never appeased the moths before, and Jason Solo is... Anathema to me? Yes, and I'm not appeasing the moths now. Pelion stood on the balcony of his chambers, looking out over the parkland beneath. The Imperial Cavalry's ceremonial troop was exercising the bloodfins, cantering in a neat line along the rise and skylined for a moment against the sunset that passed for evening at this time of year on Bastion. For a few weeks the sun didn't set fully and night never moved beyond a glowing dusk. It was a fine moment to sip a brandy and savor the fresh scent of cut grass on the breeze. I'm trying to make the best of a situation that Jason Solo will impose on the galaxy, whether we join him or not. If we don't, all the recovery effort after the last war will be for nothing. I anticipate that he will go the way of most despots and fall, or even hang. If that happens, when that happens, we shall be there to pick up the pieces. I have no faith in the G.A. to run anything beyond their Coruscant front garden, let alone a galaxy. Pelion rolled the brandy glass slowly between his palms, and glanced back at Raj. He really did look like his dead son Minar sometimes, and it would have been so simple to check, to test, to know for sure if Raj were his flesh and blood or not. No, it wouldn't have made any difference to Pelion's regard for him. He settled for never knowing. Some things were best left unknown. Anything else, sir? Thank you, Vitor. No. Pelion gestured with his glass. Care to join me? Perhaps later, sir. I have some work to finish. I look forward to it. Pelion stood at the window until he'd drained his glass, but neither the decision nor the brandy could make one thought go away that Jason Solo was a self-serving megalomaniac, and there was nothing to reassure Pelion that the man would honor any agreement unless forced to. For all the victories he'd achieved, he was erratic, and the G.A. was still losing allies, even hapes. And Kashyyyk, that was a disgrace to anyone in uniform. It was time to take out some insurance— Whatever Jason was planning for Fondor and the Empire, and Pelion was certain there was a whole side of the strategy that the Empire would not have been told, Pelion needed a trump card of his own, and not one for the Moths to see yet either. We have our own Jasons here, too. Well then, old friend, he said aloud. He walked over to the floor-length mirror and smoothed back his white hair, checking the cut of his jacket. Time to call in a favor. He felt suddenly foolish. She wouldn't even see him. He was simply going to send a message, and one without a single word in it. But she would receive it, and she would know what it meant, and that it was critical. And she would respond. Pelion took out a few small flimsy card trinket boxes from his desk drawer and tapped his fingertips on the lid of each in turn, listening for the best approximation of a small drum. Rap, rap, rap. 
Rap, rap. Brr, rap. That was the one. Pelion settled down at the desk and positioned his comlink next to the box, ready to drum out his message. He had to rehearse it a few times. His fingers were a little stiff, but he refused to bow to arthritis even now, and Jason Solo had nothing on that. I wouldn't do this unless I had to, my dear, he said, and opened the comlink. Rap, 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 brr, rap. It was time for the warrior sailor Darakair to be summoned, as in the Irmenu legend. Pelion felt that the galaxy was slipping toward its darkest peril, and Jason, Jason might have looked like an ally, but Pelion knew he was truly a foe in every sense. Rap, 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 brr, rap. Darakair, long dead, probably didn't have the kind of firepower that Pelion wanted, even if he rose from his grave and answered the call. But the Admiral knew someone who did, and who had been very taken with the saga of the Ermenu hero. Rap, 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 brr, rap. The drum beat went out across space. It was just a repeating rhythm that would mean nothing to anyone except an Irmenu historian, if any could listen in on this secure link, and a warrior sailor who was, he hoped, still very much alive. Rap, 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 brr, rap. Pelion closed the link and settled in for a long wait. Chapter 8 The trocard is primitive. We thought that you wanted state-of-the-art technology, and that is why you allied with us. What is the point of this machine? Sas Sikili, negotiator of the Roach Hives to Jir Yomaget, head of Mandel Motors, on seeing hollow images of the Trakad prototype multi-mission combat vessel. Office of the Joint Chief of State, Coruscant. Kytus ran his fingertips over the nameplate on the outer doors and wondered when he would have the engraving changed to replace Colonel Jason Solo with Darth Kytus. Would he need a plate on the door, or even an office at all? He'd still intended to leave the routine business of government to Neothel, but she was becoming an irritant, and it was time he started looking for an administrator to take over just in case he had to retire her. Kytus hoped she might see sense and return to Moon Calamari, or even accept a transfer back to operational duties with the fleet. But she had tasted power, and few were willing to slide back into taking orders when they'd given them. Flesh and blood were heir to ambition. He liked ambition in an apprentice or junior officer, but the closer it crept to his own rank, the more it got in the way of the tidy business of running a peaceful, stable galaxy. Keeping a constant eye out for usurpers was time-consuming and distracting. He was beginning to prefer the service of droids. A legal droid had enabled him to exploit the law to grab power and it expected no favors or high office in return. It simply did its job. Maybe he needed a droid administration. Just one more push. Just one more to break the back of resistance. Make an example of Fondor. The Imperial Remnant was joining him, and that made all the difference. Kytus's sense of standing on the brink of a pivotal moment was growing stronger. The state of galactic allegiances might not have looked in his favor numerically, but the recruitment of the Moths to his cause was a coup. Their military weight was what he'd wanted most, but their sphere of influence 
which also included the banking centers of Munalinst and Maigito, was a prize in itself. I have resources, should I need them. But I can also choke off the resources of others. Economics is a weapon, too. Tahiri, he said, where have you been? Tahiri sat down in the chair facing his desk, now looking the ideal junior lieutenant. She'd even pinned up her hair. I thought you could tell. Can't you detect me? Kytus activated the holochart and magnified the Fondor system, moving asset icons into different positions. I don't have time to keep an eye on everyone, and talking of detection, are you any farther forward with locating the Jedi Council's base? No, I am not, sir. Why? There's a lot of galaxy to search, and the stealth X needs regular maintenance. I lost one day already. I realize the service schedule seems to have been stepped up, but that doesn't explain the lack of results from a Jedi. Sir, that's unfair. Tahiri was taking her new military status seriously. She hadn't called him Jason in days. If this is a priority, then you have far more powerful force senses than me, and you should be able to locate them. I still think they'd bolt to one of their old haunts. Kytus didn't think Luke was so unimaginative, and would know that, of course. So he might do it, and head for somewhere like Hoth or Endor, as much to relive some sad nostalgia for his youth as to hide. But Luke would also know that searching Hoth or some force-forsaken wilderness would tie up Kytus's scarce elite resources, and so he would be happy for Kytus to believe he was a fool, or have him lock himself into indecision trying to guess Luke's strategy. I will not give Luke the satisfaction. He's yesterday's man. I do not dance to his tune. He'll want us to waste time searching his old haunts, Kytus said. So we won't. He moved star destroyers and frigates around the Tapani sector chart with his fingertip, considering his options for bringing Fondor back into line. In some ways, it mattered more than Corellia. Corellia had always been a thorn in every government side, a planet of hobby dissidents who didn't care who ran the show or what the policies were, as long as they could rebel against them. Perhaps the worst thing to impose on Corellia was a regime in Coruscant that agreed with them on their every whining objection, sending them into a spiral of confusion. But Fondor was psychologically different. It was a regular world, usually a compliant and responsible world, and so its secession from the G.A., was a more dangerous signal to others in the G.A. Kytus was sure this had emboldened other systems to break ranks. He had to be seen to crack down now, something he should have done months ago, had he not been distracted by more domestic matters. I haven't thought about Alana for hours. Or Tenelka. If I try hard, I can forget them. In time. After we take back Fondor, I'll join you in hunting him, Kaida said. He didn't plan to make the same mistakes as he had with Corellia, by listening to weak-willed bureaucrats who didn't have the stomach for a fight. I told Cal Omas we should crush Corellia right away, and nip the rebellion in the bud. It's his fault for limiting me, and Neophil's. I've proven my point. Either you put out a forest fire right away, or it goes on burning underground, even when the surface vegetation is ash. Kytus knew all about forest fires now. He liked the analogy. Just as the real forest fires on Kashyyyk 
would enable new healthy growth to spring up again, so did purging the old order of chaos and petty planetary politics. After Fondor Are you spending any time around fleet personnel? Sorry. I meant, do you listen to the mood on the lower decks? I... I ate in the mess at HQ a couple of times. Yes. And? Kytus made himself forget Fondor for a moment, and stepped back, eyes closed, to quiet his mind and focus on a randomly chosen point in time and space, the junior ratings mess in Fleet HQ. If he shut out everything else, he could sense the collective mood of fleet personnel, taste the blend of anticipation, fear, curiosity, loneliness, even the worries about pay and promotion, as if it was one entity. He sank deeper into the swirl of light, sound, and texture, sensing the mess as white noise, and then snatches of specific emotions and chatter welled up from the blur in sharp clarity. I don't believe it. It's true, I tell you. He killed her, snapped her neck. He's the best officer we ever had. He cares. He killed her, I tell you. Tebot was all right. If he can kill her, lots of people have ended up dead since he took over. Omus, Gedjin, Luke Skywalker's wife. Don't be stupid. She was family. Kytus snapped out of the listening trance and his office looked dead. Its colors washed out for a moment. He was furious. I killed Mara. They're saying I killed her. She came after me. She was trying to kill me. If I hadn't killed her, I'd be the one getting a state funeral now. Destiny steered by the Force or not, she tried to kill me. She was an assassin. It was all she ever was, all she was destined to be, for the purposes unfolding now. He felt his face flush, hot and hurt. The strength of his reaction shocked him. He could face himself when he shaved each morning— and however many lives this war was costing, he did what he had to do. Each life spent was to save many others, and he would not apologize for it, or be regarded as a common criminal. Sir, are you okay? Kytus settled himself and embraced the temporary distress as another inevitable pain in the road to mastering the Sith way. If he couldn't feel stung and wounded— if he could ignore the barbs, then he couldn't harness the passions as if had to feed upon. They were his strength. The pain was his strength. If only Ben had realized the value of pain. He was so much sharper, more thoughtful, more worthy than Tahiri, for all his sentimental shortcomings. Where will I find the right one? When will I find a deserving apprentice? It would have to wait. I shouldn't have to do the foot-soldier work, Tahiri. Be my eyes and ears. I'd hate to have to use Chahala trees. You're smarter than a tree, aren't you? Yes, sir, she said and her resentment tasted like sour vattle juice at the back of his tongue. That was a positive sign, better than the needy desperation that had motivated her to effort only when she wanted to see Anakin again. If she was going to be more than just an errand runner, he had to find the durasteel in her spine, some powerful emotion that would make her fight back and even challenge him. Her fire, her drive— needed to come from her living self, and not from a dead boy she could never have. It was unhealthy, this fixation with what was gone forever. Kaida sometimes felt uneasy using the flow-walking bait, but it was just a way of placing Tahiri in the right position 
so he could then show her something real and lasting. It was a necessary, temporary evil. Then you'll understand this, he said. He beckoned her over to the holochart table, even though she could easily see the plot if she twisted in the chair. Come here. See my strategy for Fondor. Kytus moved clouds of small icons like miniature star clusters into an irregular ring around Fondor. Your strategy. Tahiri wasn't cowed down by Kytus's verbal slaps. Good. She was still smarting and angry. Is Admiral Neothel not involved? Who runs the state while I'm away? We need to avoid having both chiefs away at the same time, unless there's an overwhelming crisis away from Coruscant that demands it. Kytus thought of how often they'd both not only been off-planet, but in the same engagement. No attempt to overthrow us, though. How compliant beings can be. She's aware of my plans. But you trust her enough to turn your back on her. My back, Kaidis said, is never turned, no matter where I am. Sowing seeds of doubt, either because she wants to rattle me, or because she's genuinely suspicious. Both worthy of a Sith. Perhaps Tahiri has turned a corner at last. So what am I looking at? she asked. Kytus sensed Neothel coming along the corridor. Her timing was impeccable. She must have seen Tahiri pass the lobby outside her own office. The small icons are mines, he said. I'm not making the same mistake as we did in blockading Corellia. Then we still deluded ourselves that we could bring the planet to its knees by maintaining a civilized picket line. Like some customs and excise operation. No, that eats resources, especially when there's a ring of orbital stations to isolate from both planet side and space side. When I deploy warships and fighters, it will be to wage war and fight, not to be run ragged stopping Confederates from walking on the grass. I'm taking the first element of the Fourth Fleet to Fondor today. The mine layers have already left. Around the whole planet? That's the only option. Mining the main transits from the Rima trade route simply allows supply vessels to bypass the minefields, or catches the careless ones. And while I want to deter commerce from supporting Fondor, there's nothing to be gained in alienating the trade worlds with civilian casualties. Neothel's presence blew in like a storm building on the horizon a few moments before she appeared. Kytus and Tahiri paused and turned together. Bad form, yes, I agree. No dead civilians. Neothel walked over to the chart, hands clasped behind her back. In her pristine whites and gold braid, she was the quintessence of admiralty as she cocked her head to study the holoschematic chart of the system. Kytus knew that Moan Cal's eyes were positioned so that the tilt was necessary to focus closely. But to a human, the gesture always smacked of doubt, as if she thought he was the dim boy in the class who never got the right answer. So the impenetrable ring of detonite, eh, Jason? She turned to Tahiri. How smart you look in a proper uniform, my dear. Welcome to the fleet. Kytus cut in. Neothel was in one of her irritating smug moods, no doubt thrilled at the prospect of his absence. I'm deploying to Fondor tonight, remember. I'm sure you'll miss me. That begs a joke, but I'm no comedian. 
five mind layers should be in position a few hours ahead of the rest of the task force. Jason glanced at the wall chrono. There'll be a shell around the entire planet when I get there. Neophil extended a long, bony fin of a finger into the nest of tangled, glowing lines dotted with multicolored lights. Don't forget that you lay the inner ring first, though, will you? Oh, you're too modest when you say you're not a comedian, Admiral. Neothel felt as if she was savoring the carefully worded fight. And these won't be activated until we've warned Fondor and given a one-standard-hour general shipping alert. Will they? Not issuing a warning about planetary mine nets would be a war crime, Admiral, because of civilian traffic. That's why I ask. You're so forgetful lately. And we'll take the decision to activate jointly, won't we? I'm a team player. I look forward to it. He didn't need his Force senses to tell him that she wouldn't miss him. I've put the Third Fleet Rapid Reaction Force on alert. So if you need help, do call. I'll give the blockade a week before we move to the assault phase. We didn't discuss that. Oh, I thought of it later. Why create a mine shell if you don't intend to sit it out? It's not as if we have hulls and troops to spare. Because I still think we should take the yards sooner rather than later. And we can pick them off once the planet is locked down. Then, when the yards are secured, I intend to capture the capital and main regional centers. Yes, you did say that. But let me remind you that there are still five billion Fondorians, at least half of them on the planet's surface, and most in those cities. I'm hoping it won't get to that stage. I may sacrifice one yard to show I mean business, but Fondor won't want its industrial infrastructure destroyed. Will it? Small, rich world. One that will see sense. Corellia has an even smaller population. And look how well that went. Neothel checked the splendid gold fob chrono on her jacket. My, is that the time? I must be going. She headed for the doors. Wow, Tahiri said when Neothel was long out of earshot. Are you two always that barbed with each other? It's how we keep on our toes. Kytus would have been much more worried if Neothel oozed sweetness and light to him. As long as he felt that she despised him, and he felt it, and she paraded her disdain openly, he knew he could still trust her not to attack him. She was much more transparent than he'd first expected. She's actually very, very good at her job. I just wish she'd accept that she's not very good at mine. You can feel her hatred. I certainly can. It's not hatred, Tahiri, Kaida said. It's disdain, contempt, and a certain superior pleasure at being Better and nicer than me, as she sees it. That's loathing, perhaps, not hatred. Hatred is close to fear, and always has an element of dread in it. Like love has a component of pity, and it's just as hard to see the line between the two. Tahiri might have taken it at face value, or she might have been unpicking hidden meaning in it. He hoped she was doing the latter. I'll turn to at 1800, she said, as if she'd learned all the new jargon to impress him and possibly secure another fruitless, tantalizing glimpse of Anakin. 
Sir? She walked out of the office with a more rigid spine. Perhaps she's choosing pain, too. You did well with Admiral Pelion, by the way, he called after her. Good job, Lieutenant. Something else had just shifted in the force. A small thing, a cog turned by just a single tooth, but it had moved, and with it the rest of the machine was subtly altered. That was the nature of destiny. Kytus felt around in the force for where Luke and his entourage might be, but his mind was too restless now, fixed on the need to bring down Fondor. It will be a short siege, I promise. A decisive one. He tried to search out his twin sister, just out of curiosity. Jaina, I can't believe how easy it is to forget people. I can go for days without even remembering you exist. Jaina. He reached out in the force. But something else in the great machine had changed, too. He couldn't feel Jaina. Not the familiar mix of temper and passion and, always applied too late, the urge to control it all. Perhaps Ben had taught Jaina how to shut down in the force, too, like he'd probably taught his mother so she could kill Jason Solo more efficiently. Kytus checked himself as he realized that he saw Jason as a separate entity. It was more than having changed. It was separation. Jason still existed for the family who tried to understand him, but he wasn't the man sitting here now. Better not teach Tahiri to force hide. It just complicates matters. Jason Solo Gone now, not concealed. Gone, and never coming back. Kytus spent the afternoon moving assets around imagined Fondor space, feeling fresh pleasure each time his finger connected with the amber lights representing the new assets, the battleships and fighter squadrons of the Imperial Remnant. This would not be the long, groaning, humiliating failure of trying to subdue Corellia. He had a good chunk of the Fourth Fleet, and nobody else was placed to come to Fondor's aid. Everyone else now had their own woes and war to keep them busy. This time, it'll be different. It would be different because there was no more Jason Solo or any of his levers left to pull. And if there was no more Jason Solo, then Darth Kytus had no twin sister. Kytus relaxed. G.A. Fleet Hangar, Galactic City, six hours later. We're on, said Shevu. The Anakin Solo has cleared orbit. Ben could see Shevu on the monitor that was set in the CSF speeder's dash. He didn't know or ask how the captain had managed to borrow a police traffic patrol vessel, but it was handy cover for anyone who wanted to sit waiting at a Skylane intersection near a military installation without drawing the wrong kind of attention. It was also linked to a network of Skylane surveillance holocams. All Ben had to do was sit there and monitor the images that the forensics droid relayed from the interior of the stealth X cockpit. Okay, Ben said. Let me know if you need a spot of disruption. Shevu adjusted his helmet as he walked toward the hangar's open doors. Yellow light spilled out onto the permacrete ramp. If you ever take up a life of crime, Ben, you'll do staggeringly well at it. Just as well, Jedi are pretty honest. Ben had learned that even for him, there was a principle of need to know. And he didn't need to know how far CSF was involved now. The police looked after their own, no questions asked. And as far as they were concerned, Shevu was still one of the lads. 
even if you now wore the black of the Galactic Alliance Guard. It was just a matter of slipping the CSF forensics droid into the Stealth X. It was a small sphere about the size of a smash ball, disturbingly like a thermal detonator, and packed into its innards were probes, spectrometers, reagents, sample packs, and a full array of sensors that recorded everything at the crime scene it was sent to record. It was perfect for sending into dangerous or inaccessible places that a flesh-and-blood CSF scenes of crime officer couldn't reach, and it was also small enough to be discreet. The only problem was that it didn't look like a maintenance droid, and someone might notice. Ben's job was to make sure they didn't. Chevu, in uniform and taking advantage of the fact that GAG officers could do as they pleased in Jason's new galactic order, ambled into the hangar, and the external traffic remote lost him in the shadow. There was a brief fog of static on the monitor as Ben switched from the traffic control holocam to Chevu's helmet cam. Here we go, said Chevu. The forward image showed Jason's personal stealth X sitting in its bay canopy closed, in a line of X-wings connected to the diagnostic grid by cables and wires. Maintenance droids and a couple of human technicians walked in and out of eyeshot, looking harassed. Got the droid ready. I'm watching. Ben followed Chevu's field of view as the captain walked up to the technicians and asked them when Colonel Solo's Stealth X was starting its maintenance cycle. They assumed they were being nagged to make the vessel a priority. Okay, we'll do it before the next batch of X-Wings, one technician said in an exasperated tone. Look, we can only process them so fast, you know. It's okay. Chevu sounded as if he was relenting. I'll hang around, if you don't mind. You know what a pain in the neck he is about efficiency. The technicians lapsed into stunned silence, mouths slightly slack with horror. It was just a figure of speech, but with the gossip about poor Tebut doing the rounds of the fleet, it sounded like a very sick joke. They didn't seem sure whether it was safer to laugh at it or not. Armed forces' humor was very tasteless sometimes, right on the borderline between laughter and tears. Chevu shrugged and walked away. It was a perfect excuse for him to mooch around the hangar, looking as if he were killing time by sticking his nose in everywhere. He was a secret policeman. It was what they expected him to do. He clambered up the ladders on a couple of X-wings, prodded cables, and generally made all the movements of a man wanting to get on with something because he had a very unreasonable boss. Did the rest of the fleet still like Jason? A few days ago he'd been their hero, one of the team. He sent procurement managers to the front line for providing poor quality kit to the troops, or not providing it at all. He led from the front. He never asked his personnel to do anything he wouldn't do himself. This, Ben knew, was what created the loyalty that made beings put their lives on the line for an officer. It wasn't political fervor or a desire for glory. It was devotion based on shared risk, on knowing that comrades, whatever the rank, looked out for each other. But Jason hadn't looked out for him. He'd tortured him. Ben couldn't imagine doing that to someone he was supposed to care about, especially for their own good. Do you really know how much he's changed, Jaina? Ben, stand by. Chevu's helmet link showed he was at the Stealth X now. It was one of three left. The Jedi had taken the others with them, and a Stealth X wasn't much use to non-Force users, seeing as they had to use comlinks. Ben watched Chevu's field of view shake with the one, two, three of climbing the small ladder up to the cockpit and the flash of a transparent canopy lifting, followed by the dark interior and matte instrument panel as Chevu looked inside. In the hole, Chevu muttered into his helmet link. Then he climbed back down, 
and wandered apparently aimlessly around the hangar. Droid on the case. Most of Ben's attention shifted to the monitor showing the droid's eye view of the cockpit. A fraction of it remained on Shevu's monitor, watching for complications that might require a little force ingenuity from Ben. He could see the smooth matte black curves of the instrument panel, and the small brush-like projections from the droid skimming over plastoid and durasteel, picking up traces and analyzing them before storing the swabbed samples inside the case. An icon on the monitor showed the results as the droid worked, and there were traces of skin cells, machine lubricant, microscopic shavings of metals, and sweat from hands. There was even dust with the mineral profile of Cavan. But then Jason had landed to find Ben. It wasn't evidence. The droid worked methodically, covering the cockpit deck and bulkheads. It was picking up the odd hair, too. Five centimeter lengths, short and male. Ben's heart sank. The cockpit must have been cleaned several times in the last few weeks, then the droid worked over the apparently clean seat. Again, the icons showed skin cells, dust, oils. The probes worked down into seams, and then between the sections that formed the angle of the seat, deep folds of fabric. The icons changed. Particles. Brick. Origin unknown. Clay. Silicates. Organic material. Hair, female, 29 centimeters, follicular tag present, traces of blood on hair shaft, DNA matches hair. Oh, 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 Ben whispered. Got it? Chevu's view showed he was near the doors, head moving slowly as if watching nothing in particular. What is it, Ben? Hair with blood and a follicular tag. Female hair. If it's got a tag, Ben, it's probably been pulled out. Ben saw his mother in his memory, tugging her hair and dropping strands into his palm as he stared dumbfounded at her ghost on Cavan. You did it, Mom. Let's get out, Ben said. We've got it. Stang, said Chevu. When Ben switched his attention back to Shevu's monitor, he saw what had made him curse. Captain Geardon was walking toward him, hands deep in pockets, whistling soundlessly. Walk him away, said Ben. I'll extract the droid. Wait until he goes. I'll get rid of him. No, just get him away from the Stealth X. Leave it to me. Okay. Shevu's voice was now totally different. External, addressing Geardon. Keeping you up, are we? Don't see you down here often, Geardon said. Just making sure Solo's toy is ready if he decides to come back early. Don't want him to shake me warmly by the throat, do I? Geardon made a snorting sound. Ha, huh, you're his little master perfect. He won't throttle you. Besides, he's going to be stuck at Fondor for a long time. Chevu began walking away from the Stealth X very slowly, getting Geardon to follow him without even thinking. Ben watched Chevu's helmet cam shift perspective from the speckled, irregularly shaped fiberplast airframe of the fighter to a long view of the hangar with the X-wings staggered along the length of both walls, and waited until it had passed three of them before extracting the droid. Am I stopping it too early? Will there be other evidence in there? No. Ben had what mattered. The droid was self-propelled, but he gave it a little force assistance and plucked it out of the cockpit, moving it to the floor and then sending it out of the doors and into the night. Once it was clear of the hangar ramp, he lifted it into the air and pulled it to him as fast as he could, almost smacking it into the side of a passing repulsor truck in his haste. When it plopped onto the seat next to him in the traffic speeder, he couldn't stop himself clenching both fists and hissing, 
yes, 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 in triumph. Now all he had to do was wait for Shevu to get away from Girdin and meet up with him. He moved the speeder onto the next intersection and sat with one hand on the droid as if it were an obedient pet that had done a clever trick. Eventually he heard Shevu say, Hang this, I'll come back in the morning, and relief flooded his body. By the time Shevu called him for a pickup from the next sky lane, the captain was wearing plain black coveralls without insignia or rank, looking like a CSF tactical weapons officer. He dropped Ben and the droid off two blocks down from the apartment and disappeared to return the CSF speeder. Ben wondered how flexible the CSF admin system had to be for some officer to loan vehicles to a buddy for a highly irregular operation that had nothing to do with CSF. Not officially. Back in the apartment, Ben placed the droid on the table and sat staring at it as if it might make a dash for freedom, and almost expected his mother to appear to him again with some gesture of congratulation. But she didn't and he was disappointed. For the first time since finding her body, though, he felt that she wasn't totally gone. She was simply in another place. Unlike most beings in the galaxy, he actually knew that to be true and real, not just a sincere hope. It meant he could go on now. He would, as he promised himself, live for her, and live well. That evening, he and Shevu ate their supper in silence. There was a sense of anticlimax. I'll play Palpatine's advocate, Shevu said, chewing slowly. The hair. First, you have to match it to your mother's. Dad grabbed most of her stuff before he got out. He's got her brushes. Plenty of hair to match up DNA. I was going on to say that you'd need to prove there was no other way that the trace could have got into the stealth X. It was on Jason's clothing. Ben tried to imagine how his mother's hair got pulled out. She'd bled, though. He could see that when he found her. They must have fought hand to hand. That's... grim. She hadn't got any traces of his skin under her nails or anything. So what were they doing for him to have grabbed her hair? Did he ambush her? I don't know. A defense lawyer would say that Jason might have picked up the hairs from you. I didn't touch her body. It was a crime scene. I wanted to, but I knew it was important to leave things alone. They'd say it's your word against Jason's. Ben felt irrationally angry. And I'd say, look at the body of evidence I'm building up. But it's Dad, isn't it? You're asking me if this is going to be enough to convince him. If I were still in CSF, I'd say it was enough for me to arrest him for questioning. At least. And then it's circumstantial. Take the droid, Shevu said, and let's get you back to wherever it is you're hanging out. Ben opened his mouth to say Endor, but Shevu held up a hand for silence. I don't need to know. Okay? Ben pondered the nature of reasonable doubt. He was sure now. He didn't know if Dad would be. He really needed one more clincher. But he had no idea what else there could possibly be that would prove beyond any doubt that it wasn't Ali Marar who had killed Mara Jade Skywalker, but Jason Solo. Fleet HQ Operations Center, Coruscant Neofel made sure she was a daily visitor to Fleet HQ, but this was her second trip today, made without notice. Her arrival had thrown the center into a quiet, barely noticeable panic, but it was panic all the same. Personnel tidied consoles and emptied cups of calf discreetly, thinking she wouldn't notice their attempt to bring the place up to Captain's walkthrough standards by the time she looked up from the screen she was studying. They never seemed to realize how wide a field of vision Amon Cal had. 
It's just calf. Forget it. We have much bigger problems. Admiral, is there anything I can do? The Sulliston Op Center commander hovered, uneasy at having a full admiral of the fleet ensconced in the ops room at a terminal, let alone one who was also joint chief of state. He had the air of someone who was waiting for the axe to fall, and to be told that he had failed a surprise inspection for reasons he would never grasp. There's always a private office available for you. Neothel could also have sat back in her own chair and watched Jason's progress on the repeater holochart in her suite at the Senate. But the big picture wasn't what she was interested in. She wanted to see the detail. She wanted to see the way crews were prepped and briefed before Jason jumped to hyperspace. And she wanted to see if he'd slipped in any little extras that he'd neglected to mention. Like the way the timing of the assault had slipped his mind. It would take a month or more for the orbital yards to use up their supplies. And even then they had sufficient water recycling capacity to hold out for another month on half or quarter rations without resupply. Fondorian yards were staffed mainly by humans, who could live on very few calories for a long time as long as they were hydrated. A week was far too soon. She couldn't believe Jason hadn't learned the lesson of Corellia. She was sure he had. And if he was half as sly and resourceful as she knew— he would have gone with the intention and enough troops and materiel to move to the assault phases, orbitals, then planet, as soon as he could. Did he already know she was slipping information to Luke? Was this part of his test? Stop thinking that way, or he's got you where he's got everyone else. You're a better tactician than that. Don't you have oversight of Colonel Solo's plans? asked the commander. His name was Kenb, but she could only see the K and the E on his tunic, because his arms were folded tightly across his chest, creasing the fabric. If there's anything wrong, if there is, then it's my problem rather than yours, commander, she said kindly. Calf cups scraped faintly. Flimsy rustled. When she turned her head, Consoles were immaculate again. I'm not Jason. You don't have to be afraid of me. I've been neglecting logistics, and I want to get up to speed again. Certainly, Admiral. Sulliston faces weren't as obviously mobile and expressive as a human's, but she knew disbelief when she saw it. Call me if you need anything. Yes, in any normal government, the head of state and the defense secretary would discuss with the chiefs of staff how a major engagement was to be fought, and how it would be resourced. Yet here they were, a duumvirate, combining all the roles of state and military, and still he was economical with information. It was rather like beings trying to pretend they were alone in a crowded turbolift, as long as eye contact could be avoided, the illusion of anonymous privacy held. Jason made vague noises about strategy, grabbed an assortment of ships, and ambled off to play. And she let him, because she had no idea how to stop him with her first shot. She'd only get one chance. Wounded, he'd be a terrible enemy. And I want to see what you packed for your little trip. Jason always had the Anakin Solo, of course. And Fondor was a relatively small world, a speck compared with Coruscant. Its neighbor, Nelastia, was even smaller, and might not even try to ride to the rescue. Neothel called up the holochart from Jason's office node and tried to work out what was inappropriate for Fondor because something didn't fit. Mines, especially the latest self-dispersing Mersan vigilante type, were quick and easy to lay, and Jason didn't need many ships to do it. Two for the planet side, and perhaps three for the outer cordon. 
simply because so many minds were needed to create a double shell around a planet. Other than that, it was simply a case of telling their program what they needed to do and where, scattering them, and the clever little things made their own way into position and formed their own communications net. They would stand guard for as long as it took, killing anything that tried to pass. They could even be deactivated and rounded up later, like an obedient flock. Would have been a great idea to do that with Corellia. But minds were indiscriminate killers, designed to be so, to send out a clear message that nobody could pass. The whole Corellian blockade had been as much a psychological lever, conceived at a time when Cal Omis had really thought that the war could end with talks, and when Jason could be curbed, and when casualties could still, so they had thought, bring everyone to their senses. The mine layers are an hour into hyperspace, Kemp said. Give them an hour to deploy on reaching the target, and pull back outside the Fondorian limits. Neothel had to let Luke know the full picture. He would only target Jason, but any commander needed wider context. She'd struggled with that decision on the short journey to HQ, because it would be as good as warning Fondor and the crews and troops dragged along for Jason's jaunt, were her people. She might have been signing their death warrants. But if I balk at this, is there any useful intelligence I can safely give the Jedi? GA personnel will almost always be involved. No, she couldn't be selective. She had to choose now. It was literally a sickening sensation. If Fondor doesn't roll over, when faced with the prospect of having one or two of its cities turned into a transperisteel parking lot, how is Jason going to occupy the planet? He'd embarked with 150,000 troops. Taking ten orbital yards would tie up most of them. And assuming they succeeded... It was labor-intensive to keep an eye on an industrial process where disgruntled workers would sabotage operations in a thousand small places. It wasn't enough, even in the short to medium term. Jason's battle awareness was extraordinary. A Sith skill, Luke said. And he might very well have known something that she didn't. But it didn't guarantee he wouldn't run into problems or that his crew would try quite as hard as they had before Tebut was killed. Morale was a subtle thing. It was often the difference between inspired actions and failure. What's the latest estimate of the strength of the Remnant Task Force? she asked. They're standing by with twenty Star Destroyers and carriers with air group embarked. Assorted cruisers, auxiliaries, landing craft, and fast patrol vessels. No firm numbers on personnel overall, but a first wave of 50,000 troops for the blockade. And they have small special forces units embarked to take strategic targets as required. They plan to join Colonel Solo just before the assault. I'd better talk to Pelion. See if he thinks this is genius or madness. I think I can guess what Gentleman Gill will say. It was rather touching. Most personnel still had a soft spot for Pelion. Neothel didn't, but now that she had to work with him again, she'd find one temporarily. Very well. I'm finished for the day. If anything changes, calm me. Neothel valued the transit time from HQ to the Senate. Her official speeder had tinted screens and soundproofing, and so it was a haven, a few minutes each day when she could clear her mind. Jason isn't stupid. Not stupid enough to try to take Fondor with a fraction of the troops he needs, anyway. I just hope the Imperials are as good as their word. I bet they think they're going to get Fondor as a bonus for their trouble. Jason's vagueness about operational orders part of his ad hoc way of running things lately, frustrated her immensely. 
it was all intangible feeling, force intuition, and too few hard numbers. It worked more often than not, but she still didn't like what she couldn't see and measure. Jason couldn't hold Fondor with those numbers unless the whole population capitulated. And even if governments did, citizens often had their own ideas about resistance. Either the force was telling him Fondor was going to shrug and take it after a token exchange of fire, much as they skirmished on the limits of Fondor's space and didn't take it much farther, or he was overestimating his chances. Maybe he had some Sith secret tactic that nobody had seen before. She rubbed her face wearily. Either way, Luke Skywalker needed to know the attack was imminent. The chauffeur dropped her off at her club for the evening, and instead of savoring that brief respite when the biggest decision she had to make was what to order from the menu, she swept her room for eavesdropping devices and then composed an encrypted data sheet for Luke Skywalker with every detail he might need. She wasn't sure how many Jedi had regrouped on Endor, but they had a way of punching way, way above their weight. Give him a punch for me, Luke. When Luke appeared, she spoke quickly. Master Skywalker, Fondor will be ring-fenced by vigilante mines, double shell. I estimate four or five hours, and the fleet will follow shortly afterward. Luke paused, as if he was visualizing that. I think Fondor was expecting something after the skirmish with the Anakin Solo. Yes, that was provocative, but there's more. Jason's following at 2359 with part of the 4th Fleet and 150,000 troops. He's planning to isolate the orbital yards by mines and force a surrender, or so he says. The Imperial Remnant is backing him up. I'm sending you the data now. I'll update it when I can. What makes you think he might be lying? He's Jason. It's what he does. I don't believe he's stupid, either. Too few troops to take and hold both orbitals and planet. But a lot of capital ship firepower. My personal view is that he plans to draw the Fondorian forces out and then pound them so that the Imperials can move in. The thoughts were rolling out as she spoke. Ideas breeding. But he's not invincible. Is it a decoy attack? I've seen no other ship movements or troop deployments that even hint that he's going to stage a bigger operation elsewhere. Or a smaller one? I just don't know. But I'm going to spend the evening briefing a few captains to get my people out if this all goes to rot. Thanks, Admiral. You're welcome, Master Skywalker. Go ahead and ruin his day for me. And maybe my own people's day, too. I hope not. I really do. Neofel wandered down to the dining room and tried to work up some enthusiasm for the menu, but she had lost all desire to eat. She sat gazing in defocus at the fine linen and gold-rimmed Naboo porcelain plate and found that even the water she sipped stuck in her throat. She had been so certain that undermining Jason Solo was the right thing to do. But collateral damage could never be avoided. It was part of war. She sent beings into battle, and some didn't come back. But that was when she looked them in the eye, and more often than not stood on that same deck with them. She had never felt less worthy of the uniform in her life. Chapter 9 You've probably heard this before, but it's a trap. Luke Skywalker, to the president of Fondor, warning of mine-laying activity in Fondorian space. Brawlson, near Keldabe It's not hard to hate the Vong, Jaina said. She slipped off the pillion seat of the speeder bike and looked downhill hands shielding her eyes against the sun. The broad, shallow valley that sloped away from her 
was a patchwork of cultivated fields, woodland, ancient circular fortified homesteads, and a rash of small round roofs that marked new homes being built. But there were still huge swaths of dead land, poisoned by the Yuzhan Vong, where nothing grew. I don't try. Bevin unloaded the panniers and stacked armor plates. I have a good hate, and feel better for it. Better out than in, that's what I say. Did you bring me up here for the view? Jaina picked out Mandel Motor's tower in the distance, and an ungainly vessel tracking across the sky behind it. It was the tank-like thing that had given her a surprise when she entered Mandalorian space. There were two of them, in fact. She was intensely curious, partly because she had a feeling she might face one from the wrong side of a border one day, and partly because she was a pilot. It must have felt like flying a permacrete slab. Not really, Bevin said. But we won't have an audience, and it's a spot with its own history. Yeah, I do seem to draw a crowd in your barn. You should sell tickets. A lot of folks haven't seen a live Jedi before. That's not very reassuring. Just a figure of speech. Jaina followed Bevin to the top of the small hill, a gently rounded dome that flattened out into downs dotted with trees and bushes. The feel of the place made her nape bristle in the way that battlefields did, but many times magnified. It wasn't actually a feeling of dread, just a sense that terrible things had happened, but that it had somehow been triumphant, even oddly content in the end. Across the expanse of short spongy grass was an avenue of trees. She couldn't see what it led to, but it led to something. She felt it. Sacred site? she asked. Bevin bent over and took a few swings at the turf with his bescot. He looked as if he was digging for something. I can feel something happened here. A battle, maybe. Vongese. But no prizes for guessing that. He walked off to another patch of grass, scouting around for something. Ah, oh, look. They turn up all the time. Come over here. A skull seemed to have worked its way out of the soil. It wasn't Mandalorian. Jaina could tell from the odd ridges that ran from brow to crown on its one clean side that it had been a Yuzhan Vong soldier. But it still looked quite human far more human than the Yuzhan Vong had been in life, when they were so proud of the ritual facial mutilations that made them look utterly alien. Bevin squatted to pull the skull free. When he poked a finger into an empty eye socket, a pale yellow worm tumbled from the clinging soil and made a frantic squirming bid for safety on the ground. I think there were a few thousand of them. Bevin said, and this was a poor place to defend, but we took them on. You fought the Vongese, didn't you? You understand. He tilted the skull and picked off the soil still clinging to the right side, revealing a huge split over the orbital ridge. Ah, Nervode, we've already met. How have you been? Rotting, I hope. Bevin drew his saber and lined the blade up carefully with the split in the bone. It slotted into it neatly. Once Jaina had proved her worth in the workshop and worked until she dropped, Bevin had been the most gracious host imaginable, and she found it hard to square that avuncular charm with the man he could become when he picked up that best god. And that, he said, pointing to the avenue of trees, is Fen Shisa's memorial. Your mother knew him, and your Uncle Luke, too. Pay your respects, and we can get on with your lessons. It was a battered red and green helmet on a plinth. No inscription, no railings, nothing that indicated its owner had been a head of state, or even who was commemorated. Jaina was struck less now by the intimidating face that Mandalorians presented, 
than by their apparently anarchic society, and, despite the credits flooding in now from their Beskar mining and sales of the Besulik, grim rural poverty. Then she remembered little Bila, able to handle a tiny blaster at five years old, and old man Fett nearly taking her spleen apart with a gut punch, and decided that caution was still the best option. It was hard to know how to be reverent toward a helmet. She did what she would do at a state funeral, and simply bowed her head for a moment, as Jedi did. She so led us to kick out the Empire, Bevin said. Didn't you, Fenika? He walked up to the helmet and patted it fondly. A great Mandalore. But he always wanted Fett as the front man, and Fett wasn't having it. Shisa got his way in the end, though. Hey, do you want to record a hollow image for your mother? Some cultures would find that disrespectful. Ah, oh, we don't. Shisa would have loved it. If it was for Princess Leia... You could even have been a Mondo if your mama had said the word. And if she hadn't met the space bomb, of course. Bevin said it with a big grin. And it didn't sound like the insult it would have been in Fett's mouth. Why did Shisa think Fett should be Mandalore? Because his father was? Jaina didn't add that Fett didn't strike her as the community-minded kind. Bloodlines don't matter to you. True, but Django had a fearsomely good fighting reputation, and he was Jaster Muriel's chosen heir, so the Fett name has some power. When things were as rough as they were when the Republic fell, well, even we needed icons. You know that Shisa even got a clone deserter to pose as Django Fett's heir just to give the Aruetise the idea that we were solid again? Nobody really knew who or what was under the armor. Worked for a while. And then Fett ruined all their national solidarity by showing up as my grandfather's right-hand thug. Gina knew her own dynastic moral high ground wasn't all that farther above the waterline than Fett's. What happened to him? Shisa? Bevin winked. Or Vader? The deserter. Spar? Oh, Fett's daughter killed him. He was a good Fett double, all right. Too good. May he find peace in the Manda. Aelin hated her papa. That's tragic. Was Bevin joking? No, he wasn't. But why would any man put himself in harm's way for Fett? So there's Shisa. You'll have to ask Fett about that yourself. I'll put it on the list after I ask him about his not-dead wife. Jaina fought down a bitter anger that Sintas Vel was alive and Mara wasn't. I think Uncle Luke might advise him to seize that blessing. If his granddaughter tried to kill him, and his daughter even killed a man who looked like him, what do you think his ex-wife's going to do if she remembers who he is? Jaina didn't know what to say, but she thought of Jag and her parents and knew she had plenty that Fett didn't. He was too old and isolated even to hope to have it. But it gave her no sense of satisfied vengeance that her father's old enemy was so damaged. All she could feel was pity. Let's get on with it then, she said, wanting to forget a miserable story. She had enough of her own. There were surely more to come. Call me a Twi'lek dancing girl one more time, and I'll show you how mean they make us at the Academy. Bevin grinned and slipped on his helmet. Talk's cheap, Jedi. Get your plates on. The training armor wasn't custom-fitted, and the helmet was just a headguard, but it was Beskar. The worst injury she could get while sparring was bruising from impact. Bevin took out two metal sabers and handed her one, hilt first. Durasteel, he said, and so is this one, because we both want to see our grandchildren grow up. Come on. 
So you think I should try to face down my brother with a real saber? Jaina said, hefting it and testing the weight. No, I think you should learn a different technique, because you're predictable. Because Jedi all learn the same basic moves? Bevin demonstrated a few mock lightsaber passes. It's all long sweeps. Every part of the blade cuts, so you don't have to think about the angle. And it's light, so you don't put much weight into the blow. And you spend a lot of energy leaping around opponents, just trying to get past their defense. See what happens if you get used to a Beskod. It'll change how you handle that shiny stick. Jaina examined her Beskod. A blade forty-five centimeters long, maybe five or six centimeters wide, with a single cutting edge curving to a point, and much heavier than it looked, perhaps more than two kilos. The leather-bound grip with its plain guard and weighty pummel made it feel like a well-balanced hammer. No, more like an agricultural tool, meant for hacking down grain or undergrowth. She could see how easily it could embed itself in a Yuzhan Vong's skull. Jaina tested her balance to allow for the extra weight. Immediately she missed the reach of the lightsaber. Two-thirds of it, in fact. And she also found that she couldn't grip the saber two-handed. It made her feel suddenly exposed. Bevin just stood relaxed, tapping his blade against his thigh plate. If he'd been a Jedi, both of them would have adopted opening stances and begun the careful maneuvering to find the optimum moment and angle for the first strike. Bevin stood still for so long that Jaina found herself unable to stay back and began sidling up to him, not sure what to do with her left hand other than extend it for balance. As she swung the Beskot around in a horizontal arc into his chest, she felt the tip hit his plates. She was too far back, still thinking with a longer weapon, and he simply smashed his saber arm down on top of hers, brought his left fist up into her sternum, and punched her back a few paces. He followed through and flattened her simply by jumping on her. It was over in two seconds, and he hadn't even used his blade. Great start, Solo, she said. It was the first time she had been taken down in a saber fight of any kind for years. Bevin jumped to his feet and pulled her up. I can't be that stupid. Can I? The only point I'm making, Bevin said kindly, is that you know none of my moves. Yet. I made you come to me, and that led to a few mistakes. Next time anything goes, as long as we don't hit unarmored body parts. Ready? Ready. This time she just took a couple of steps back and slashed diagonally without squaring up. The blade rang on impact, painfully loud, and suddenly his best god was in his other hand. She couldn't get past his blocking move, and he ducked low to ram her with helmet and shoulder. Every time she got up, she ended up flat on her back again after a few thrusts and slashes. And yes, he used that left hand a lot. A follow-on punch, a one-two maneuver after a bone-shaking saber blow, kilos of dead metal slamming into her. The blade didn't even have to cut her. She was being hammered every time she was hit. All she could do was force sleep out of the way. Bevin was heavy, confident, and used his greater body weight as another weapon, as a battering ram. She couldn't find a way to get inside his reach that wasn't blocked by his free arm. Armor changed the game, making any limb both a shield and a weapon, and didn't leave her wrong-footed. Eventually, the only way she got in two consecutive blows and still stayed standing was to force-push him to compensate for her lack of weight and momentum. She knocked him down and pinned him with the force, panting. I wondered, when you do that, he said, equally breathless. You're taller and heavier than me. 
Not saying, you cheated. What have I learned? She knelt to one side, and he sat up. This is like nothing I've ever seen. You break every rule of close combat. Exactly. Bevin gripped the best cod by hilt and tip, holding it up to the light as he lay on his back. I use it like a hammer that also cuts when you pull it back, and you're expecting conventional blade techniques, and you're hampered by muscle memory. You've been so well trained that your body responds instantly without consulting your brain every time. Oh, we're even trained not to think, just to feel intuitively in the force. Jaina felt a little robbed. Hey, I'm teaching you how to kill Jedi. Smart guy. I already know. A Jedi taught me. Well, aren't you, Master Useful? Don't tell the galaxy. But Fett and me? We fought alongside a Jedi Master plenty of times in the Vongi's War. My enemy's enemy is my friend, right? My enemy's always my enemy. But we can both get smart and put that aside while we deal with a common threat. Jaina had to know. She kept thinking of the old man in armor, strong in the force, and whether anyone knew what he was. And am I your enemy, Goran? Bevin sat up, saber across his lap. I'm not Fett. First, I'll ask who you're fighting for. It's not the Mondo way to judge someone on their genetics. Fett's not like the rest of your people. I can see that even after a few days. No, he's a Fett. He's his own species. He stood up and changed the subject. So here you are a master at a very demanding martial art, and you've had your shebs kicked by an old scruff bag of a Mondo Merc, because you had no idea what I was likely to do, because you never fight that close in, and I was right up in your face, inside your reach, so all your parrying skills didn't help, because I don't use a saber like a saber. In a week, though, You'd end up killing me, because you'd get good at this. You're young, and you'd use the Force. And she wasn't likely to take a best god to hunt Jason. She tried to filter the welter of impressions from that morning, and leave only the lessons that brought her up short. If you met me in a real battle, would you kill me? Yes. Bevin didn't even pause. Sorry, and you'd better be able to look me in the eye and kill me, too. Jaina eased off her helmet and wiped her face on her sleeve. You're a nice man. I'd have to really think you were going to kill me before I went that far. So how the shab are you going to tackle your brother? Because it's going to be even harder to capture him than kill me. It always is. There's plenty of ways to kill someone without even going near them. Jaina didn't need a translation. Ah, well, he doesn't draw the line at hurting his own. Ask my cousin Ben. But could you look into his face and then cut his legs from under him with that lightsaber of yours? Because if you want to grab him, you're going to have to lure him into a trap or injure him so badly that you can get Beskar manacles on him. Bevin stood up and prodded her leg with his boot. And then what are you going to do with him? He kicked her casually again, this time in the base of the spine, just under the edge of the backplate. Put him in a Beskar cage for the rest of his life? I don't know, she said, getting annoyed with the kicks. He was trying to get some reaction, and she found herself automatically suppressing anger. Ow, cut it out! You think Jason will cut it out? Okay, point made. Ow! This time, the kick really hurt. 
she was on her feet in a heartbeat and ready to put the best god hilt deep in him. She shut the anger down right away. Sorry, I seldom lose my temper in a fight. You lot think that anger leads to the dark side, don't you? Yes. So how come you're taught to feel a fight and not think it? That's how we use the Force. It guides us if we surrender to it. Bevin mimicked a Twi'lek dancer's circling hips. That's dancing talk, Jedi. We still win a lot. Okay. Try it my way. Visualize your actions before you even draw the blade. Start to finish. Then just go at it and don't stop short. Not for anything. He took the blade from her and rummaged in the pannier of the speeder, pulling out two short wooden sticks. These won't hurt, so you can really, really go crazy with them. Okay? Learn to let go, and not to the Shabla force, to wanting to finish off your enemy. Hate, Jaina said, taking the club. It felt like a feather after the Beskod. No, not hate. Me or him. Total war. It sounded rote. It sounded like what she'd been warned to avoid from the time she first held a lightsaber. About Brila's age. Yes, I was. It was just another way of saying that you didn't give up when you got knocked down. It was resilience. Jaina stood a couple of meters back from Bevin, less self-conscious now and ready to give him a pounding. She couldn't kill him with this. Jaina lunged first, smashing Bevin as hard as she could, force unaided across shoulders, forearms, even his head when he dropped his guard. It was such a light stick. She drove him back, grunting with the sheer effort of putting all her weight into the blows and not feeling that they were making any impression. He didn't fight back. She ground to a halt, pulse pounding. Good try. Bevin sounded a little different. Now feel this. He came straight at her, stick raised with an animal explosion of breath. Instantly she felt him change in the force into complete lack of all emotion except a single... Word. Yes, almost a word. End. He closed in and rained blows on her like a machine. No style, no grace, no pause, until she fell back and he still kept hammering her while she lay in a ball and instinctively shielded her head. She wondered for a terrifying, irrational moment if he really was going to beat her to death with this small stick. Was he ever going to stop? There was no hatred in there, just a terrible focus. The rest of the world shut out. Then something flipped a switch in her, and she threw him back with the force, scared for both of them. When she finally uncoiled and looked up at him, he had his helmet in one hand, and his face was red. He felt embarrassed. She could sense it. There, he said getting his breath back. Just as well you did that. I'm not getting any younger. If I dropped dead after a Jedi hit me with a Shabla twig, I'd never live it down. You'd be dead anyway, Jaina laughed, not finding it funny, but on that edge between giggling and tears. So, I wouldn't stop in battle until I saw you were dead or completely out of action. Did that feel different to you? I lost it. If you'd had a saber... Yes, I can feel the difference. Can you get yourself into a state of mind where nothing but nothing will stop you? Not even your opponent screaming at you to stop? when all you can see is blood and stuff that'll give you nightmares? The silence that followed was the lesson, and she learned it. 
Bevin seemed quite disoriented by it. Food, he said, packing away the weapons and hauling her upright to take off her plates. Medred hates it when I keep the kids waiting for lunch. Jaina swung onto the saddle behind him and couldn't pin down what she felt. They skimmed over fences and hedges, catching strong scents of cut wood, manure, and wood smoke. Nerfs seemed to be watching suspiciously in every other field. Can we talk about what just happened? Scared you, did I? Scared me, too. Always does. You went nuts for a few minutes, and then you went sane again. And you can choose when? It's a technique. We start young. Well, that's a new one in meditative technique. First guy to die loses, huh? Pretty much. I don't see anything except the end of the fight. I don't even see a living being. I don't have any connection to the opponent at all. I just see something I have to remove, stop, get past any way I can, to get what I want, or die. Wow. Some fancy doctor said we can switch on psychopathy. Bevin banked the speeder bike so steeply that Jaina had to hang on with both hands and her knees. We all seem to have that trait, whether we inherit it or learn it. Maybe we even adopt kids who show it. I don't know. But we've been a fighting culture for so many centuries that we'll never really be sure. He started whistling to himself, a pretty tune whose rhythm Jaina couldn't work out because he kept breaking and picking up again. Jaina had heard of many cultures where the warriors stoked up their aggression with strange herbs and infusions before going into battle, but this berserker tactic was new. They seemed to visualize their way into psychopathy. Do I have to do that? This was the dark side. It truly was. Bevin could switch it on when he really needed it and then switch it off and become a man that anyone would welcome as a neighbor or uncle. Jaina wondered if this was how Jason started, with just a quick, desperate need to win, to survive, and then he fell to it a step at a time. It all sounded so reasonable. She couldn't hate her brother. She'd just seen how it could happen. But Bevin stopped. Jason hasn't. And if I can learn to do that, I'll have to learn to stop, too. And Bevin was just an ordinary human, with no force powers to exploit, just his hands and whatever mundane weapons he could use. You still held back anyway, he said suddenly. If I'd had force powers, I'd have used them, too. Tell me they're not telepaths, please. You have no idea, she said, how much you're teaching me. Medrit was standing at the table with his arms folded when they got back. Dinua, Jintar, and the two kids were chattering in Mandalorian, Mondoa, and seemed excited. The kids were instantly riveted when they saw Jaina. Ah! She's got a cut on her nose, Shalk gasped, fascinated. Wow! Loose helmet, Bevin said, washing his hands in the Duraplast bowl on the counter. And I'm going to be covered in bruises tomorrow. Fett can have her back before she does me some permanent damage. Medrit sliced the nerf joint with pretty impressive violence himself. You showed her you're no prisoners. Nasad Morchit, Shalk said. No prisoners. Jedi use reasonable force, said Bevin, with a small F. It's not good for them. Danua laughed. This was the one who had fought Yuzhan Vong at fourteen. She could afford to. The trouble with getting attached to Jedi, Buir, is that it's like making pets of the Nerfs and Nuna. 
really upsetting when you have to slaughter them. Everyone laughed. Jaina managed to as well. A little stung, but that was just their humor. Nothing personal. No worse than all the head-rolling jokes her father had made about Django Fett's demise. They ate heartily, totally at ease with her. If you ever get a force-using Mandalorian, she asked carefully, how would they be treated? They'd be in demand for getting stuck lids off cans, Medrit said, or improving crop yields. None of them reacted as if they knew what she was getting at. She was being eaten by her desperate curiosity faster than she was devouring the chunks of nerf and vegetables. Who are Venku and Gotab? Why that armor? Oh, Venku. Bevin put down his fork. Kodika. Nearest we have to a political agitator. He's the one who's been pushing the Mandalore First agenda for years. You know, let the galaxy find some other dumb mercenaries to die for it. We'll stay home, look after our own, strengthen the Mandalore sector, and laugh. And the armor? Tradition. Extreme version. We often wear a plate of a loved one's armor after they die. Sometimes during their lifetime, too. He wears his whole family. He's nuts, Jintar muttered. He's right, said Bevin. Yeah, he's right, as long as the new Beskar ore lasts. Fett listens to him, Jinnika. All families were alike at meals. Jaina's mind was now a blur of new and disorienting combat tactics, political argument, wondering if it was polite to grab an extra slice of nerf, and wanting to weep because she remembered Aunt Mara. And Gotab? she said casually. One of the Kiramorut wild men like Venku, Bevin said, rolling his eyes. Don't even ask what they do up there. They keep apart. They come and go, but they're there when we need them to fight, so no questions asked. Fair bit of fet clone blood up there, because the place was a haven for deserters during the war. Like Venku's dad, I assume. Now Fett says Gotab's a Kifar. He read the Heart of Firestone. Kifar. Sintas is Kifar, too. If only he knew. Can all Jedi do healing? Danua asked. Jaina shrugged. We can heal ourselves, but some Jedi are better than others at healing other people. You'd be so useful. Jaina had to put on the mental brakes to see what was happening. Mandalorians were compulsive adopters, and not just of kids. They seemed to want to collect skills, qualities, technology, any advantage that wasn't nailed down. And it was all too easy to let them. Maybe that was how Gotab had found himself stranded here in a metal suit. So, she was piecing it together now. What happened to the Jedi you fought with in the Vong War? Kubari it, Medrit said, looking sad for a moment. He's dead. I wonder how many folks know even now that we fought secretly for the New Republic. I know, Jaina said. And I'm very sorry that you never got any help from Coruscant after the war. I'm not. It means we don't owe you Nos. So Gotab wasn't Kubariot. There was something in his Force presence that stuck in her mind. It wasn't the resentment and suspicion, which was odd enough in a Jedi, but the... the... It was like identifying a few bars of a tune, familiar enough to recreate the whole song, but just out of reach of memory. Healing. Gotab could heal. She saw it now. He had that same force impression of quiet weariness, of being a buffer against adversity that she'd encountered in other healers. That just intrigued her more, but she wasn't here to be fascinated. 
she was here to improve her chances of arresting her brother and stopping his self-destructive galaxy-destroying descent into total darkness. She stuck her fork in the last slice of nerf on the serving plate, something she would never do at home. Be a different Jaina. She could. Imperial Destroyer Bloodfin, Imperial Dockyard Ravelin. So, Admiral, said the executive officer, you approve? Pelion surveyed the new destroyer's bridge, a tableau of definitive standards frozen in a moment of paint-scented perfection. She's splendid, he said. I still have misgivings about using the best tableware when we have such rough company for dinner, so to speak. But she can't remain a decoration. He wandered into the holochart. The projection was big enough to stand within. He had his doubts about that refinement, too, because he didn't feel it gave him the best theater overview to fight the ship. But he could always use one of the bridge repeaters. That was more his scale. Let's try the comm system, shall we? Get me Admiral Neothel. Very good, sir. Chani Athel should have contacted him by now, if only to vent her spleen. His sources, old friends and comrades simply staying in touch, never spies, said that there was now a bigger war going on between Neothel and Solo than there was on the front line. She'd be looking for an ally. Well, there was only room for one backside on that big chair. What did they expect from power-sharing? If Neothel had any sense, she'd be looking for a triumvirate. Pelion had sense, and he wasn't sure he'd want to make up the numbers. Gil, said Neothel's voice. He turned and smiled at the holoscreen. She looked tired. Moon Cal's eyes were indicators of their fatigue. Hers were dull and had lost their shine. How are you, Cha? Has the boy left you in charge? We all miss your humor greatly. So this is Bloodfin. Indeed. Turbulent class. Smaller and more agile. I thought I'd give you the holographic tour. Actually, I'm glad you made contact. Much as I'd love to scrutinize Bloodfin, could we discuss a confidential personnel matter? Pelion gestured to the XO to indicate he was moving to his day cabin to continue the conversation. Hatch closed behind him. He diverted the link. Go ahead, Shaw. By all means, say I told you so. Ah, Jason. Very well, I did mention it. But let's move on. In a few days we'll be committing ships and troops to Fondor. If there's anything you want to tell me, now would be a good time. He's prepping to mine Fondor's approaches and cut off the orbitals in a few hours. And he's talking about a first assault phase within a week. Has he discussed his detailed plan with you? He tells me he's getting underway at 2359 Coruscant time, which is, let's see, three standard hours time. Isolate the planet, secure the shipyards, then move on to the planet itself. Define move on. He expects a surrender, he says. Do you? No, I think he'll have to occupy it. And first, he has to take the capital. I estimate he has enough troops to take the orbitals, and that's all. So level with me, Gil, because I don't trust Jason to value my crew's lives now. Has he offered the Imperials Fondor? Are you planning to occupy it? Pelion didn't have a yes or no answer to that. And I thought about it, and we might have to, wouldn't help. He has made no such offer, he said, nor hinted. He may want us to interpret his silence on the matter, 
as a hint that it might be on the table, to ensure our attendance, but unless he has some elaborate plan for troop deployment that he hasn't shared with me, then once his troops are committed to the shipyards, the only forces left to land on Fondor are mine. In which case, he's left the doors open for us to rob him. You're very honest. I'm too old to want glory. At my age, you worry more about what might be said about you after you're dead. I'd like to be recalled as an admiral who left the galaxy a little tidier and quieter than he found it. Meaning? Is he going to foul up? Neafel looked down at the floor for a moment. You know he's a Sith. Force users do complicate things for us ordinary mortals. I think he might overplay his hand this time. But I might also not be aware of some second plan he's going to put into operation and leave us all standing. You want me to do something? I'm just sharing my fears that this may well be very costly in terms of lives, and that Jason can be extravagant. I have elements of the Third Fleet standing by for Fondor. I'm thinking more of enabling withdrawal than pouring personnel into a battle. Ah. Pelion sat back and felt a little cheated. You want me to stay at home? No, I was genuinely expressing concern and seeking information. Would you prefer not to join him? I know some of the Moffs are more expansionist than you. If I were to say that I wouldn't shed tears if Jason were to crash and burn, in any sense, and that I would accept responsibility for cleaning up the mess he's left, would that answer your questions? So you'll wait for his next big mistake and go in for the kill. If I felt it stabilized the galaxy. Pelion didn't think it was the time to explain that he doubted the GA's ability to hold down the job with or without Jason, given that it had enabled Jason to thrive. Neafel probably knew that anyway. But one thing I'll promise you is that I have a line I will not cross. And while the Moffs and I might be pursuing the same course at this moment, we don't all share one ideology. Stiff upper lip and do the decent thing. Yes, if you want to put it that way. I'll join you in that. Pelion now knew how she felt, but not what she might do. Let's hope for a better outcome. Indeed. I'll be in touch. Pelion closed the link and sat chewing over Neafel's words for a while, wondering how much worse Jason might become if Neafel were taken out of the picture for any reason. She seemed still to be a break on Jason, no small measure of her own strength, and Pelion could do business with her. The imperial interest is served by supporting her. Keeping moderates in power is a lot cheaper all round than battling down despots every few years. If push came to shove at Fondor, and the Athel was salvageable, then Jason might find himself alone. How much support did Solo have from his officers and in the ranks after the Tebut incident? That would be the critical factor. Sith, Jedi, or God, he was still one man. Pelion got up and walked the passages and flats of Bloodfin, noting where fitters were still sealing covers on conduits and engineering droids were busy in shafts. Sir? Sir? The junior officer of the deck, Lieutenant Lambert on the current watch, strode as fast as he could without committing the sin of actually breaking into a run. Sir, security has a visitor at the brow asking for you, but she's reluctant to present ID. Any cause for concern? Armed? Jealous? Blonde or redhead? The officers laughed politely. 
seeming to think Pelion was joking about his eye for an attractive female, undimmed even now. He couldn't have known that the blonde, Tahiri, was not someone he wanted on board, however charming, because she was Jason Solo's creature, and almost certainly not as sweet as she looked, or that the redhead was probably someone he was very anxious to see indeed. The OOD let out another nervous laugh. Good call, sir. The lady has red hair. Pelion tugged his cuffs to smooth his sleeves and walked aft toward the brow, a renewed man. Then I shall welcome her on board personally. Have the steward droid serve Tizan in my day cabin. Perhaps some confit and a decanter of seer spirit, too. Very good, sir. There was always a heady sense of optimism in a new ship, and Pelion could feel it. Junior ratings pressed flat against bulkheads to let him pass, even though there was quite enough room to walk by. He liked smaller ships. There was something tight and purposeful about them. The difference between a vessel with a starship's lines and what might as well have been an office tower. The ship's complement was small enough to get to know all hands properly. This was a ship he wanted to fight, a real warship, just for the exhilaration of being closer to the vibration, noise, and sheer mechanical life of a great fighting beast. Pelion paused a moment before turning into the passage to face the hatch, and ran his forefinger over his mustache. It had been a long time. He took a breath and walked out to the brow. By now, a small knot of engineering ratings had gathered and were taking an excessive time to check hatch status lights while they stared at a woman who had been walking the decks before any of them were born. "'You haven't changed one bit,' Pelion said, gesturing her on board with a sweep of his arm. "'It's good to see you again, Admiral Dalla.' Anakin Solo, Fondorian Space, Tapani Sector, 0500 GST When the Star Destroyer jumped out of the calm silence of hyperspace, Kytus knew that something had not gone precisely to plan. Battles never do, so we adapt the plan. The calm boards and screens on the bridge burst into new life with restored connections. Officers and senior rates caught up with signals and sit-reps delayed by five hours. Kytus felt the mood change on the bridge in the ten paces it took him to reach the status screens, and it wasn't generated by fear of him. The crew's attention and growing dismay was fixed on the updating status reports. They hunched over scanners and monitor. Kytus walked to the viewport and looked into the starfield seeking out the disk of Fondor in the foreground. At this distance, it looked as if nothing was happening. Sir, we can't contact the mine layers. Titus glanced over the shoulder of the nearest sensor operator to check the holochart image built up from the real-time scan. There was no sign of the five mine layers. They were supposed to disgorge their clouds of vigilante mines and pull back to beyond Fondorian space to the RV coordinates. The Anakin Solo should have dropped out of hyperspace right on top of them. Tahiri hovered at his elbow. He reached into the force and felt the usual background disturbances of wars. There was fear, anger, danger, destruction, faint echoes of explosions, the same mix of collective emotions and aftermaths that he could sense any day, any hour, if he stopped to think about it. A Force user's ability to sense danger and concealed weapons was a wonderful asset in a Coruscant tap-calf or a strange city, but it was next to useless on a battlefield. Everything was danger and instruments of death. Kytus was a few hundred thousand kilometers off a planet that built warships and was on a high state of alert. Sir... Fleet Ops says they had last contact with the mine layers before the jump to hyperspace. The lieutenant at the electronic warfare station 
didn't dare blink as he met Kytus's eyes. He radiated anxiety, and this time it was personal. Then nothing. Not even an emergency beacon. If they'd returned to Coruscant, they'd be back in port by now. The stealth mine layers were small vessels with disproportionately powerful drives to enable them to punch in and out of hyperspace close to their target zones. The aim was to spend as little time as possible in real space to avoid detection, drop the surprise on the enemy's doorstep, and jump back into hyperspace. With self-deploying networked mines that needed no conventional laying, it should have been a hit and run. Let me talk to them. Kytus, still only mildly concerned, took over the comlink to ops and called up the data flooding in from them with a movement of his forefinger. It disgorged a shimmering list of blue text with times and coordinates of passive position checks of the whole task force, including the outbound mine layers. Ops, what happened? Colonel Solo, we should have had confirmation of the mine layer's position and intended movement by now if they completed their mission. We wouldn't have pinged them at the Fondor end as long as they were on stealth mode, obviously. There was a brief pause. While the ops room commander seemed to be taking a deep breath, Kytus felt a welling of dread around him, as if the crew had seen something he hadn't. I know this might sound obvious, sir, and I apologize for asking, but can you detect any mines in position? Kytus switched back mentally to the ordinary world of the measurable and the detectable. Nobody on the bridge said a word. Yes, they had seen something tangible. Your fault, Lumia. You nagged me to stop relying on my mundane senses— I used to check scanners first and the force second. What happened to my intellect? Sir, there's no signal from the mine net for us to activate it, so they never left the hold. And this is the medium-range scan of Fondorian space out to Nelastia. The lieutenant switched display modes so Kytus could see it not in columns of numbers, but in color-enhanced density and temperature mapping. Fondor appeared as a patchy disk of temperature graduation, with the orbitals passing across its face picked out as more regularly patterned bars, the side-on view of flattened arrowhead-shaped shipyards. But beyond the limb of the planet, the enhanced image showed distinct patches like miniature nebulae. When the lieutenant zoomed in to show Kytus a finer resolution, the patches resolved into concentric rings showing particle density and tiny temperature variations in space. What am I looking at? Kytus asked, knowing perfectly well, but needing to hear it, because he wanted to be wrong for once. The rest of the bridge seemed to recede from his field of view. The scanners and sensors in front of him were all he could see. He was angry, getting angrier, but it was silent and smoldering. The residual traces of an explosion, sir. The spectrometer analysis of the particle cloud shows it matches the material used for the non-Vidior class mine layers. The man swallowed. He was new. Tebut's replacement. The database, sir. We have a materials database to aid rescue and recovery missions, so we can tell which ships have been— All Kytus could hear— was the faint machine chatter of the bridge instruments, and the quiet throb of drives and generators that was as reassuring as a heartbeat to the crew. He felt they were expecting an explosion from him, too, but that would have been weakness. He felt that they were as shocked and angry as he was. How many are there? Loxin? he asked reading the man's name tab. I see three. I'd have to get us line of sight with the other side of Fondor to be sure, but there may well be two more debris clouds out of vision. Just so you know, I'm treble-checking. Three of the jump-exit coordinates 
Match the three areas of debris. Bridge to flight commander, Kaida said. Flight. Get an X-wing out core side of the planet and confirm debris fields and coordinates, please. The response filled the silent bridge over the ship-wide comm, even though the flight commander was a soft-spoken woman. Very good, sir. Thank you, flight. Now, someone tell me what's happening on Fondor. What are they saying? Any HNE news feeds? Diplomatic protests? Nothing from the Chief of State's office, sir. Yes. Get me Neothel. She's been sitting around with full comms for at least five hours, so she should be updating us. Should she not? The bridge started coming back to life. The buzz of normal working conversation rose from whispers to normal volume. Sir, absolutely no mention of any incidents on HNE. GA External Relations says no diplomatic contact, official or unofficial, sir. GAG Monitoring says their agents are reporting a continued high state of alert on Fondor, and a lot of military traffic between the surface and orbitals. But that's been steady for several months. They'd been waiting for the GA to kick them back into line. It was only a matter of when. Tahiri, who'd been watching Kytus with the expression of someone waiting for a live detonator to blow, edged up to him. The mine layers were intercepted as soon as they dropped then. They didn't even get a chance to disperse. Correct, Lieutenant Vela. Subject to the findings on the two ships unaccounted for. A hundred crew, yes? Complement of twenty per ship? Yes. The size and spread profile of the debris particles indicated massive explosions, as Kytus would have expected with mine-laden ships taking direct hits. The end was at least mercifully instant. I still care about my people. I'm not a monster. Betrayed. Fondor knew we were coming. Lieutenant, Fondor knew we were coming for weeks. But they knew where and when we were arriving. Kytus walked the width of the bridge and let his gaze fall on crew at random. All hand-picked, screened for loyalty and the right attitude, and little opportunity to spy for Fondor this time. He felt no treachery. He really didn't. If the leak wasn't in this ship, the specific location could only have come from Fleet HQ, comms, or someone directly in touch with the mine layer's crews after they received their orders. And there had been very little time for that information to percolate through the system. It wasn't enough for someone to tip Fondor off that mine layers were coming. They'd had completely accurate coordinates that enabled them to destroy all the mine layers the instant they emerged into real space. Fondorian patrols, even if they got very lucky, wouldn't have been waiting close to the precise points. Ship's Company, Kytus said quietly. We have, at best, a criminally careless fool in the fleet, and at worst, a traitor. Luxon turned to him. Sir, we're continuing with the mission, are we? We are, said Kytus. We're not turning tail and slinking home, just because we haven't established a cordon. Battle plans always change. This is a setback, nothing more. I'll be in my day cabin. Let me know when you get Admiral Neothel. And if Admiral Pelion makes contact, tell him nothing and patch him straight through. Let's not alarm the moths, shall we? Kytus stood in his cabin and wondered how he had managed not to vent his anger. 
he started working mentally through the sequence from deciding the hyperspace exit points to the mine layers actually emerging, and whose eyes had seen the detail. He thought of Flo walking back into the op center and listening, but it was effort he wasn't prepared to expend when he had a short list of fools, no, traitors, and an invasion to replan. He caught his own reflection in a mirror as he sat down, and suddenly realized why the young lieutenant on the bridge couldn't look away from his gaze. Kytus's eyes were yellow. He had that brief, disoriented moment when he thought he was looking at someone else. But then his own face, his own eyes, grew rapidly familiar. And he watched the citrine yellow darken into his normal brown irises. Then he sat down and began work with the holochart, and a new but equally harsh plan for Fondor. Chapter 10 Yes, I regret that we did hear Mara Jade Skywalker threaten Chief of State Solo. She told him to leave Ben out of it, and that she would skin him alive, and that it was his last chance to drop something called Sif, or take what was coming. It seemed most unlike her. Senator Nob Haas, Bith Delegation, to Captain Lon Shevu, G.A.G., logging threats against Joint Chiefs of State Solo and Neothel. Freighter Spirit of Commerce, en route for Endor, Cargo Bay. Ben Skywalker reached inside his jacket to touch the small forensics droid again, avoiding the eye of the flight engineer. He wasn't in the mood to chat. But the two freighter crew were bored out of their skulls and seemed to preserve their sanity by interrogating any ad hoc passengers. Ben was the only one hitching a ride this trip, huddled in a space between giant sealed containers lashed down to the deck of the cargo bay. He settled on looking angst-ridden and teenaged. I can only drop you at the trading base. You know that, don't you? Ben looked up. The uncommunicative teenager act didn't work any longer. He was tall, showing the first fluffy traces of beard, and he was suddenly aware that nobody had called him kid in passing these days. He must have looked as old as he now felt. I know, he said. Thanks. Have you actually been to Endor before? Ah, the engineer was worried for him. Yes, I know folks there. Someone's meeting me. Just checking. I wouldn't want to dump my worst enemy in that place. Ewoks. Savages. I'd shoot them all, to be honest. Some of my friends are Ewoks, Ben said mildly, not wanting a fight, but unable to let it pass. And I feel safer in the forest than I do in Galactic City. No offense. None taken. The engineer walked away slowly gripping hand over hand along the deckhead rail to pick his way between the tanks and containers that would be filled with plants and fungus for the pharmaceutical industry on the return journey. Coruscant. Yeah, I know what you mean. If it's not the lowlifes and gangsters, it's the secret police. And some of my best friends are secret police. They truly are. But Ben kept his mouth shut this time. It was the last leg of a tortuous route back to the Jedi base, and in a couple of hours he'd be safely among family and friends. And so would the forensics droid, still holding its samples from Jason's stealth X in its sealed compartments. It was encased in flexorap, just in case. Ben felt it was his last tenuous link to resolution and some kind of peace. Where do I start with Dad? Have I got all the evidence I need? And when, how, do I tell him that Mom came back to see me? Out of all the things that plagued Ben in his quiet moments, when there was no distraction to stop him picking over events until they were just jumbled bones, that one was the most frequent. 
It was a privilege he was pretty sure Luke hadn't been given. And it made Ben more uncomfortable as the days passed. Why just me? He'd become less accepting of mysteries and the will of the Force, since he'd lived in Lon Shevu's world of show me and prove it. He wanted to know why these days, ninety-nine times out of a hundred, and maybe every time from now on. The spirit of commerce sat down in a clearing a few hundred meters from the trading post buildings. Ben did diplomatic handshaking and promised to use the service again sometime. He walked through saplings trying to reclaim the cleared land for the forest, bag over one shoulder, aware of eyes everywhere in the undergrowth and above him in the branches, and found himself thinking tactical thoughts about what a tough planet this would be to invade and occupy. Luke was already waiting for him. His father sat on a sawn-off stump as big as one of the huge circular park seats in the Sky Dome Botanical Gardens at home, wearing his flight suit. Home. What did that mean? Dad. Ben had no problem throwing his arms around his father now and crushing him to his chest. He couldn't remember why he'd felt awkward about it even a year ago. Grown men in the G.A.G., the toughest guys he knew, hugged and cried, and didn't care what they looked like doing it. I can't tell you how glad I am to get back. You look whacked. Been busy. He'd tell me if Mom had appeared to him, wouldn't he? Ben prodded Luke's flight suit, trying to get the banter going. Been putting in flying hours, then? Worried about skills, Fade? Going to be putting in more, Ben. What did I miss? Jason's lined up to take Fondor. And we've put one Hydra spanner in his works, and we're going to add a few more. Oh, and Han and Leia are still scouting for a new base. Luke started walking to a rank of parked swoop bikes in various stages of decay. None of them gave a hint that the Jedi fighting elite was holed up here. He half turned as he walked, gesturing to his chest. You taken up smash ball? You nearly broke my ribs with whatever's in your jacket. It was as good a time as any. It's a CSF remote forensics droid. It's evidence. Luke swung his leg across the saddle of the first bike in the line. Ben climbed up behind him. My son the soldier, now my son the cop. Did you find anything? Your expression says you did. Yes, I did. The bike shot off. Plenty. Luke twisted his head to look at Ben, and— Hey, eyes forward, Dad! The swoop swerved and straightened again. Look, I'm not the jury or the judge. Remember that I wanted to kill Jason on the spot? You stopped me, and I learned a big lesson. I'm just the detective, the prosecution. When I show you what I gathered, and Uncle Han and Aunt Leia, too, then you decide. The swoop whipped through thin branches, and Ben ducked his head this way and that to avoid a smack in the face. Dad seemed to relive his wild rebel youth whenever he got on a bike. So I'll lay out the case as objectively as I can. I've shown you the force-hiding trick, and you know Jason couldn't have found me on cabin by chance. But that's not enough on its own. I'm laying out supporting evidence and anything else I've found that's relevant, whether it supports my theory or not. Like Lan Shevu taught me, I want to know the truth, even if I don't like it. Luke didn't reply, but his shoulders lifted as if he'd shrugged, and Ben heard him gulp a breath. He didn't look over his shoulder this time. Ben? Yeah? Ben? Staying, he was crying. Ben, you make me so proud. You know that? You're so... decent. Hey, come on. Come on. Ben patted his back. 
doing the right thing isn't something special. It's the minimum. It's where we start each morning, not where we try to end up one day in the future. You taught me that. Luke started to say something, but just shook his head and steered straight and more slowly. You asked me a question when you first joined the guard. Dad was getting too serious. How to fasten my boots? Which end of the blaster I had to hold? Hey, I was just a kid then. Luke managed a snort of laughter, the kind that could have tipped over too easily into a sob. A rhetorical question, I think. How many people I killed when I fought the Empire? Oh, that. And I said, But they were all... And then I had to stop because I hadn't thought about it before as much as I should have. I should never have said, but. Dad, if you slow down any more, we're going to stall. Okay. Sorry. Luke landed the swoop, and they sat in knee-high spiky grass, listening to the ticking of the cooling drive and the chorus of forest noises from animals they couldn't see. Ben laid his hand on his lightsaber just in case. He didn't feel quite as safe in the wilds as he'd thought. And you were right. Most of them were just ordinary troopers or ship's crew, who maybe didn't like the Empire very much, but had to earn a living, or couldn't say no. They weren't all imperial fanatics set on galactic oppression. They were just people. And I was nineteen and I probably felt deep down that if they weren't as ready to resist Palpatine as I was, then they had to be cowards, or evil, or something that made them unlike me, made them worth less than me. Luke swiveled as far as he could in the saddle to face Ben. I hadn't a clue about the politics, Ben. It wasn't really a cause I thought hard about. I just felt I had to save someone in trouble, so... Yes, I killed a lot of people I wish I hadn't. And their lives weren't cheap or meaningless. And now, five crews are dead because I let Fondor know too much. And I feel terrible about that, too. Ben hadn't been expecting to unleash the floodgates. While a hug and tears didn't feel soppy or embarrassing now, Complete bearing of souls was another matter. He didn't realize Luke had taken the comet to heart and fretted over it. He was mortified. He'd burdened his father at a time when it was the last thing he needed. He should have kept it to himself. I don't know what to say, Dad. You were everything to your mom. Luke just sat there nodded as if he'd answered a question Ben hadn't heard, and started up the swoop bike again. They lifted clear of the grass and shot off. Rightly so. It had to be now. Ben had to say it, but it would have been better to look into Dad's face than to stare at the back of his head. I saw Mom on Cavan. I mean, I saw her. Not like thinking you see someone in a crowd. She was a force ghost. She spoke to me. Luke's knuckles were white as he gripped the steering vanes. What did she say? She said she loved me. Yeah, she would. What did you say to her? Same. You feel any easier now? Go on. If you can't be totally open with your father now, when can you be? Have you seen her, Dad? I didn't want to say in case you felt... ignored. No, that's the wrong word. No, I haven't seen her. But that's okay. The Force gives us what we need. I've learned that. Luke didn't say anything else. Ben struggled not to think of Jason because all he could do was rage silently. How could he have done this to Dad? How could he have made him suffer so much? 
if Jason had wanted to destroy Luke Skywalker. Killing Mom was the way. It was worse than killing Luke himself. And Dad knew that. And yet he didn't let it finish him or change what he believed in. So Ben drew strength and example from that. And when he had these backsliding moments of angry, chest-crushing grief, as he probably always would, he reminded himself that this was why Dad always knew what was right, and why Jason either didn't know or didn't care. It was that start of the fork in the road, one atom's deviation that became two and then four and then diverged into different roads and then to different worlds. It was that baseline of right that Ben and Luke had just talked about. It was every new moment when you had to ask, Is the next thing I'm going to do right, or is it wrong? It was a hair's width of a gap, and yet repeated with each breath, in each being, it became a chasm wide enough to swallow a galaxy. I don't know why Jason did it. I don't even have one hundred percent proof. No point getting more upset about motive. Stay objective. Stay with the facts. Luke headed into the approach to the old Imperial outpost. Ben could now see two stealth X's being towed into launch positions and milling activity through the screen of trees and vines. Loyal ground crew who had abandoned everything they had on Coruscant to keep the Jedi Squadron operational. Droids, pilots, stewards, even the occasional Ewok party ferrying rustic packing crates out of sight. Ben walked around the landing gear of the nearest Stealth X and rehearsed how he'd recount the mission with Shevu to his father. We voted to evacuate to a less accessible planet, Luke said, depending on how Fondor goes. More remote than Endor? That'll take some doing. Less findable. The mists. Han and Leia really know how to pick a hideaway. Good move. How much time do I have to collate my evidence before we deploy to Fondor, then? Jag was wandering in their direction, hands thrust deep in his pockets. Ben patted his jacket. I don't want to have to take the forensics droid around with me, just in case— Losing evidence is, you're not coming on the Fondor mission, Ben. Usually, or at least until recently, Ben would have launched into an argument about why he wouldn't stay behind and how much Luke needed him, because he didn't want to miss anything. Now he had just felt a pang of alarm at yet another separation from his father, but his gut said, do what he needs you to do. He listened. Okay, Dad. Luke waited a moment, and then smiled, as if he'd been expecting the wrangling to start, too. I'm not cosseting you. You know that. This is for operational reasons, not protecting the boss's son. Understood. What do you want me to do while you're gone? And you're coming back. Have you an estimate of how long you're committing the stealth exes? I want you to plan the evacuation so that we're ready to hit the button and go at a moment's notice. I'm leaving at least half the Jedi pilots here, too. Relocation, Ben said. He'd never planned and executed anything like that before. With the ancillary staff, there were nearly a thousand beings and droids to move, plus equipment. He'd make sure he learned fast. We're not running from anyone. I'm glad you're not daunted by the task. It's common sense, Dad. You've got plenty. Luke patted his shoulders with both hands. And you're a moral compass. If some of us don't come back, I want someone around who'll keep asking hard questions and saying, should we do that? Is that right? And who won't quit unless he gets answers. Ben hadn't seen himself in that light. He was the methodical one, the problem-solver, the one who unpicked an issue, looked at the components, and tried to rebuild it better. 
Logistics. He knew he could do that. But moral certainty? Jason probably had his, too. I got this far on how Mom and Dad raised me. I'll deal with that as it comes. He focused on his task, and not the fact that the maintenance crews were running up the stealth X-Drive. Now, Dad? Right now? I waited until you came back. It's okay. The rest of the flight should be at Fondor by now. What are you planning, Dad? The usual. Help Jason see the error of his ways. Okay. If he wanted to play cryptic, Ben could handle that. A tech jogged up to Luke and handed him his helmet, which somehow made it all much more imminent and final. And Jason's enlisted the support of the Imperial Remnant. Luke finished. Admiral Pelion? Wow. I'm not sure if that's good news or bad. Yes. I hope everyone's moral compass is working. Ben found himself doing what GAG troops did before an operation kicked off. He locked down the inevitable dread and let his mouth take over, laying a veneer of grim jokes over the anxiety to keep it from being seen. Don't get killed, Dad. You know what it did to Fett. I don't want to end up like him. Filthy rich? No, polishing my dad's old ship and hassling Uncle Han. It's okay. Jaina can get you a good deal on property in Keldabe. I mean it, Dad. So do I. Now go and stop worrying, or I swear I'll come back as a force ghost and bug you while you're on a date. Ben winced inside. Love you, Dad. You too, Ben. Ben followed orders and didn't look back, but it hurt. Having Jag's grim face to focus on was a big help. The two of them walked on a collision course across the compound and ended up almost nose to nose. You're grounded too, then, Ben said. Never mind. Jag looked a little frayed. I love being rear party. I live to stand around waiting for the comm to buzz. Have you heard from Jaina? Because I haven't. No, but it's only been a week or so. Ben had been too tied up to think too much about Jaina. He added that to his list of things to feel bad about. She got there okay, didn't she? I got a pre-composed arrived safely alert, yes. Jag, if she'd had problems... Aunt Leia would feel it. Maybe Fetz sold her off to the highest bidder. She can look after herself. What if she... We'd know. We'd feel it. Jag parted his lips, as if he was going to expand on it, but stopped. Okay. I'll rely on you to tell me if you feel anything. Sometimes, even with his closest friends... Even though he worked so closely with guys like Shevu, Ben forgot he had senses that Jag didn't. At times like this, that must have frustrated Jag. I'm going to draw up an evacuation plan. How come you suddenly got older than me, Ben? Never underestimate the calming power of a list. It was a Shevuism. Shevu was full of common-sense one-liners, that were easy to digest and apply. Can you get all the senior personnel together for me? I've got something I have to do now, but we ought to make a start on scoping the size of the airlift and putting deadlines and names on tasks. Jag just looked at him. Then he broke into a big, surprised grin. Ben! You're middle-aged! Captain Sensible! Overnight! I still reserve the right to revert to being a goofy kid and not tidy my room when the pressure's off. Jag seemed to forget his black mood about Jaina's absence for a while. I'll get your meeting set up, my lord. Ben walked on a few paces before it struck him that he'd just slipped automatically into the organizing, order-giving role that his dad often did. Because dad never doubted I could do it. 
That was the kind of confidence his father could instill in him. But he still had a task to complete first. Back in his quarters, he washed down all the surfaces with Stericlean, then laid out clean flimsy sheets to cover the table so we could open the droid's sphere. Did a sterile area matter? The instruments and sensors had already analyzed what they needed, so contamination wasn't an issue. He had the readouts on his datapad. He knew the chemical composition of every trace the droid had collected. But he felt he had to show some respect. It was the only word he could think of for the procedure, and set the sphere down with a degree of reverence. It held destinies. Hair. Ben needed a hair from his mother's brush. It was all he had to do to confirm that the hair collected from the stealth X was hers. Grubbing around in his father's quarters felt like an intrusion. Luke kept the brush, a utilitarian gray plastial thing with bristles extruded from the material, in a box with a few trinkets and other personal effects he'd grabbed from the bedroom. And Ben suddenly found himself worrying about the apartment, and if it had been left intact. His mother's clothes and possessions were still there. He didn't care about his own. He just couldn't bear to think of Jason's bureaucrats clearing out the place or even touching anything personal. It's just stuff. Forget it. Shrines are unhealthy. You know Mom's okay where she is. You've seen her. Just thinking that lifted his spirits more than he would ever have believed possible. I know. I really know. Jedi suddenly seemed the luckiest beings in the galaxy. Ordinary beings never knew for sure what happened after death. Many sentient species believed in some existence when the body was no more, and some didn't. But only Jedi had the absolute proof of what happened to them. At least some, anyway. There were all kinds of priests and mystics who claimed they could put grieving families in touch with their loved ones in some afterlife, and maybe they could, but only Jedi knew and could prove it. It seemed both a breathtaking comfort and privilege, and also sadly unfair for everyone else. Certainty. There was so little of it in life. But Ben had his. Apart from the brush, its bristles tangled with a few long, curled, copper, red, and white hairs, there were two rings, a data chip, family hollow images, Ben decided, and a platinum locket. Inside was a tiny, meticulously folded flimsy sheet. When he smoothed it out on his knee, it showed signs of having once been crumpled. His mother's writing was on it. Gone hunting for a few days. Don't be mad at me, farm boy. Ben stared at it, imagining her hand moving across the surface, and put it back in the locket. He took the whole box back to his quarters and laid out the brush on the flimsy to tease out a hair with a pair of forceps. It was just a matter of inserting the hair into a small slot in the casing of the droid and letting the mechanism remove a section to process it. It took a minute or so. Ben waited. The droid flashed indicator lights and transmitted the analysis to his data pad. Positive match. That was it, then. All over. Once he cracked the security seal on the droid, the sterile environment inside was compromised, and if he played by the Justice Department and CSF rules of evidence, anything else tested by the same droid would not be admissible as evidence. If he wanted to test more material after that, he'd have to sign out a new unit, sealed and authenticated. No, that's it, my friend, he said, and overrode the contamination warnings. I just want the hair. The droid was tiny, and its internal mechanisms were like some intricate chronomaker's art. Ben had to use the forceps to extract the sealed chamber with an almost invisible length of his mother's hair inside.
instead of being the glossy, coiled lock he had somehow imagined, which was crazy. There was no room for something that big, even if it had been lying around in Jason's cockpit. It was a single hair. Ben had a brush full of them, but somehow this one mattered. He wanted to keep it. He wound the hair around his finger into a ring shape and shut it in the locket with the flimsy note. He'd tell Dad he had it when the squadron returned from Fondor. Dumb thing for a guy to carry around, but I want to. While Ben was copying the data to another pad for collation into a report, he checked his encrypted messages. Shevu had sent an update. Ben, this might upset you, but you need to see it. I spoke to two Bith senators. They witnessed an argument between your mother and J.S. shortly before she left Coruscant for Hapes. Ben opened the file anyway, feeling immune to whatever might leap out at him. So, Mom had bawled out Jason in front of witnesses. She'd even accused him of being Sith and threatened him. But Shevu knew him well enough to know what would sting. It was over me. It was all over me. Oh, no. Mom, I was never worth that. It's too high a price. Seeing the cold evidence that she'd warned Jason to stay away from him threatened to crumble his fragile and newfound sense of peace. But then he looked at it through Shevu's eyes and wondered if the captain had thought this that it could have looked as if Mara was the one who went after Jason and attacked him, not the other way around. It was a subtle twist to what Ben had already thought, that his mother had gone after Jason because she thought he was dangerous and had to be stopped, but it introduced a possibility that she might have intended to do more than arrest him. Ben knew Mom was tough. She was a trained assassin. She didn't shy away from fights. He wanted to cherish her memory as a blameless victim, above dark emotions like lethal vengeance. Am I upset? Part of him was proud that his mother had faced down a Sith Lord in combat. Part wondered how that squared with his recent understanding that vengeance wasn't justified, and Part felt devastated that he was the motive and that if only he'd seen Jason for what he was and shunned him, his mother might still be alive. A message came in on the datapad. Dad had just sent it before he jumped to hyperspace. Ben, I forgot to take Mara's locket with me. It's in the box in my quarters. If you have to clear out before we get back, please take good care of it. Ben clasped the locket in his closed fist and pressed it to his chest. I got it, Dad, he said aloud. I got it. Admiral's Day Cabin, Imperial Star Destroyer, Bloodfin, Ravel in Dockyard, Bastion. How many years? Pelion asked. And I can't get over how lovely you still are. You've worn very well. Dalla drummed her fingers in the exact rhythm he'd transmitted as the emergency call. She smiled. A real smile. Genuine warmth. You called. I promised you I'd always come if you used that code. Just like Doricare. What's the problem? The Galactic Alliance. Yes, Jason Solo, unhindered by Admiral Neofel, going for the galactic record for the fastest plunge into bloody anarchy and most stylish black outfit. So, are you all dressed up to go to Fondor? This was why Pelion was happy to admit that he was in awe of her. Dalla had vanished for, what, twenty years, twenty-five, 
and she still had up-to-date intelligence. He'd lost count of the times she'd been written off, apparently defeated, even presumed killed, but still kept coming back to put a serious dent in the New Republic. It was almost thrilling to watch her beat the odds so consistently, even when she was a threat. And as far as Pelion was concerned, she still held an imperial commission. Impressive. Most impressive. Dalla laughed. You never could quite do the voice, but the intonation is perfect. She reached across the gap between their chairs and patted his hand. Still the accomplished seducer. Not in a coy, subservient way, but with the absolute confidence of someone with real physical power who just happened to be a good-looking woman and knew it and understood that even the most resistant weren't wholly immune to it. Yes, I might prefer to live in obscurity, but I'm neither deaf nor blind. I won't even ask about your intelligence network, my dear. She smiled and lit up the cabin again. I never reveal my age or my sources. I'm pleased to see that the Rin intelligence community still makes a good living. And they're not the only ones. I miss our little verbal sparring sessions, my dear. So do I, Gil. But I'm here. What can I do for you? Pelion had no idea if she had come empty-handed or if she still had a fleet. She took ships with her every time she escaped. Vessels and experimental weapons technology had vanished into the Maw installation when Dalla was running it as Grand Moff Tarkin's bit on the side, as the bitterly resentful male officers had called her one of the less offensive names she'd been called, and Pelion had no idea how much she could roll out today. It might all have been rust, dust, and perished plastoids. It might have been the most advanced fleet in the galaxy, just waiting for the ideal moment to emerge and smash the concept of Republic for good. He had no way of knowing unless she showed him. She was still here despite the Yuzhan Vong War, and that told him a great deal. I'm asking you to watch my back, he said, at Fondor, and probably for some time after that. Perhaps some sweeping up, if Solo can't hold what he tries to grab. If he keeps winning, I want a counterweight ready to throw in, before he turns on us like he turned on his allies and family. If he gets too cocky and loses, we'll have to step in and restore order, because the Confederation isn't capable of forming a galactic administration, and the remaining unaligned worlds are a complete shambles. We do at least know how to run things. How much weight can you add, Dalla? She crossed her legs and leaned back in the chair. The eye patch bothered him. It wasn't because it disfigured her. It lent her a rather raffish chic, in fact, and gave her one visible eye the impact of an emerald laser, but because he couldn't imagine what kind of injury required it. Eyes could be replaced and she wore the patch as if she had been used to it for a long time. I can, she said at last, have a full fleet at Fondor with one standard hour's lead time. How much? How many? Let's just say I don't waste resources I find, and a lot of worlds the G.A. doesn't notice— Owe me favors after the Vong War. The fleet won't be modern, but it will be deadly. Does that answer your question? 
Pelion thought of all the prototypes and technology that the old empire had funded, and that had vanished and never seen the light of day. Dala must still have had capital ships in readiness. She'd escaped with Scylla at the very least. But a battle was a lot less about big ships these days, and more about flexibility and agility. Small vessels could be much more of an asset. Jason Solo has half the GA Fourth Fleet, he said. Dalla nodded. Fondor can rival that firepower, not beat it, but it can give a good account of itself. But the GA hasn't committed enough ground troops to take and hold Fondor, just the orbitals. Solo's heavy on ordnance, though. So he's either going specifically to destroy their fleet, or he's not too choosy about the state he leaves the planet in. Dalla hadn't touched her seer spirit. Because if he doesn't destroy their fleet and subdue the planet, he won't be able to hold the orbitals. He'll be occupying them and fending off attacks. Busy job. Unless he plans to destroy them as well. If you're asking me if I know his ultimate intention, no, I don't. And you're committing Imperial forces on that basis? I've gone into battle with far less. And we've both seen governments start wars with no idea how they plan to end them, or even what to do once the initial targets have been taken. Gil, I hope that all you're planning to do is stand there holding Solo's coat while he has his scrap. Waiting to see who wins. Pelion believed in the value of his word. Integrity was a matter of honor. But it was also a pragmatic thing. If you did what you said you would, then your threats carried as much weight as your promises, and your pledges to allies secured tangible benefits. A liar lost friends fast in war. Pelion walked the fine line between not admitting that he had doubts about Jason and contingency plans if things went wrong for him, and misleading an ally. If Bastion were attacked, would he risk his fleet for us? Pelion was sure the answer was no. Jason Solo flew by the seat of his force-sensitive pants, which meant conventional planning with him was impossible. Pelion's only option was to be ready to pick up the pieces. The prize of Bilbringi and Borlias was looking increasingly irrelevant, a free gift that had a price tag all the same. Gil, are you still with me? Dalla asked, tapping his knee. Sorry, my dear. Do you want me to make you feel better about getting into this spot? She stood up as if to leave. This is about your sense of responsibility. Your home is safe, but there's a riot in the street. You feel you have to step outside and stop it. It might even damage your home if you don't. I'm not sure if that's welcome clarity, or indulgent comfort for an old man, Dalla. And then you've got your greedy children clamoring to loot the stores that the riot has trashed. The moths are a handful. You should try my method of enforcing consensus. Ah, my queen of analogies. Dala had brought feuding imperial warlords into line by gassing them. She never wasted time. I'll try reason first, I think. I have no love for moths, Gil, and I plan to kill some of them. Dala opened the hatch and stepped out into the passage. Show me the ship. Dala was conspicuous. She didn't seem to care. 
By now, word of her arrival in port would have reached some of the moths, and those who weren't immediately panicking or huffing with outrage would at least be asking why she was back. Pelion escorted her through Bloodfin's decks as if she were a routine visitor, showing her the most interesting aspects of the turbulent class design. The young crew had no idea who she was, but some of the veteran moths would recognize her, and all would know the name Dala. Pelion didn't have to tell them about the assets she was ready to contribute to the Empire. If some moths were already being wooed by the G.A. before he was formally told a deal was on the table, then Jason would get to hear what Dalla's role might be. Pelion wanted his tactical surprise if he needed it. Are you serious about killing moths, Dalla? Yes, she said, admiring a spotless cannon bay that gleamed. She ran her hand over a bulkhead and followed the curved line of the cannon housing. Because they killed Legius. When I work out the full list of who was behind it, then I'll call them to account. Today I'm here for you, and to a lesser extent, for the Empire. Oh, I'm so very sorry. So very sorry. Legius Vorn had been her first love, a pilot, something of a rogue, to be frank, and when Dalla had retreated to Paducas Corius after yet another spectacular escape from a lost battle, she had found him again. The lovers had been separated for years. It was upliftingly romantic, the promise of rediscovered happiness that every broken heart secretly longed for. How? Oh, and when? A thermal detonator. I've waited five years to pursue the matter. Dala collected enemies. It went with the job. Her patience was frightening. Is this how you acquired your eye injury? I still don't know if he was the main target, to spite me, or if he was collateral damage in an attempt on my life, Dalla said, seeming to ignore the question. I shall find out when I identify all the conspirators, and I'll make sure it takes some painful time. Then I'll have my eye repaired properly, but not before that day so that I don't forget. It didn't bode well for the Empire that its new ally was still at war with some, perhaps most, of its leaders. The Moths had always been ferociously hostile, initially because she was a woman, and later because she was Dala, and she did not suffer fools or less talented officers gladly. They were going to regret it now. It was their own fault. She never forgot, forgave, or gave up. Had I known, I wouldn't have disturbed you. He put his hand gently on her back to steer her this way and that. They were approaching the portside brow again, and an officer of more mature years did a double-take, a real head turn followed by slightly parted lips. Pelion met his eyes, and it was clear that he thought he knew who she was. Just be aware that some of the moths are a little more enlightened these days, and you might even find them helpful. A powerful woman doesn't send them screaming to defend their manly territory. Lesserson, for one. The new breed. I'll make a note of his name and leave him intact, she said, I'll pick my moment, but I'll inform the moths that you are officially back on active service and advising me. Yes, the word fleet would start panic. Might scare Fondor into compliance, of course. Let's keep it as our little secret. 
Dala took his hand in both of hers and squeezed it. You keep a secure calm link open to me at all times. You tell me as early as possible when you plan to jump. And I promise I will be there in minutes. Minutes? I have a marshalling area in mind. One final short hyperspace jump. Trust me. The brow security detail watched her stride down the gangway onto the jetty. Pelion estimated that the news of her visit would be all around Ravelin within three hours. The commander who'd turned ashen on seeing her walked up to Pelion and almost stood to attention. Sir, is that who I think it is? The older sister of my unruly children, said Pelion. He felt a little urge for a joke at the man's expense. Do you think it might be time to have our first female moth? The commander was wisely lost for words. Pelion was pretty sure that Dalla was happier being an admiral, but it was an amusing idea nonetheless. He smiled all the way back to his cabin, where he sat down to await the latest intelligence report. Dalla hadn't asked about Neothel. She must have known the Moncal Admiral's situation, though. It was as if everyone had separated the two G.A. Chiefs of Staff into the mystic in black who might turn rabid and the sensible naval officer in white with whom they could do business, even if, in the Moff's minds anyway, she was inconveniently female. Dalla and Neothel would have a great deal to discuss if they ever met. Pelion poured a small measure of seer spirit, dark as tarwood varnish, and splashed a little water into it. He raised the glass in a private toast. To ladies on the bridge, he said, and gentlemen gone below. Third Fleet Station, Ops Room, Fleet HQ Admiral, Neofel was aware of the young lieutenant waiting at her elbow. Nimbanese, a rare sight in the fleet, made excellent support staff, and this one was a CVO, a casualty visiting officer. It was a neutral, detached title for someone whose job was to give next of kin the worst possible news. Admiral, Neofel turned. Apologies, Lieutenant. Did you want me? Ma'am, the Mine Layer Squadron. I'm making a personal visit to the base. Is there anything you want me to do outside the normal arrangements? Congratulations, Admiral. You got a hundred of your own people killed before they even had time to take defensive action. That's what happens when you leak operational details. They're all from the same area, I understand. Yes, ma'am. The lieutenant kept glancing at her datapad, and when the awful caught sight of the screen, it was a blur of text, a table of short lines. Names. The squadron is a small and tight-knit community, as they often are in specialist units. It's a large number of casualties for them in a single engagement— We'll be offering extra support. Extra support. It was hygienic, unemotional language, which was the only real alternative to disruptive outpourings of emotion. There were thousands of dead in this war so far. Neofel had learned to accept that very early in her career. But today she was looking at her own handiwork a datapad screen of information that had left her hand and had come back to haunt her as a list of names, real beings, real families, her own doing. Officers took decisions knowing that some crew members wouldn't return, but this was totally new and shocking. What did you think would happen to the information you gave Luke Skywalker? What did he think would happen? 
Did you think Fondor would just send vessels to scare the mine layers away? A few shots across the bow? They blew them out of the sky, as you would have done. It was always the small, stark incidents that became the pivots that changed everything. They were on a scale that an individual being could comprehend, like Captain Neville's son Turl, or Lieutenant Tebot. Neofel gave up examining the continuum of blame, inevitable combat deaths, deaths caused by having to sacrifice a mission for a more critical one, deaths caused by incompetence, because there was only one category left beneath hers. Callous and underhanded tactics. And that was personally taking a subordinate's life. That would put her in the sewer currently occupied by Jason Solo. I spied for the enemy. The families of those crews won't be any the less bereaved for knowing that I gave intelligence to a decent, honest Jedi, to thwart the plans of a little tyrant ready to do anything, expend anyone, to win some ill-defined war on chaos. Tell them I'm sorry, Neofel said at last. Give them my personal and sincere apologies. Very good, ma'am. Neofel had to make an effort to get her attention back on the status boards and charts in the darkened ops room. The elements of the fourth fleet that Jason had deployed were one hour into the operation and should have been sitting out a blockade. Now the task force was exposed, the Fondorians knew it was there, and Jason's options were to abort, to attack, or to hold position while a new strategy was cobbled together. Battles went awry of plans all the time, but not like this. She had waited long enough at the comlink. Colonel Solo, she barked. Will you talk to me now or not? She had Holovid and audio between Ops and the Anakin Solo. The holding screen shivered, and Jason appeared, standing with his hands clasped behind his back in front of the bank of weapons sensor consoles. Admiral, we have an intelligence leak. Keep your nerve. I realize that. What are your immediate plans? We have reports that Fondor is sitting tight and expecting an attack. I realize that. This might be the time to reopen talks now you have their attention. We've lost the advantage of locking them in. Jason was totally calm. For a moment, Neofel was distracted by the arrival of Captain Pyrrhus in the ops room. Another Quarren, the commanding officer of Bounty. Neofel didn't share the common moan cal wariness of Quarren, and now felt an increasing bond with them that was only partly due to their common homeworld. They seemed more resolutely honest in the face of Jason's growing eccentricity than most humans. Admiral, I plan to begin simultaneous attacks on four orbitals spaced around the planet, draw out their fleet, and neutralize it. Orbitals usually carried defensive cannon, but were outgunned by star destroyers. Fondor would have to send support. In that respect, Jason made sense. But that was where it ended. You'll blow the yards to pieces. That may well happen. This is a complete departure from what we agreed. It's turned into a sabotage run. What are you thinking? Good grief, Colonel. You can't make up battle plans on a whim. I trust my force awareness. To do what, exactly? What? To make an example of Fondor. Enough! Neofel snapped. She didn't care that this was being played out in front of the ops room staff. If she'd had any sense, she would have taken advantage of Jason's absence from Coruscant to call an emergency meeting of the Senate. 
announce that she was relieving Jason of his duties, and declare herself sole chief of state. But that took time she didn't have, and created its own chaos and cascade of problems to follow, like where Jason might go and what he might do with his task force. She had to go out there and intervene. She had no faith in the force to stop him spending thousands of lives to send out a message, and this was as good a time as any to bring him down. He might never be more overextended than he was now. I don't want to hear that you have a feeling, or that you have certainty, or that you can meld. I want to hear times, ranges, troop strengths. Colonel, I'm now activating the Third Fleet Task Force, and I will be at your position in a little under six standard hours. She expected Jason to snarl back at her, or at least spite her by starting the attack right away. Instead, he bowed his head a fraction, Jedi-style, and smiled. Very well, Admiral. With your assets and the Imperial Remnant's support, we can attempt to isolate Fondor itself with part of the task force, while the rest secures the orbitals one at a time. Jason never capitulated to a better idea. Neothel had her unspoken warning. She closed the link, furious, displaced rage fueled by her own guilt she knew, and looked around at a silent ops room landscape of hunched backs as personnel tried to pretend they hadn't heard or seen the two chiefs of state arguing, and that Jason Solo didn't share basic information with her. Pyrrhus stood waiting. He's gone too far. He has to go. Neothel knew everyone must have heard her. Captain, are we ready? Yes, ma'am. The fleet is ready to slip. Admiral Macon sends his regards and says he's kept Ocean's seat warm for you. A fleet speeder picked them up outside the building and whisked them to the fleet base. You know what I miss most? she said to Pyrrhus, wondering how she'd come to this after such a solid, predictable career. Not having my own command. You're the Supreme Commander, and Jacos one, ma'am. You've got your own navy. It's not the same, Pyrrhus. I move from ship to ship like some visiting mother-in-law, trampling over other commanders' territory, shoving them aside for the while giving orders when they're used to being the voice on the bridge. I miss the simplicity. I miss the days when I knew a ship was my personal responsibility, and felt like home when I came on board, opened the cabin hatch, and stowed my belongings. Flexible and responsive fleet, they call it. Remember? I'm very old-fashioned. That's commendable. But you're no longer required to go down with your ship. Jason was very attached to the Anakin Solo, but it struck her as being in an accessory kind of way, like wanting the snazziest sports speeder in town. Suddenly she had a holotune-type image of a caricatured Jason in his black flapping cloak scrambling into the destroyer's last escape pod, while poor Captain Neville stood bravely on the Anakin's burning bridge, mouth tentacles courageously straight, hand held rigid against his brow in a final salute, as he did the decent thing that Jason wouldn't. Let him burn Neville. The third fleet element of the task force had been standing by to leave orbit and jump since the Anakin Solo had passed out of comm contact. If she told Pyrrhus that she hadn't actually planned to confront Jason Solo like that, he wouldn't have believed her. What-ifs and contingencies had a habit of turning into reality for very good reasons, seeing as they were extrapolated from the possible twists and turns of the original plan. But sometimes they seemed to express a subconscious wish. If Neothel was going to relieve Jason Solo of command— 
then it was best done away from Coruscant, with space to let the fleet bring its power to bear. Kuz needed planning. She knew because she'd helped Jason stage one. She'd been seduced a step at a time by what had looked pragmatic, and now she could look back and see how far she had fallen with him. It was time to halt the rot, as best she could. It's the small things, isn't it, ma'am? Pyrrhus said, as he followed her into the launch that would transfer them to Bounty and Ocean. It's a snowflake that triggers the avalanche. Or a sun. Or a hundred strangers. Or looking back on who you used to be before all this began. I don't know how many of the commanders will follow me, Neothel said. She didn't define her destination. Clipping Jason's wings would be opportunistic, a risk taken in an instant, and at least that left no conspiracy to be uncovered or others to be implicated if she tried and failed. Pyrrhus ran his hand down over his mouth tentacles like a human stroking a beard in thought. And we'll never know for sure until the moment it happens, he said. But one thing I do know. We won't be alone. <laughs>